Somewhere just off the shores of Toluca Lake, there exists a place unlike any other. A small, seemingly insignificant little burg. From a distance, this fog-draped ghost town reads like any other failed community you've likely seen on one of those particularly long, lonely road trips. However, this one, well, let's just say there's a few things that make it unique. Something draws you in here, something powerful and present, like it's just beyond your sight, waiting to be discovered. The ghostly visage you see before you is Silent Hill, a place and a series that quite literally changed me as a person. So I thought to myself, as the leaves fall from the trees and your breath starts to hang in the air, why don't we revisit that foggy little town, kick around the debris left behind and try to figure out what the hell happened here. If you guys would be so kind as to join me, I'd like to comb through the boarded up storefronts, strange events, and ruined lives that call this place home. I don't know why, but something tells me we're supposed to be here. What's up guys, I'm Jared from Avalanche Reviews. Welcome to Silent Hill. Before we get into Silent Hill, we have to cover the events that led up to its creation. Events that, looking back now, seem kind of like a perfect storm or maybe dominoes falling exactly into place. The year was 1996 and Capcom's Resident Evil was introducing PS1 owners to the concept of both survival horror and pants dripping wet with piss. Despite all the odds working against them, the Big C pulled out a huge hit with this entry-level attempt at making a 3D PS1 horror game, and Konami was quick to recognize that success. Their idea was to start development on a big Hollywood experience that would rival RE's market share, and for some reason they thought putting together a crew made up of members who didn't fit in or get along with anyone else at the company, but get this monumentous job done. Thus, Team Silent was formed, and after that, well, a whole lot of nothing. Team members really had no idea how to create such a game and quickly lost enthusiasm to do so. They started batting around their own ideas and eventually decided the best course of action would be to play into a type of horror that wouldn't require a massive budget or cheap thrills. As a result, a more subdued and thought-provoking game was starting to take shape, one that sought to scare the player not by inundating them with visceral gore, but instead by building a world filled with vague, unexplainable horrors, a series of scares that would prey on the player's fear of the unknown and ill-defined. This was the idea that would eventually become survival horror's psychological counterpart and the birthplace of Silent Hill. Hey, what are you talking about? The plot of Silent Hill is one of contention, and for damn good reason. Writer Keichiro Toyama was looking to create a scenario that both fulfilled the player's want for coherency, but also kept surface-level details to a minimum. And given the media that served as the game's inspiration, it's no wonder why the team elected to refrain from outright telling players what was happening in plain English. The idea was to encourage people to dig deeper for the whole story, and this would hopefully increase our connection to the events since we were discovering them all for ourselves. Now don't get me wrong, this was an amazing approach and serves as one of the reasons the game is so fondly remembered to this day, but it did have one major downside. First time players only finished the game once and when left with unanswered questions, well they just kind of made up their own. Strength must overcome petty desire, childish sleep talk. In the early days, this made for some very creepy and interesting what if scenarios across forums and fan sites. But as time went on, these fan theories started to creep into legit discussions on the game's events. Even now, there's going to be a few of you watching who know some of these completely unfounded and inaccurate details to be gospel. So let's just get this out of the way right up front. During this story summary, I'm only going to be going off of what has been included in the game proper or from official sources like quotes and interviews, confirmed to lead back to members of Team Silent. So if I don't mention your favorite aspect of the story, like multiple dimensions or the purposeful burning of Alessa, just know that's why. Alright, so now that that's settled, or at least it is as long as I'm the only one with the microphone here, let's stop with all the heavy stuff and move on to a more light-hearted subject matter like demonic cults and ancient Indian mysticism. Okay, so Silent Hill is the story of Harry Mason, a single dad taking his daughter on a trip to the titular little vacation town. 
On the way there, Harry swerves to miss someone in the road and accidentally crashes his Jeep. After waking up in a foggy, snow-ridden ghost town, Harry finds his daughter Cheryl is missing. While looking for her, Harry's caught up in a seductive, seductive, <laughs> a very seductive cult. <laughs> While looking for her, Harry's caught up in a secretive cult looking to manipulate him for their own purposes. I knew you'd come. You want the girl, right? And a motorcycle cop who just wants to help. From here, the story becomes just as much about the game's setting as it is the game's characters. And we find that Silent Hill has its own little dark past. One that sets it apart from your average small American town. And that's about all you need to know. That's every little story beat from the game. Only, none of it's true. The entire setup I just fed you is completely inaccurate and it was taken nearly word for word from most of the major Silent Hill resources you're likely to find with a quick Google search, further proving my earlier point. But before we talk about what's really going on here, I do have to give major spoiler warnings. And yeah, I know the game's nearly old enough to legally drive a car, but I do want new players to figure out things for themselves. So skip to the time code on screen to avoid having your mind blown with the world-rending secrets. Alright, so to continue where we left off, my previous synopsis is what I like to call Silent Hill's little half-truth. I mean, sure, those events do happen, and that's an accurate description of them, but it's only half of what you're going to find behind that thick wall of fog. Yes, Harry Mason is the character we play as in this game, but its story isn't his, not by a long shot. See, Silent Hill is the story of Alessa, a little girl born into the town's secret demon-worshipping religious order. This cult preaches a creation story that had God returning to the heavens before she could finish making the world, leading to a corrupted and imperfect creation. According to their faith, God swore to one day return, and the most fanatical of this cult's membership is looking to speed that process up a little bit. Dahlia, current leader of the cult and mother to Alessa, one day gets the swell idea to use her own flesh and blood to aid in their god returning to create paradise, or as it would be known to sane people, hell on earth. Herein lies the mother's womb, containing the power to create life. The goal being to utilize her psychic abilities to facilitate the literal impregnation of her womb with God, a foolproof plan that could never fail, except that it did. During the process, the pain and stress of the ritual caused Alessa's powers to activate and blew up the house's boiler, starting a nasty blaze that burned her nearly to death. The pain and horror of the night's events caused Alessa to break herself in two both psychically and physically, leading to Cheryl's creation and her inability to finish the ritual. So as you might imagine, Harry returning to Silent Hill with Cheryl in tow is no accident. The cult needs Cheryl to reunite with Alessa so that their god can be born, and Alessa wants none of that. From the very beginning, her goal was to sacrifice herself so that the world would never turn into the hellish landscape the cult's aiming for. This condition is also the cause of one of the game's most famous elements, the Otherworld. The cult's been keeping Alessa alive despite her terrible wounds, and this causes them to never really heal. So this, combined with the demon currently housed within her, and a little help from the magic of Silent Hill, allow her thoughts to form the world around her. Harry's shifts into the other world are merely Alessa losing control of her mind and allowing the darkest parts of her inner suffering out into the world. We're essentially just experiencing a physical manifestation of what's happening to this poor girl every day of her life. This means every monster you fight and every puzzle you solve is related to Alessa in one way or another, and this adds a whole new level of meaning to the game's world. So after that long explanation, Silent Hill is essentially the story of Alessa. It's her history and decisions that drive the plot, and we're entering her own personal hell when we shift into the other world. Sure, we may be controlling Harry the whole time, but his purpose is to act as our stand-in. After all, we're learning about all of this through him. Well, I think we've gone far enough into the weeds with this one. You think it's about time we let the noobs back in? Yeah, why not? Alright guys, welcome back. We definitely were not shit-talking you behind your back. Now, a deep and multivariate story is all well and good, but it can only be as interesting as the characters used to tell it, and this is another area where Team Silent really excelled. My daughter will be the mother of God. In most games, NPCs are used as expository dumps and cluing the player in on what's happening, and SH does something similar, but Instead of outright informing you of the game's events, they strengthen the story's disorienting structure. The small handful of living, breathing people left in the town are all very strange and always end up posing more questions than they answer, sometimes by the mere fact that they exist. 
You're always going to leave a conversation in this game wondering why it felt so off, and sometimes you'll be left questioning whether the info you've been given can even be trusted. This leads to a nice little feeling I can only really describe thusly. Am I right in thinking there is nobody else in this house? Mm, no. Then there is someone else in this house. No, sorry, I said no meaning yes. No meaning yes? Look, I want a straight answer. Is there someone else or isn't there yes or no? Um, no. No, there is or no, there isn't? Yes. Please! Taken as a whole, Silent Hill's story is something you really don't see anymore. It trusted the player to discover it on their own and rewarded the curious with more and more details that could further contextualize the game's events. It's a dark tale that deals with a lot of heavy subject matter, but unlike modern games that take a similar route, Silent Hill doesn't cheapen it. The psychological and existential nature of the story is never used to shock the player. It simply is. These things exist and are happening in the world these characters inhabit. That's just the reality of it. As it goes on, there are plenty of times when we're told the exact opposite of the truth and led to believe things that run counter to the real story. And I don't know about you guys, but this had me questioning myself. Maybe me, Harry, or hell, both of us were just losing it, and the game's events were the result of our loosening grip on reality. This, in my opinion, is about as good as video game stories get. No on-the-nose commentary or blatant activism masquerading as a plot. Just solid writing leading you through this winding supernatural path dotted with vaguely human figures hanging from meat hooks. Is there symbolism used to comment on real-world events or practices? Sure, maybe, but that's up to you. And I think that's why so many people have dreamed up their own conclusions to this story. The game just begs you to interpret it, but unlike most games, it never confirms or denies you either way. At least not until you really dig into it. Two casual players could finish the game and have completely different ideas of what happened. And it wouldn't be till one of them bolster themselves and jump back into these fog-laden streets that the truth would be shown to them, and even then, the ending they get might just undo all that work. Look, I'm really running my mouth here, and the point I'm trying to make is that Silent Hill is the standard for real, meaningful video game narratives, and you do yourself a disservice every day you don't experience it for yourself. As Silent Hill started its life as a clone of Resident Evil, you'd imagine they would play similarly, and, well, you'd be right, but you'd also be wrong. On the surface, it can seem like there are more similarities than differences, but even a few minutes worth of experience with the game would prove that incorrect. Sure, they might share the same outer body, but the guts moving that body around is where all the interesting stuff lies. Finally, a gross metaphor actually poignant given the context of the subject matter. I'm really starting to nail this whole writing thing. Okay, so on the surface, both games will have you exploring the environment, avoiding or engaging in combat, searching for puzzle pieces and keys to further facilitate exploration, but that's only half the story on Silent Hill's end. SH adds the bonus of a pretty ahead of its time open world kind of feel. Sure, it's not the go anywhere, do anything style of open world we're used to today, but Nearly the entire town of Silent Hill is accessible early on, and thanks to scattered caches of ammo and health items, it's in your best interest to take advantage of that. The layout of events remains linear with locked doors and destroyed portions of road, keeping you from sequence break in the game, but an eerie unapproachableness and downright pristine design of the town will have you feeling compelled to explore as much as possible. Once inside one of the town's many interior areas, you'll see that typical RE gameplay come rearing its zombified head but this time wearing a lot more hats. Exploration and progression is still the name of the game here, but more of an emphasis on realistic design guides a pretty cool take on the established norms of the genre. Most areas are filled to the brim with rooms, but you're not going to be able to get into even a quarter of them. Now, I know this sounds like it adds tedium into the survival horror mix, but to me, it just feels right. Before this video, I hadn't played Silent Hill 1 since I was about 10 years younger and nearly 80 pounds lighter. But this process of mashing the examine button on a row of four or five doors felt like slipping into a comfy old pair of pants. The good news is you're not going to have to keep track of the myriad locked and unlocked doors in any one place thanks to the next interesting addition to the formula. In RE games, maps were always nice to have around at first, but after a few hours in, even novice players would be navigating their surroundings with their eyes closed, only having to look up a location in a pinch. Silent Hill does a much better job of integrating its map into the gameplay and even makes it feel like a legitimate part of the game's world. 
As you explore, Harry will mark down any rooms of interest, locked doors, blocked passages, or puzzle locations. This makes it much easier to plot a course to your next destination, in spite of the added complications of less intuitive environmental layouts. When roaming around the streets of Silent Hill, this map becomes your beacon in the dark, since Harry also jots down the next place you should check out based on the information he's able to get from the very few people he comes across. And if there was one thing that just screamed, we no longer know how to make challenging and satisfying video games anymore, Silent Hill does all of this without leading you by the nose. And what I mean by that is, you feel like you've actually gotten to your destination thanks to your navigating skills. Sure, Harry may circle a spot on the map, but you're going to have to get there on foot. No on-screen directional cues or in-game guide to follow. You're going to have to plot out a route and remember to take that left at Matheson because you do not want to run into that pack of air screamers again. This was such a cool notion for me. Keeping track of what street I was on and keeping my destination in mind just felt so real life at the time. Like these were things I was just getting a hold of growing up in the heart of Miami and now I was using that same skill to avoid demons from the abyss, one of the scariest environments I could imagine, so not much of a change there. And of course we can't keep talking about the game's exploration without its other element being mentioned. What's this? Every so often, after certain events, Harry will cross over into what he calls the Other World, which is essentially the same area you've been exploring, except ran through the filter of the movie Hellraiser. In this twisted version of the world, open paths are now closed to you, hallways are sectioned off with rusted fencing, and safe areas are now filled with monsters. This in my mind acts as a way to include Resident Evil's world-famous backtracking, but changing the environment so much that it doesn't feel like retreading the same ground over and over again. This has the added bonus of doubling the amount of time you spend in any one area, but also having the time you feel like you've been in that same environment. Or at least it did for me. It also ramps up the difficulty just when you might have cleared out every hostel in the area. Kinda like a refresh when exploration has hit a dead end and things start to drag. And I think that serves as a perfect time to talk about getting around in this game. Even though the genre staple tank controls are present and accounted for here, Harry does not move like a STARS member. He can be pretty hard to control during a sprint, and changing directions on the fly will have you come into a halt so that he can reorient. Overall, I'd say it's not as satisfying to control as your typical Resident Evil game, but the incredibly smooth animations are really damn nice, and you will get used to accounting for them after a bit. But no matter how fast you are, you can't completely outrun every fight, so how does the combat fare? Well, hitting a shoulder button still readies a weapon, and it's still a good idea to run away from any encounter that's not heavily in your favor, but there's a lot more at play here than any self-respecting RE fan might be used to. First off is the crazy detailed animations I mentioned before. Not only do these smoothly communicate what's going on, but they also play heavily into a fight. There are a lot of frames after hitting that R2 button where you're not going to be able to do much of anything. You have to correctly gauge when to pop a shot off because bringing up your weapon is nowhere near instantaneous, and the same goes for the game's much larger emphasis on melee combat. Each of the many weapons to be found controls wildly different from the last, and the addition of a charged heavy attack is a nice little touch. Some weapons will allow you to fight and move at the same time, a mechanic that blew my mind at the time, and there's also a stray function mapped to L and R1 that I honestly never used that much. And it's here that I need to dispel a bit of a rumor, one that even I used to be guilty of spreading. Despite what you've heard from any game review intellectuals, tank controls and hard to adapt to combat is not some kind of purposeful choice made by the devs to further increase the game's horror. I mean sure it definitely has that side effect, but to be blunt this was just the only way we knew of that would move a character around in games with such wildly changing camera angles. Tank controls and their accompanying combat were just staples of the genre at the time, and in this industry that had just gotten the hang of gaming in all three dimensions, it would be a while till we figured out other ways to tackle this. Now if you ask me, these controls feel just as natural as walking in real life and are actually really easy to adapt to, but it's always bothered me when people try so hard just to justify every little aspect of the genre. Tank controls and hard combat are just something that was in the games at the time, and there's no real deeper meaning to them. But let's get down to the real controversy. Most of you that have argued with me in my comments section are probably already typing out several long paragraphs by now, so we might as well address it. 
I do still believe a fixed camera or fixed perspective is necessary to the genre, and Silent Hill does allow you to move the camera to a small degree. And here's where I have to hang my head and accept that I was wrong. Or at least I would have to if Team Silent hadn't already defined this as psychological horror, making sure my fragile ego remains unmolested. So take that. But in all seriousness, I do think this game fits in with my very specific definition of the genre. Sure, you can swing the camera to your back at any time, but this is a very lengthy affair, making it much harder to survey your environment than it is in any third or first person games falsely claiming the survival horror title. For the majority of the game, the camera does move, but it typically stays in a locked angle or track. And if you ask me, it's just a bit more reliable to keep it there, making use of audio cues to get an idea for what might be waiting for you around any given corner. And just as a little tip, if you are bad with motion sickness, I would not move that camera very often because it is very disorienting. And let's be honest here, Silent Hill uses a myriad of effects to achieve the same results as fixed camera angles. There's the dynamic lighting, darkness, and fog, obscuring enemies and your environment, so I think we're pretty safe in the survival horror definition here. As far as core difficulty goes, I'd say it's kind of hard to sum up. Evading attacks in Silent Hill is much harder than its Raccoon City counterpart, thanks to Harry needing time to transition from running to walking. Adding to that frustration, sometimes hitting a diagonal direction will count as letting go of the other directions, and you'll find yourself stumbling to a walking pace, giving the faceless beast you are trying to avoid the perfect opportunity to line up an attack. But on the flip side of this, with a little bit of skill and some knowledge of the genre, it's pretty easy to stockpile enough ammo to make even the most hardened doomsday prepper blush. Now, I will admit I have a tendency to reset the game if I get caught in a crappy situation, but I'd wager even first-timers would have an easy time maintaining resources on normal difficulty. But those two elements are only really half the story. Of course, we can't have a survival horror game without puzzles, and I think this is where Silent Hill really comes into its own. The puzzles here vary to an insane degree and almost always require a lot of thought to complete. For this playthrough, I was in the lucky position of not remembering most of their solutions. I had to stop and scratch my head on more than one occasion, and if at all possible, I'd like to recommend you not looking up the solutions for these things online. Silent Hill puzzles mostly live in a very cool little middle ground between challenging and solvable, and I promise you will feel so satisfied when you finally figure one out. Plus, they're really well integrated into the story and its characters, so that makes a very cool added layer of immersion, which is always nice. Silent Hill is an amazing example of how incredible things can come from some pretty unexpected origins. Konami just looking to copy Capcom's success when an over-the-top action Hollywood experience ended up getting a very cool survival horror game that rivaled and even surpassed Resident Evil in a lot of ways. And I can't help but feel like some of the additions here might make it easier for new players to transition into the genre than they might have if they had just jumped into an old RE title. The puzzles will certainly satisfy those of you looking to get a bit of a mental workout while you're playing, and genre vets will love seeing all the innovations Team Silent were able to contribute. Now you guys know what a huge shrieking fanboy I am for Resident Evil, but honestly, I don't think I could pick a favorite between these two if I had a gun to my head. But I can say this, Silent Hill is one of the most satisfying games I have ever played in my life. It took so many chances, and I honestly don't think we'll ever see another game with this much ingenuity and heart ever again. Do whatever you can in order to play this game. It truly is an example of all the good this medium can provide, and a solid contender for one of the most important video games ever made. Are you okay? And finally, we have arrived at one of the more publicized features of Silent Hill, its presentation. It's no secret that the PS1, while billed as a serious 3D gaming machine, didn't exactly have the pixel-pushing power to support big wide-open 3D environments, or at least not without some fancy workarounds, and Team Silent took advantage of just about every trick in the book to get SH running and looking its best. But before we talk about that, we have to ask why. If Konami was looking to compete with Resident Evil, why not copy the pre-rendered backgrounds and fixed camera angles common in those games? Well, at the time, 2D was getting harder and harder to sell to the public. Gamers wanted more 3D, and as far as major gaming publications went, it was the 3D titles that got billed for full-page spreads. I have to assume Konami made this a prerequisite when tasking Team Silent with an RE killer, so it makes sense this would carry into the final product. A final product that looks absolutely amazing on the surface, but becomes more and more impressive the more you learn about its design. 
As everyone likely already knows, the fog in Silent Hill was used to both mask texture pop in and decrease the amount of visible game world that needed to be rendered. But the N64 had been using this type of trick for years. Why the hell does SH get all the credit? Well, these guys understood that their game needed to rely on its world and atmosphere to sell itself. And if that was the case, everything would need to be in service of those elements, even the graphical shortcuts. Silent Hill was made foggy by its limitations, but that fog was made real by Team Silent's creativity. They decided that the fog wasn't enough on its own, so they explained it in-game as being a result of the town's location right smack dab next to a huge lake, and then made that lake into the town's mythology by having it serve as the cause of Silent Hill's vacation destination status for a while. On top of this, the added layer of falling snow helped incorporate the fog into the overall cohesive look of the game. Now, there's no doubt that is a very interesting tidbit, but there's even more going on under the hood here. Like the game's video output, or more specifically, the fact that Silent Hill doesn't utilize the console's typical vertical resolution of 240p, instead going with a pillar box picture, probably to save some processing overhead. Now, I know those of you with a keen eye have probably noticed all of my footage here looks round about 960p, which is the normal integer scale for PS1 games, but there's a pretty interesting explanation for that. The PS3 I captured most of my footage on scales PS1 games up to a 1080p vertical output, and that stretching on the Y axis almost perfectly makes up the difference. On a PS1 running through the Frame Meister set to an even 3 times scale, we're left with a pretty small amount of screen real estate. Now, I know most of you really don't care about this stuff, but man, it's really interesting seeing games that tweak the normal parameters of the PS1 that we're all used to. You've no doubt noticed the incredible amount of dithering present in the game, and it should come as no surprise that this was also a method used to cut back on the horsepower needed to run the game well. See, in some retro consoles like the Genesis and Saturn, dithering was a very necessary step taken to mitigate a very low amount of colors available at once, and a low overall color depth. And depending on your sensibilities, you'll either love the dithered look or hate it. As far as I go, well, I actually really, really like it. I know a lot of people like to argue that dithered patterns weren't meant to be seen since the garbage quality of composite video was supposed to blend these colors together. But to me, being able to see the dithered nature of these games acts as a sort of lifting of the veil. When I started upscaling games, the dithered pattern acted as a sign that I had removed all of the layers of hidden quality from my screen and was finally seeing my games at their purest intended level of presentation. But to be completely honest, I could understand if you don't like this much being visible on screen at all times. Oddly enough, in Silent Hill's case, the dithering wasn't a fault of the console. I mean, the PS1 could fill your screen with a boatload of colors theoretically, but in a fully 3D world, every possible pixel counted, and dithering was a nice way of displaying relatively smooth color gradients while leaving every other pixel in a given area essentially unrendered. All of these workarounds managed to make SH look and run incredibly well, but it was not a cure-all. The game seems to run below 30 frames per second most of the time, and including a lot of 3D assets in the screen, we'll see the frame rate drop noticeably. Now, typically, I would make some kind of excuse here because, well, nepotism, but I've railed on other games for the same thing, so for consistency's sake, this can get annoying when it mixes with Harry's awkward controls and tendency to stop running when he's hit a wall. But hey, sidestepping performance issues isn't the only element at play here. The overall level of quality on display here is surprisingly great looking, artistically speaking. Animations for running, taking damage, and character interactions all look incredibly smooth and seem to have been motion captured. Of course, this can look off in some scenes, Hold it. but overall, I'd say this is a win. 3D models are insanely detailed across the board and textures look very believable even up close. Of course, you can't get away with not mentioning how creepy the monster design is, and it most definitely is, but I'm more interested in the more peripheral elements. The design of Silent Hill exists in some kind of theoretical master level, and it's not due to any one reason. And once again, this is because the game's artistic vision matches up perfectly with its world building. The game does a lot with its story and voice acting to give you the feeling that things are just off here, and the artwork on display furthers this immensely. The biggest and most visible example are the gory decorations and, well, let's face it, sacrifices on display in some parts of the environment. These hanging bodies aren't scary on their own, especially to a modern gamer who's able to see people being ripped apart in full 4K glory, but they are very off-putting. 
and for a while I didn't understand why I found them to be so effective. I mean, point at any one game in the PS1 era and you would find dead bodies somewhere in there, but they never really affected me the way Silent Hills do. But then I noticed a trend. None of these bodies have faces. You know, that thing that we humans use to identify each other? Well, that's no longer present, and I don't mean their faces have been ripped off. I mean they're just not there. Faces are always obscured in such a way that there's no evidence there ever was one, and that really messes with the part of my brain that tries to understand everything I see. You'll also notice proportions aren't exactly correct either. Another little trick done to make sure you immediately understand the outline of what you're looking at, but on closer inspection, you start to understand less and less about it. This approach to design permeates nearly every area in the game, especially the other world. Honestly, I wish there was some type of psychological study I could point to to explain why I find these things so intrinsically scary, but I really have no explanation here. They just are in my mind. And if there was one real complaint I had with the game's presentation, it's that picking up items can sort of break that immersion factor a bit. Now don't get me wrong, Teenage Me loves seeing these detailed 3D objects spinning on screen, but so much is done to keep the game's elements off screen, it just seems to clash with the minimalist look that Team Silent pulled off, keeping health displays and map items sectioned away from the in-game world. But even I can admit, this is a small gripe at worst. And at this point you might be wondering, hey Jared, don't you always cover the ports in these videos? What about the ports? Well, there are none, so shut up. Wait, I just remembered something. Well, okay, so I guess there is a visual novel type of game released on the Game Boy Advance in Japan, but it's just a retelling of the original's events. I haven't played much of it myself since any translations are only playable via a web browser, and you know how I am with actual hardware. But the music is kind of interesting, and the sprite art shows some angles of areas never seen before, so I guess if you're into that kind of thing, you'll be into this kind of thing. Silent Hill, with its intricately modeled 3D world and super sharp 2D elements, is the perfect game to run through the Frame Meister, as I have always been a huge, unapologetic fan of early PS1 3D. But sadly, this is damn near unplayable on most upscalers for a very dumb but very understandable reason. Team Silent was looking for a sharper look for the game's inventory and map screens, so they're presented in 480i instead of the console's standard 240p and it definitely makes for a nicer looking interface, but the quick switching between resolutions tends to trip up most retro video upscalers as they struggle to keep up with the changes. This means a long wait between moving in and out of these screens, and since you're gonna wanna check your map a lot, you'll be leaving yourself open to Silent Hill's monsters as you wait to get a picture back on your screen. And while it may suck admitting my Frame Meister can't solve all of my problems, yet, there are still readily accessible methods to get a very good looking picture from Silent Hill. Your typical household PS3 will actually upscale PS1 games and I have to say, it looks pretty damn impressive all things considered. All of the footage you've been looking at today was recorded on a slim model PS3 and even though it's technically emulation, I think most people will be perfectly satisfied with it. There's a visible amount of sharpness lost on the PS3 when comparing the two and the aspect ratio does seem to be maybe a bit wider than on official hardware, but given the alternative, I don't think anyone would complain. Well, except for me, but that's because I'm unpleasable. And lastly, we have to talk about what might be the most important element in the game, bar none. After the original composer left the project, a young Akira Yamaoka requested the job and actually created most of the game's sound, including sound effects. He created the game's soundtrack in a pretty unconventional method, not by watching footage of the game being played, but from the concept art. He saw the rusted metal with the cold environments and wanted a sound that was equally abrasive. He ended up taking inspiration from industrial music and, well, industrial sounds, and included a lot of harsh, clangy, metallic noises mixed with other very unsettling motifs. That being said, he wasn't afraid to keep music out of the areas where ambient environmental noises would be way more appropriate. Yamaoka would continue a similar approach to music as the series went on, and it's interesting to go back to his first time dabbling with this sound. As he perfected his style, he would use more electronic drums and twangy sounding kind of surf riffs. But this original offering is much colder and aggressive than anything he's ever made. If you ever found any of the man's musical work as impressive as I have, you definitely want to get a hold of this soundtrack. Just don't go to sleep listening to it, I'm pretty sure that's a guaranteed way to lose your mind.
all things considered, we owe Silent Hill a huge debt of gratitude. Sure, there may have been games that dealt with dark psychological subject matter in the past, oddly enough mostly in the PC space, but Team Silent beat all the odds and brought their own special brand of serious horror to the masses and picked up real steam in its day. The game sold well enough to greenlight a sequel, and if you ask me, that's a pretty amazing feat. It's hard to imagine a similar situation happening today in the AAA gaming market. So don't waste this gift from the gods, no matter how you do it. Real hardware, PlayStation Network, hell, emulate the damn thing on your 2006 Toshiba laptop. Just make sure you play it. If it wasn't obvious by now, Silent Hill means a lot to me. It showed me that games could mess with the way that I think and the way I see the world around me. They could affect me in ways I never thought possible. And yeah, the controls can take a while to get used to, and maybe PS1 era graphics won't be everyone's bag, but that absolutely will not stop me from saying this is one of the most important games to ever grace the medium. And if you're having trouble believing me, even after all this, do yourself a favor. Wait till it's dark out, put on a pair of headphones, and prepare to enter a terrifying world you won't likely ever want to leave. Thank you all for joining me in this offering to Samael, and make sure to stick around, because in two weeks we're coming right back to this weird little town. Only, things aren't quite like we remember them. But until then, I'm Jared from Avalanche Reviews. Thank you very much for watching the Silent Hill Retrospective. Well guys, it looks like we found ourselves back in that empty little vacation town, but for some reason it doesn't feel like the same Silent Hill we came to know on our last visit. After Konami tasted a bit of success with their psychological horror underdog, the green light for a sequel was so bright you could see it from low orbit. And with an inflated budget and a larger staff, comes some pretty natural worries. Like is this going to be a cash in, a shadow of its former self masquerading as an indie horror title? Plus, there's the obvious question like, how the hell could you continue from Silent Hill 1's satisfying ending? What's left to cover? And most importantly, will delving deeper into this world risk destroying the vague unknown charm that it had in the first place? Well, I think it's about time we did some digging, so if you'll join me, let's take a little trip. We'll take the exit just past Brahms and return to that ghost town you just can't get out of your head. What's up guys, I'm Jared from Avalanche Reviews. Welcome to Silent Hill. Silent Hill 2 started development almost right as the first game started to pick up steam, only instead of blessing my beloved PS1, it would serve as free marketing for the upcoming PlayStation 2. Now at the time, I remember a lot of buzz going around with games media obsessing over release snippets of CG cutscenes and detailed 3D renders from Sony's new offering. And speaking from personal experience, we Silent Hill fans were suffering from dangerous levels of hype for this release. And speaking of expectations, this is probably going to be another long one, so head down to the description below for a table of contents with timestamps to all the stuff we're going to go over today. I get that 30 or 40 minutes is a long time to be sitting on YouTube, so I figured I'd give you guys a little more access to the video's contents without having to sit through 10 minutes of an old guy yelling about how no one truly understands survival horror anymore. Like I said before, we were all overflowing with excitement for this bad boy to finally drop, but there was one little seed of doubt slowly starting to root in my mind. After being glued to my ViewSonic CRT monitor for any and all possible SH2 media, I started to notice a trend. I didn't recognize any of these people. How were they going to follow up a beloved game like Silent Hill 1 without even having a returning cast member? From the very start, Silent Hill 2's story was going to differ a bit from the first, as Keichiro Toyama would not be returning to pen this script. Instead, Team Silent Vet Hiroyuki Iwaku stepped up to the plate and started on a story, oddly enough dreamed up by CGI director Takeyoshi Sato. Being heavily inspired by Dostoyevsky's Crime and Punishment, Iwaku introduced a completely new spin-off approach to the game's story. Instead of picking up right where we left off with the first game, Part 2 would delve into wholly unrelated events that could possibly happen at any point in the SH timeline. While this approach is still a very contentious one, I appreciate the balls it took to completely flip the script on what was a proven formula. But before we get too far in, we should probably sum things up here. 
The story of Silent Hill 2 starts with a new face, James Sunderland, a guy following a letter from his wife telling him that she would meet him in their special place in the vacation town Silent Hill. The game gets its start with James on the outskirts of the foggy ghost town in a highway rest area looking into a mirror and seemingly questioning his own sanity. Now why would he be doing that? Well, that letter from his wife has some pretty damning implications seeing as how she's been dead for quite some time. Anyway, she's dead. I don't know why I think she's here. And if you ask me, this was probably the most Silent Hill way these guys could have started this game. A1, 10 out of 10, super cool start. So we've got ourselves a record-breaking home run of an opening. Does the rest of the story keep up that momentum? Well, on his journey to figure out just what the hell is going on here, James comes across three other characters that seem to be on a similar journey. Two of these guys are coming to Silent Hill to find something, much like James, and the other is a little girl who knew James' late wife. Sadly, in very SH fashion, these characters speak very cryptically and rarely give out any concrete information. And for me, this was a welcome return, as part of what made the original so creepy was the fact that there was no readily available answers to be found, and anyone trying to explain things to you often left you with more questions than answers. You don't have to lie. Go ahead and say it. Or you could just force me. Beat me up like he always did. Angela, Eddie, and Laura give off a very similar vibe here, acting as visual and auditory signs that things aren't quite right in the old town of Silent Hill. Both Angela and Eddie are very clearly messed up in the head, and neither is going to be holding a long, coherent conversation. And Laura, well, she's just a kid. There's not much she'd be able to tell you anyways, even if she wasn't an absolute brat to you most of the time. God, I hate Laura. Hey, wait! Damn it. Then here's where things get a little deeper than surface level, so if you haven't experienced this story for yourself, I highly recommend you skip to the time code on screen to avoid any dead serious spoilers. I know this is an old game, but part of the purpose behind these videos is to make sure people who haven't played Silent Hill are given near constant reminders that they should remedy that. So now that it's just us veterans here, let's talk about what's actually going on. Like I said before, Silent Hill 2 is essentially an expansion on the concept introduced in Crime and Punishment. James, Eddie, and Angela have all done something terrible, and whether or not you think these were horrible crimes, our characters definitely do. In this game, instead of showing the further corruption of Silent Hill's spiritual power thanks to a certain demon-worshipping cult, we're left with the after-effects of it. These lost souls were called to Silent Hill to either come to grips with or atone for their acts, and as the game goes on it becomes very clear that call didn't exactly come from the town itself. These people are all suffering from some kind of level of guilt, and a part of their inner psyche desperately needs them to admit their transgressions. And this leads to something series vets are very used to at this point, common misconceptions. A shallow analysis of SH2 will have the player assume that the town of Silent Hill, through some unknown process, is punishing these people for the things that they've done. And it can be easy to come to this conclusion, but the actual events follow SH1 a little closer than you might have thought. Like we covered in the first video of the retrospective, the town of Silent Hill doesn't necessarily do anything. It's the people in the town that cause manifestations of their own personal hells. To put it bluntly, the town will make real the most dark and hidden aspects of your unconscious mind. For James, this means creating a punishment made by him for him. Meaning yes, all of the game's monsters come from his inner fears and emotions, which explains their, let's say, interesting look. To be honest, there's a lot of analysis into why certain enemies look the way they do, kind of like how the bubblehead nurses seem to have their sexiness on full display but are lacking a visible face. But to be honest, I think people tend to get too far into the weeds with trying to psychoanalyze every aspect of this game, and I feel like that really takes away from experiencing it as the mystery it's supposed to be. How do you know that? Sure, I definitely understand why people do this, and I don't begrudge them for it, but the unconfirmed reasoning that's in my, and likely your head, is always going to be more terrifying than what I could deliver in a YouTube video. I mean, Team Silent really wanted these games to affect you on an unconscious level, and maybe we should leave it at that. Or at least I will. As you all probably know by now, throughout the game James is chased by this red pyramid thing, but... That's not the only manifestation James is responsible for, and honestly, the least interesting one. He eventually comes across what appears to be his late wife Mary's doppelganger. Maria looks nearly identical to Mary, save for more sexy fashion sense, 
and a very clingy, affectionate personality, which drives a lot of assumptions here. If Maria was created by James' unconscious desires, it's easy to assume these are traits that he saw as the ideal Mary. And going one step further, you can assume certain things about the monsters that he's populated the town with. Each of these creatures share a very common theme, from high-heeled shoes to buxom bosoms and, well, the obvious, it's clear that James has some sexual frustrations, and I think that's pretty understandable. If Mary was suffering from a terminal disease, I doubt they were knocking boots that often, and he seems incredibly torn up after her death, so it stands to reason he hasn't jumped back into the dating scene just yet. And, well, I guess it's about time he talked about it. Near the end of the game, James finally comes to the realization that Mary didn't exactly succumb to her illness. No, she died at James's own hands. It seems Mary was stuck in a hellish existence of pain and suffering and, well, she just wanted it to end. This revelation makes for a very interesting aha moment. The game never really needs to tell you out loud that Pyramid Head serves as a physical representation of James's inner guilt, animosity, and general distaste for himself. It just seems obvious given the context. And the moments where James is forced to watch Maria die are clearly him reliving his most traumatic moment. Now maybe he feels like he deserves to constantly be reminded of his own actions, or maybe they were so scarring that he can't help but relive them. But either way, we're able to form our own general explanations, and there's no real need for any one conclusion to be supported. After all, we're dealing with highly volatile mental issues here, and oftentimes there's no clearly defined line that denotes exactly why we feel the way we do. So it's nice that the game's take on the matter is equally, shall we say, murky. In this way, I think Silent Hill 2 is one of the most interesting delves into mental illness we've ever seen here in the gaming sphere. But on that same note, I think it leads to my biggest gripe with the game. For a lot of fans of the game, this isn't just their favorite Silent Hill game, it's THE Silent Hill game, and for the life of me, I just can't understand that reasoning. Now, I should probably qualify that. By no means am I saying this is not an incredible story because it most certainly is. By all means, this game's worthy of all the praise you can physically give it, but in the end, it's a spin-off. Of course, there's nothing wrong with that, but Uber SH2 fans tend to use this game specifically to discredit the rest of the series, even though they all have a sort of symbiotic relationship to each other. Here, think of it this way. Would the events of Silent Hill 2 have made any rational sense to you if you weren't already aware that the titular town possessed a supernatural power to bring inner thoughts into the physical world? Of course not, and then the game would have had to sacrifice its concise story to allow for unneeded world building. So, I know I still haven't adequately explained why this bothers me. I mean, who cares what Silent Hill fans think? I can just think whatever I want. Well, the fans aren't the issue here. The real issue is SH2's admittedly incredible story has served as the one and only archetype for a Silent Hill story since Team Silence disbanding. Now, I don't want to go too far in depth since I still haven't decided whether or not I want to cover the non-Team Silent produced games in this series, but ever since Konami started hiring outside help to make SH games, the theme of main character did something or experienced something horrible and must go to Silent Hill to remember, slash make peace with, slash get over, slash atone for it, has been present in every single entry without exception. And it seems incredibly odd that so many different developers from so many different walks of life would look at such a radical departure from the other three games in the series and think to themselves, Hmm, this seems like a one-off experience and perfectly encapsulates how future games in the series should be made. I mean, hell, the law of averages alone suggests that we should have at least seen a non-SH2 clone Silent Hill game merely by random chance at this point, but that is definitely not the world we're living in. And yeah, I know I'm harping on about this, but there's just something about faux intellectuals jumping on a bandwagon to further their own god complexes that really pisses me off. And yes, that does mean I absolutely cannot stand 95% of the games industry, including what should be my peers in games media. I guess if I had to liken it to something, it would be like when a song gets overplayed and that makes you more likely to overanalyze and criticize it. Look, like I said before, I think this is an amazingly dark, well-written, emotionally effective, and downright skillfully executed story. I can't even describe to you my own mental state as I sat there on my bed in the dark on a warm Miami night finishing the game for the first time. James, you made me happy. It was truly something everyone should experience, but 
Maybe the admiration for Silent Hill 2 has reached earthbound levels, where a large portion of the fan base is made up of people who haven't really played the game but enjoy its aesthetic or what it says about them and their incredibly avant-garde tastes. Regardless of my fanboy whining though, I hope I was able to get the point across. Silent Hill 2 has one of the most introspective and thought-provoking stories I have ever played. It's a dark and accurate look at the effects of guilt, and even though I'm leaving out a lot of elements in the interest of keeping this video under an hour, trust me when I say you don't know yourself until you've truly sunk into this world. So maybe it's about time you've dusted off that PS2 and introduced yourself to one of the best examples of video game storytelling that we have. Team Silent seemed to be real big fans of the If It Ain't Broke Don't Fix It school of game design. They found a gameplay style that they liked and that fit the world they had built, so they brought an improved version of that same style over to this new entry. And I know that sounds like it should be mundane or at the very least expected, but hey, think of it this way. Of your favorite PS1 series, how many of them have made the jump to the next generation of hardware without suffering any significant subtractions from their gameplay styles? I'm going to assume that number is relatively close to zero, and hell, that's not exactly a given today, so this stands as one of the reasons fans were so attached to this relatively small group within Konami. It was clear Team Silent had a vision, and they were completely unwilling to compromise on seeing that vision come to fruition. Of course, I can't expect everyone to have already played a Silent Hill game, and even if they had, there's a chance it wasn't the right Silent Hill game. Oh, don't you worry, we'll crack that little chestnut a little further down the road. Anyways, the point is, a little more of an explanation might be necessary here. Silent Hill 2 sticks incredibly close to the survival horror conventions put in place by genre headrunner Resident Evil. Tank controls are used here for movement, meaning up will always move your character forward relative to their orientation, and left and right will spin James on his axis. Again, R1 and L1 can be used to strafe, and again, I just never use this in any meaningful way during these three playthroughs. Just like the first game, James's movement is a lot more affected by momentum than your typical STARS member, meaning you won't be stopping on a dime or going from walking to running without a bit of wind-up in between. This can be pretty hard to get used to if you say, hypothetically, just spent two years covering all the Resident Evil games and got pretty used to transitioning into a run with almost no startup frames. I will say this approach does make it hard to maneuver like a boss, but it does feel I guess organic is the best word for it. It just kind of feels like how an actual person would move. And as a bit of good news, the looser controls do not have a negative impact on another survival horror staple, running from fights. While playing this game on every platform it's available for, I had no problem steering clear of enemies in both the wide open and smaller interior locations. So even though this control style may be rough to get used to, once you do, you'll find it's just as responsive as any other games in the genre. I will say though, I found that just like SH1, Part 2's normal mode gave me enough ammo to make sure I didn't really need to run from every monster I encountered. Even towards the late game, I was dodging enemies more as a habit than a necessity. Hell, I finished the game with a bullet count in the hundreds and enough healing items to start my own pharmacy, so if you're a vet of the genre, you might want to set the action difficulty to hard. Speaking of action, the combat is yet another unchanged element from the first game. Holding R2 will ready your weapon, and the action button still can be pressed for one type of attack and held for another. Although this time around, I noticed I wasn't as loaded down with melee options as I was in part one. In the first game, the first two or so hours had me a good three melee weapons to choose from, but for most of Silent Hill 2, you'll be stuck with the starting plank of wood with nails in it. Which really isn't a problem since, like I said, you'll have enough ammo to start a revolution in South America by the time you're finished, but replays on hard will definitely leave you wishing you had at least two more options. And since we're comparing and contrasting to the first game, Part 2 definitely spends a lot less time having you explore the town of Silent Hill. One of my favorite aspects of SH1 was running around town, finding hidden little alleys and burger joints filled with healing items. And you still do this in 2, but to a noticeably lesser degree. Also absent are the abrupt and violent transitions to the game's other world. The first outing had an air raid siren signaling Harry crossing over into Alessa's nightmare made real. But 2 is operating under slightly different circumstances than the original, so things are naturally just a little bit altered. Instead of being thrust into the other world at set moments, James slowly descends into his nightmare, a little piece of symbolism meant to signify him diving deeper into his inner torment. And I have to say, even though I really like this idea thematically, you do start to notice its absence after spending a lot of time in any one place. In Silent Hill, the shifts to the other world serve to break up long stretches of the player being in one location. 
The switch of scenery may have only been skin deep, but it really worked at keeping me from feeling fatigued. SH2 spends roughly the same amount of time in these areas, but the lack of any other world shift had me kind of getting tired of my location towards the tail end of me being there. Like I said before, the imagery of Silent Hill slowly becoming a nightmare with impossible architecture and crumbling structures works really well and is a really good way to tie the game's psychological tinge into its gameplay, but I wish there were a happy medium between the two approaches, maybe including more numerous interior areas but having them only last half as long. Of course, this is a pretty small nitpick, and first-time players will probably be so caught up in the game's atmosphere that this kind of stuff won't jump out at them but having to play the game's many versions back to back kind of made little flaws like this more visible. Leave her alone. Leave us both the hell alone. Silent Hill 2's puzzles are just as challenging as the original and stay in that really cool middle ground of not being so easy that I sped through them with no thought, but difficult enough to keep me stumped for a bit. For this playthrough, I didn't have to look up any solutions and just like before, I highly suggest you do the same. Getting stuck on a puzzle for a few minutes may seem like a bummer at first, but give it a little bit. The feeling of overcoming one of these head scratchers is one of the best parts of playing these games. But if you're a returning fan, there's always the added puzzle difficulties. And I won't lie, I've never had the balls for a hard puzzle run, but I imagine this will entice the masochists in the audience. Silent Hill 2 represents something we just don't see enough of nowadays. A sequel to a fan favorite that's not only brave enough to change up the established story and characters, but also smart enough to only improve on the gameplay. Nothing has been omitted here or changed so much that it doesn't feel like Silent Hill. You really gotta give it up to these guys because Team Silent knew exactly what worked for their game and they knew exactly what needed to be tweaked for a sequel. Speaking honestly, this might be my favorite game in the series if not for these guys pulling the same exact move in the game's sequel, Silent Hill 3. The strict adherence to survival horror gameplay makes it easy for RE fans to just slip right in and even opponents of the genre may still want to brave the challenges just to experience the game's world and deeply touching story. All in all, you really don't get much better than this. Silent Hill 2 is a classic for a very, very good reason. It represents an approach to game design centered around creating something because you desperately want to, not for any financial reasons. If you've made it this far through the video, it should be clear by now, I want you to play this game. So come jump into the world of Silent Hill and James Sunderland's twisted mind. I promise it is a trip you won't soon forget. You! It was you, wasn't it? You're the one who stepped on my hand. I don't know. Maybe I did. The development of Silent Hill 2 was special in a lot of ways. Not only was Konami pouring funds into what used to be a very small team's project, but a new console generation was right around the corner, and I don't doubt many a PS2 owner owe their purchase to seeing these amazing looking CG cutscenes. Excuse me, I... <gasps> Oh, it's just... okay. I didn't mean to... It was clear Team Silent were making sure this game would look its absolute best, and at the time, it was pretty surreal seeing a series that used to serve more as a budget title on the PS1 now being used to push units on the PS2. And if you ask me, I think the PS2 is key to all of this. In drilling into the console and draining every possible drop of theoretical performance out of it, Team Silent discovered tricks that just flat out couldn't be done on competing platforms, at least not in the same way a subject we will most certainly touch on in the port section coming up. But aside from the PS2 specific stuff, SH2 is a marvel to look at, specifically because lighting was given an incredible amount of attention, and since the first part of the game is spent exploring an apartment complex with no flashlight, you'll really start to get a feel for this fact. But once said flashlight is in your possession, well, the whole damn game changes. Team Silent really wanted this one little implement to sell the world that they were building, and man does it show. Not only does this cast a very convincing pervertex cone of real-time lighting, but it also casts perspective-correct shadows, something I honestly can't remember being in any other PS2 game, well, aside from Silent Hill 3. Thanks to the added horsepower of the console, the game's monsters all look amazing in their uniquely haunting designs, allowing Masahiro Ito's illustrations to appear nearly unaltered in the transition into the game. But to your average passing eye, all of this pales in comparison to what really drove those PS2 sales, and that was the game's stunning full 60 frame per second CG cutscenes. These cinematics are what originally caught my eye on Tech TV's extended play, and even though I had no idea what FPS were at the time, I could tell that these scenes were playing out in a much smoother manner than I was used to. In fact, my first playthrough of the game had me finding these CGs a little distracting. 
Most games I was used to at the time had a pretty low frame rate in their pre-rendered cutscenes, and thanks to this it was easy to find a focal point and keep centered on that the whole time. But SH2's incredibly smooth and fluid motion had my eyes constantly darting across the screen trying to keep track of it. Even today, my wife has an issue watching these and not commenting on how they look like something out of a soap opera. But if you appreciate large strides made in presentation, you'll likely find these scenes as entrancing as I do. One thing that really got me going was Team Silent's radical move not to give us the other world straight away. Like I mentioned before, James slowly descends into the depths of his own mind, and the town around him reflects that journey. But it's a much slower process than we diehard fans were used to. In the previous game, there was a shrieking air raid siren and boom, we were surrounded by chain link fencing and dead bodies. But Silent Hill 2 takes nearly the entire game to get to this level of desolated beauty. I really like this approach. It was like Team Silent were all teasing me and by the time I came to realize it, I was already in the other world. It's one of those things you're likely to miss your first time around because there's so much to take in. But a second or third playthrough will have you noticing all the little things that were going on in the background. Now, of course, I can't talk about graphics without mentioning how great it is seeing classic Silent Hill landmarks in this brand new engine. The town is every bit of dreary and captivating as it was in the first game, only with a flashy new coat of paint over everything. I will reiterate that I wish I could spend as much time exploring the town proper as I did in part one, but the new interior areas are nothing to sneeze at. The first area you come across, the Woodside Apartments, are a tour de force of amazingly detailed graphical achievements. The lighting is perfectly dark and there are all kinds of little accent lights and colors that help make the environment pop. The game also makes sure that textures and tile sets are complicated enough that you'll never see them repeating a pattern, which is something designers struggle with even today. But if you ask me, all the cool stuff's going on under the hood. For example, for some reason the game displays its picture off-center, giving a big empty black space above the screen, which is a really odd decision. I mean, why not just include pillar boxing on the top and bottom that equals the same amount of real estate? That's what I ended up doing for the on-screen footage in this video, and I can't imagine it would have been that hard to implement. Real quick, I'll switch to my untouched capture footage so you can see how distracting this was for me. And before you say it, I don't think this was due to my Frame Meister or PS2. I used this exact same setup and settings to record footage for all my PS2 reviews, and I've never run into this issue. And as an added bonus, I found that using the game's included alignment option can really mess with the picture even more, so I opted to record my gameplay as is and fix it for you guys in post. As for its purpose, well, I imagine just like in part one, it was a decision made to save on processing power, but to be honest, I can't find any info on the subject, so feel free to leave a comment if you've cracked this little chestnut. And without a doubt, no discussion about SH2 is complete without mentioning the upgrades made to the fog. In the first game, fog served to obscure your view of Silent Hill, so the PS1 didn't catch fire trying to rendering that much real estate. And obviously, it's still a huge part of the game's look, but in part two, it's used as more of a mask to enhance other tricks. This convincing effect is pulled off by using both 2D and 3D assets in unison with differing levels of alpha transparencies, which would be another one of those graphical tricks that proved incredibly difficult to replicate on other platforms. But I can't praise the game all day. Maybe it's because the first entry was a PS1 title and kind of deserves a little bit of leeway, or maybe it's because Part 2 is the darling of the series as far as most fans are concerned, but either way, there are aspects of SH2's presentation that bother the hell out of me. And first up on that list is the static overlay. Listen, I know all Silent Hill fans are supposed to worship this effect, but to my eyes, it's a very low-res and unflattering implementation. Now, I imagine the blurriness of consumer CRTs and a set of composite cables might make for a more believable look, but sadly, that's just not an option for me. I know the devs use this overlay to keep the game from appearing too clean visually, but in my opinion, it just takes away from how sharp and impressive the game could have looked otherwise. And if you ask me, honestly, it's kind of lazy looking. All right, now I know criticizing Team Silent's graphical choices is a pretty dick move at this point, but hear me out. Not only is the static look applied to the visible picture, but it even appears over the pillar boxing and cutscenes, which just feels terrible for some reason to me. Speaking of which, some cutscenes include close-up shots that really give you a look at how crystal clear the picture could have been and how sharp the pixels are. But there is a silver lining here. After you finish the game, you're given the option to disable this effect, something I definitely would recommend for your second playthrough. To be honest, this isn't exactly a huge gripe, but thanks to the overall excellence of the rest of the package, small issues like this can seem more noticeable. And speaking of small issues, I gotta say, the mouths look a little over-animated here. 
But okay, I might be going a little too far. Like I said, these are very small problems, and to be honest, they don't go anywhere near spoiling this incredible looking game. The PS2 proved to be a rough environment for developers to work in during its heyday, but Team Silent managed to make this console purr for them. Sure, there have been better looking games released for the PS2 since, specifically Team Silent's own sequel, but at the time there were no games that pulled off such a convincing and realistic looking presentation. And so it came to be that a sequel to a low budget horror title became the benchmark for console gaming graphics. Man, I love the early 2000s. Of course, SH2's level of success would not go unnoticed. Konami was quick to make their new bestseller available to a much larger audience, but that process would prove a bit harder than you might think. All you care about is that dead wife of yours. Just a few months after Silent Hill 2's release, Konami shot out a port on Microsoft's Xbox, and the results were, well, complicated. Right off the bat, the big case saw fit to include a tiny bit of extra story in the spin-off chapter called Born From A Wish. This gives you a bit of insight into what Maria was doing up until she met up with James. There's also a new UFO ending included, but if you ask me, the most interesting developments are in the presentation department. The first and most noticeable change is the leap from 480i to 480p. This makes for a much clearer, more detailed picture overall, especially in the more complicated background elements. Also, the Pervertex flashlight illumination from the PS2 has been upgraded to a full-on per-pixel effect. This means no more visible triangular boundaries in your flashlight cone, which makes for a very polished look. One thing that was really interesting is the implementation of a quad-channel surround sound feature that, sadly, I'm not able to take advantage of since my classic gaming setup is stereo only. But I've heard this is actually a pretty cool way to experience the game, so try it out if you can. Answering my prayers, this port of the game allows for removing the static effect without having to beat the game first, and if you ask me, this is the best addition this port brings to the table. I know it's sacrilege, but come on, the texture and 3D work here is perfectly able to pull off a dirty, nasty look on its own. Trust me when I say there's no need to throw a sloppy looking low res overlay on top of all this incredible work. But sadly, these are the only changes I can comfortably call improvements. Like I said earlier, the game used a lot of tricks to get the PS2 to produce some incredible looking effects, and when it came time to move this engine over to a new platform, those tricks obviously would no longer work. At this point, the port team were forced to use more Microsoft-friendly DirectX methods to approximate the look of the original. Now, sometimes this resulted in a pretty accurate replacement, but most of the time, well, it didn't. For example, the game's fog, while still looking pretty good, is much less present and thick looking here on the Xbox. This was due to the PS2's screen fill rate being incredibly high for the time, meaning the Xbox would have to scale down the amount of transparency effects being displayed at one time. Now, this may not be a downgrade for you personally or even something you would even notice, but it is an inaccuracy nonetheless, and also kind of an interesting little difference. One of several such differences you're likely to notice in playing these two games back to back, but I will say this, there are a few very obvious and universally agreed upon downgrades to note. First up is the gorgeous 60 frame per second cutscenes having their frame rate cut in half in order to save room on the disc. If you're used to how fluid and off-putting these cinematics were in the original, well, you're likely to notice this change right off the bat. These cutscenes are what drove sales for the game in the first place, and I think going with sloppy bink video compression and a lessened frame rate does the original a pretty great injustice. On that same subject of compression, technically the Xbox version stores sound effects and music in a lower quality state than the original, but to be honest, this wasn't something I was able to pinpoint during actual gameplay. But for me, the absolute worst problem were the random hitches and hangs that I experienced during gameplay. It seemed like they're not very frequent, and I can't for the life of me figure out why they're happening, but every once in a great while, there would be a few frames worth of a skip, which really bothered me. Now, I know this sounds like it's a bad port, since I've essentially only listed the negatives, but that's because the rest of it is just Silent Hill 2. The differences can be noticeable, but they're taking place over the same great game you've come to know and love. I wouldn't necessarily say Restless Dreams is a bad way to experience SH2, but if you ask me, it should only be used as a way for series vets to experience the game in a different light. Even though it's mostly the same game, first-timers would do well to stick to the original PS2 release. But even if you can't or don't want to take that advice, the Xbox version, while inaccurate as hell, is still a great way to play Silent Hill 2. But there are some not-so-great ways to play it. What the hell is it? 
The original PC port of SH2 was marred with graphical glitches, poor sound emulation, and the same compression-heavy 30 frame per second cutscenes found in the Xbox version. I remember trying to play through this release with a buddy of mine and having constant crashes and dealing with whole areas where sound effects would stop altogether. Trust me, I was there at launch, and it was a nightmare. Now I know what you're probably thinking. For a crappy version of the game, the footage on screen sure looks nice as hell. Well, what we're currently looking at is the result of a group of fans putting in countless hours of work to get this port of the game somewhere near the original. The Silent Hill 2 Enhanced Edition is a still-expanding mod which alters and improves nearly every aspect of the game you could think of. Support for higher resolutions is now available, and a widescreen mode has been added which required the team to go through and alter camera placement and scene geometry to make sure things that would normally be hidden off-screen don't appear in normal gameplay. And while I have to admit I've only played up to the end of the Woodside Apartments, I haven't noticed anywhere that they've missed. Originally, this version of the game used the compressed 30 frame per second cutscenes from the Xbox release, and they look just as choppy as you'd imagine. Luckily, you can download an FMV pack that includes the PS2 originals in all of their 60 frame per second glory. They've also went through and fixed any lighting issues that could be found, and trust me, there were a lot in the original PC release. Thankfully, there's also an option to disable the dumb-looking red cross that appeared on screen when you're low on health, and most interestingly, there's an option to remove the pillar boxing from cutscenes. At first, I wasn't sure how I felt about this. I mean, pillar boxing does seem to make for a more cinematic presentation, but without them, the game seemed more immersive, like there was less happening on screen to remind me I'm just playing a video game. And now that I've played around with this option for a bit, I gotta say, I actually love it. It's something I would love to see running on the PS2 original. And of course, you've probably noticed this version also lets you disable the static overlay. But if you want to play with it on, the team has included a static filter that comes closer to the PS2 original. Which is great, because the overly sharp filter that the PC used to use was really nasty looking and a little too opaque for my taste. One element for me that is a 100% improvement though is the deep inky black levels available in the PC version. Since I'm used to experiencing these black levels with a bit of analog noise in them, I was taken aback when I saw the dark impenetrable boundaries outside of James's flashlight. If you ask me, the Enhanced Edition is an absolute must for anyone thinking about playing the PC port of SH2. But once again, this is a version that should strictly be for people already familiar with the original. Don't get me wrong, what the Enhanced Edition has accomplished here is nothing short of a miracle, but it's still not perfect, and by perfect I mean accurate. I mean think about it this way, right now as we speak there are modders hard at work at trying to get elements of this PC version to look as good as the PS2 original that was released nearly two decades ago. Man, that's insane. And like clockwork, every time I work on one of these scripts, a mammoth discovery is made for a game that's lied dormant for the last two decades. As I'm writing this very part, fans have just today discovered a prototype of Silent Hill 2 with a build date of July 1st, 2001. The disc contains most of the game's contents on it, but only lets you play up until the first Pyramid Head fight. I'm hoping people will have this bad boy crack soon so we can see if there's any major differences between these assets and the final release. But until then, let's jump in with a little of our own analysis. And before we get into that, I do want to apologize for the use of footage from an emulator here. I snagged an ISO for this build and assumed I could ESR patch it and run it on my PS2 running free McBoot, but nothing I tried seemed to get it working. But hey, a little emulation never hurt anybody, right? So let's dive in. The first thing I noticed right off the bat was the footsteps and animal sounds in the forest area weren't present. And the game's 2D text seemed to be a bit off and weirdly colored. James's flashlight seems to not only pass through him, but also the pillar boxing and cutscenes, and a good number of items are either not placed yet or in a different spot than you're used to. There's also now loading text when moving from one room to the next, and man am I glad they did away with that in the final release. For some reason the FMVs don't work in this version, but apparently this isn't an issue on real hardware. I noticed some things you could probably call glitches and other graphical anomalies, but that's the issue with playing on an emulator. Getting an idea for whether it's the prototype or emulator that's causing the problem can be next to impossible. I know I'm going to sound really negative here, but overall I'd say this is a pretty uninteresting prototype. I mean, it's really cool seeing a game I love in some other form, but I was hoping to see some real differences. Incomplete assets, different outfits, you know what I mean. In my opinion, super fans should probably give this one a try, but if you don't really want to, well, you're not exactly missing out on much. 
On the plus side, apparently there's an inaccessible part of the disc that has James running around Silent Hill and Pyramid Head chasing him, so I guess there's that. But definitely keep an eye out for any more revelations coming from data mining this release. And since we're talking versions, you know it's not an Avalanche Reviews retrospective without a little back-to-back -back action. Don't read into that. So let's compare every version of Silent Hill 2 available right now. Obviously, the Xbox and PC release overtake the PS2 original in clarity and overall resolution, but if you ask me, SH2 was made in such a custom manner that you can't really separate it from the console that spawned it. Now, I know that sounds like an elitist thing to say, but I swear in this one instance, I'm not just speaking from a misguided sense of nostalgia for my first experience with the game. This game is just too ingrained in the PS2's odd, weird, and kind of quirky hardware to really put it anywhere else. Sure, other platforms have solutions for real-time lighting or perspective-correct shadows, but they just don't look the same as they do on PS2 because of the little tricks that had to be pulled to get them working. Anyone looking to go ahead with the Xbox or PC versions of the game will definitely have a great time and might not even notice any problems. But if you do, if you just so happen to notice a little stutter here or maybe an odd angle there, you're always going to wonder if this is how the game is supposed to play or result of the changes made during the porting process. For me, the PS2 version is 100% the way to go for your first playthrough, but there's no bad options here. There's only 100% accuracy or 90%. I really like the additions and changes made to the base game and the subsequent releases, but to really appreciate these things, I think you need to be very familiar with what spawned them. Well, obviously the choice is going to ultimately be up to you guys, but trust me when I say you're going to want this disc spinning in your PS2 as soon as possible. What a terrible tragedy. What a gruesome end to such a and I know you didn't think we're going to finish this one out without talking about the absolute genius that is Akira Yamaoka's masterful sound design. While the first game was filled with harsh, metallic, or industrial soundscapes, this game leans much harder on a softer, more ambient sound. Like I said in my previous video, Yamaoka would eventually come to develop a very recognizable sound to his music, and this game is 100% the beginning of that process. Here we start to notice his love for including guitar tracks and his tendency to use a tinny sort of surf rock sound to his tuning and amp effects. The entire soundtrack has a much more somber, sad tone to it than SH1, and just like before, the man is not afraid to omit music altogether, letting his masterful environmental sound effects set the stage for one of the creepiest audio experiences you're likely to ever have. On a personal note, it's amazing playing these games back to back like this and being able to see his sound evolve to what I think is his ultimate level in the next game. But as far as video game soundtracks go, this is easily one of the best in existence. Yamaoka's tracks here straddle the line between dark hopelessness and ambient melodic beauty, and the overall sound design is no slouch either. Enemies sound incredibly scary, and little tones and jingles included all over for small actions will give you a very otherworldly feel. Kind of like this is all some kind of hazy dream. Without a doubt, this is a soundtrack you're going to want to get your hands on. It truly is a work of absolute genius and one of the most immersive soundscapes in video games, period. He was dead when I got here, honest. Anyway, I gotta run. Hopefully I've made it painfully clear that Silent Hill 2 is a more than worthy follow-up to the original Foggy Town Simulator. It takes everything you could have possibly liked about SH1 and amplifies it exponentially. The graphics, interface, music, and sound effects are all dramatically better, but still give off a very Silent Hill type of feeling. The fact that it elected to leave the core story of the series behind and instead focused on new characters and their inner torment was in my opinion a bold and awesomely rewarding idea. I mean sure, I would have preferred a continuation of the town's story and how it entangled with the cult of the first game, but SH2 gave the writers a lot of freedom. They didn't have to worry about keeping up with continuity and just focused on telling a deeply disturbing tale that would resonate with the fans. And it's here that I have to admit a bias that those of you that know me are already aware of. <sighs> Alright, here we go. I honestly feel like Silent Hill 2 is overrated, but wait, hold on, put down your pitchforks. Not in the way you might think. I could care less what fans think about the game because obviously that has no bearing on me, but it's game developers and games journalists that make this such an overhyped release. 
Essentially, everyone in a position to sell themselves as a creative person is damn near forced to consider this to be the gold standard of gaming, and at its core, there's nothing wrong with that. That is, until it's time to create something. Like I said before, every single person to ever attempt a Silent Hill game after the disbanding of Team Silent did so under the impression that SH2 should serve as the mold that their art has to flow into. And if you're the kind of edgy dork who never grew out of the suicide is cool and meaningful mentality, then you're likely to trumpet this game's accomplishments from the rooftop, letting the Cheeto dust fall from your patchy beard like an elegant snow to the pavement. But all jokes aside, this isn't aimed at you, the hardcore Silent Hill 2 fan. I imagine you have your own reasons for preferring this entry over the others and help more power to you. There's just some incredibly annoying people on your side of the fence. I mean, honestly, Silent Hill 2 is flat out amazing, which makes it hard to disagree with Fairweather fans who have only played 2, or even worse, have never played it but spend all their time consuming fan theories and dissertations about how Pyramid Head could totally exist outside of James's inner Okay, look, I might be ranting a little bit. The point is, Silent Hill 2 is incredible. It's one of the best sequels ever made, and a frontrunner for the best example of how to weave a meaningful narrative into a plot without bogging the player down with pages of exposition. It really is something to behold, and even if you're the kind of person who prefers 2 over the better games in the series, I can totally see where you're coming from. I may not agree, but I'll be damned if you can't make a solid argument for your position. So if you've made it this far and still haven't put it together, I fully and wholeheartedly recommend you go out and play Silent Hill 2. Not only is it important to me, but I would say it's important to the industry. I think we would all be a lot better off if more people remembered how Team Silent made the perfect follow-up to a game that was already amazing. Once again, I want to suggest that newcomers start with the PS2 original, but they're all great options. Well, maybe not all of them. Yes, we are definitely going to talk about that soon, I promise. But until then, I want to thank you all for sticking with me for this long and for supporting this series. Stay tuned because next time we'll be catching up with a few familiar characters and possibly putting an end to the events that started in part one. I hope to see all of you again for that one, but if not, I want to thank you all for watching The Silent Hill Retrospective. Well guys, I know we just got done sorting that torrid business with James and all of his personal baggage out, but I think it's time we return to that empty vacation resort. I've been getting the feeling that we're not quite done with the events of our first trip, and I don't know about you guys, but if there's one thing I want after watching a man lose his daughter to a deranged demon-worshipping cult, it's closure. So pile in everyone, it's about time we put an end to this insanity once and for all. For those of you who've made this trip with me before, I expect something a little different from what you remember, and for those stumbling across this town for the first time, well, welcome to Silent Hill. Back in the heyday of the PS2, Konami could be called a lot of things, but unwilling to capitalize on a successful franchise is definitely not one of them. After SH2 managed to capture an even bigger audience than the game that preceded it, we were certain a follow-up was on its way, but what we didn't know is that it would have a much smaller team than before, which could spell bad news, but in this situation was perfectly reassuring. That's because the main components of Team Silent present for parts 1 and 2 were on board for this sequel, and if there's one thing I want you guys to take away from this retrospective, it's that these guys know how to make a detail-rich and engaging video game. Oh, and before we get too deep into this, I'm sure this is going to turn into another lengthy trip, so check out the description where I'll be leaving a sort of table of contents with timestamps for all the juicy details. And with that out of the way, just like before, E3 and the gaming press at the time made sure we were assaulted on all sides with Silent Hill 3 Media, and just like before, this worked perfectly in getting me excited as hell. It was very clear from the outset that Team Silent had the goal of one-upping their previous effort, an idea that might have seemed impossible at the time, but, well, we had no idea what we were in for. During the pre-release hype for SH3, I found myself reliving Silent Hill 2's production. And what I mean by that is, while I enjoyed the trailers and images being released, I was a little dismayed to find out I didn't recognize any of the characters being shown off. To be completely honest with you, I started to wonder if Silent Hill had turned into an anthology of unrelated stories, but before we get into how wrong I was, let's talk basics. This game, much like its predecessor, started out with a piece of media as its inspiration. 
Silent Hill 2 used the Russian novel Crime and Punishment as a jumping off point, which played out as a gritty look into guilt and how humans deal with the terrible things they've done. Well, this time around it seems like Jacob's Ladder was the siren call for Team Silent, only this one wouldn't be as much of a one-to-one -one adaptation. Instead, Jacob's Ladder plays more of an auxiliary role, inspiring themes of questioning reality and whether or not all of this is as it seems. But these ideas tend to remain on the periphery. The main story is more of a traditional tale of, uh, well, let's just take it from the top. You come here and enjoy spilling their blood. Silent Hill 3 starts off with a nightmare of a terribly creepy amusement park, and at its apex, our main character wakes up in her local mall. After a quick call to her dad to explain her lateness, she's confronted by a PI named Douglas. Apparently, he knows her name and has been paid by a person who wants to find and talk to her. In these first scenes, we get a real feel for these people. Heather clearly has a lot of love for her dad and is very obviously not in the business of taking any shit. My name is Douglas Carter. I'm a detective. A detective? Really? Well, nice talking to you. So to avoid any more time spent with a guy who looks like your local flasher, Heather ducks into the girl's bathroom and makes a hasty escape out the window. In trying to double back and lose the trench coat wearing investigator, she stumbles across something unexpected, I guess? Well, maybe that's underselling the situation a bit. Now armed with what looks like a Beretta, Heather finds herself navigating an empty mall which now that I think about it, empty might not be the right word. It seems like the place has been flooded with creatures of the Cthulhu-esque monstrosity variety. Heather eventually finds another human, but in true Silent Hill fashion, she's more about delivering cryptic and puzzling statements, and less about properly explaining what the hell is going on around here. After what you could charitably call a conversation, Heather doubles over in pain and is introduced to a very familiar concept. That's right, our girl is having her first brush with what Harry liked to call the other world which may not seem like a big deal. I mean, this is Silent Hill after all. We probably should have seen this coming, but it's not the other world that's causing the confusion. It's Heather, or more accurately, Heather's location. This is all taking place in Portland. Sure, we're used to Silent Hill's spiritual power being able to bring manifestations straight from your inner psyche and implement them into the real world, but how the hell is this happening outside of that cursed town? Team Silent seemed to be toying with the established mechanics of this world, and from this point on, I was absolutely hooked. I had never played a game that had me so interested right off the bat before. I mean, sure, I was initially here because of the series' pedigree, but the events happening in this very early part of the game perfectly set up a mystery I was more than happy to unravel, but I think mystery is the key word here. This game's events are better uncovered than they are explained, so as usual, I'd recommend skipping to the time on screen to avoid any spoilers to this incredible story. Okay? Alright, let's dig in a little deeper. After the mall incident and what must be the longest trip home anyone has ever taken, Heather comes home to find her father has been murdered by Claudia. And at this point, we start to ask ourselves, why the hell should we care? We've never even heard the man's voice, so why is his death being treated like such a meaningful moment? Well, take a quick look at that face. Yep, that's right, we are looking at Harry Mason, the main character of the first game, meaning Heather must be the little girl from the Good Plus ending, which of course opens a whole new world of questions as Heather and Douglas return to Silent Hill to get revenge on the woman who murdered her father. Once there, Heather starts to remember things about her past and finally begins to discover that she is essentially Alessa, and just like Alessa, she's pregnant with the physical body of the demon god Silent Hill's cult warships, which explains her being able to manifest the other world outside of Silent Hill and not a lot else. Now, I don't know about you guys, but this was a twist that absolutely took me for a ride. Maybe it was my young age or the fact that I rarely try to figure out a story while I'm experiencing it, but finding out that I was playing as a person that was essentially the antagonist of the last game, or at the very least a conduit for the antagonist of the last game, really blew my mind. This made these characters automatically seem more familiar to me, and I think this is where I deviate from most SH fans. In my opinion, this is an amazing story, one that stands as the absolute best example of storytelling in the series bar none. You mock God, traitor. You now don't get me wrong, the absolute terror of part one and the mystery and psychological aspects of part two were incredibly deep and interesting, but Silent Hill 3's story does something totally different and in my opinion is much more effective for it. 
See, SH3's story isn't the real draw here, or should I say the events of the story aren't. What really pulls me in and makes me feel like I'm a part of this world are the characters. Now, I know this is a very subjective view, but there's something about the intersection of well-written personalities and the best voice acting I have ever heard makes these people feel real to me. Take Heather, for instance. Sure, she's scared out of her mind and has no idea what's going on around her, but she's also mad as hell. If I knew that, I wouldn't be so confused, would I? She can't understand the events taking place around her, and that really pisses her off. She doesn't just politely accept the cryptic language everyone uses when they talk to her. She yells at them to make more sense. If you ask me, this makes for the perfect stand-in for her audience. I mean, how many times did you get mad at James or Harry for just going with the weird shit that comes out of other characters' mouths? How many times did you yell at your screen begging for someone to elaborate on something? I know I can't be the only one doing that. But aside from that, she's just incredibly relatable to me. I've always had a soft spot for female characters in video games, but Heather was the first character I ever controlled that made me feel this kind of connection. I know it sounds weird, but I saw where she was coming from and felt like I understood her plight. Now, obviously, this has a lot to do with the incredible talent that went into writing, voicing, and creating her, but I think there's a lot of me in there. So when I describe Silent Hill 3 as having the absolute best story in the series, I do it understanding that a lot of that is very personal to me alone, and it might be hard, if not impossible, to explain these things inside of my head to you guys properly. And listen, I know, I review video games. Describing my own objective experience is supposed to be my job here, but sometimes I think things go a little too deep to accurately pass through the filter of coherent thought, if that makes any sense. To me, Heather might as well be real, and the people around her all feel the same. They're all me. Vincent is the more negative aspects of my personality, my greed and envy. Douglas is the part of me looking to do good in order to make up for my bad deeds. Claudia is my mindless and selfless devotion to the things and people I believe in and my willingness to dirty my hands for a result I may not personally benefit from. And Heather? Well, she's my passion, my teenage angst I still hold on to, and my protective attitude towards my friends and family. Okay, so I know this is getting a little deeper and more personal than I normally get, and I am 100% aware that I've described almost none of the plot so far, but sometimes I gotta write what's inside, and if that means a less informative description, well... That's gonna happen every once in a while. Like I said, I can't really verbalize all the things that make me love this story, its world, and its characters so much, but I hope there was something in these meandering words that gave you even a brief glimpse of my feelings regarding this incredible work. So I guess to sum things up, if you're looking for a meaningful world populated with characters that feel so real you could swear you've met them before, I'd say Silent Hill 3 will be your Citizen Kane. This is a deeply personal story for me, and I know this hasn't exactly been the most informative critique I've ever penned, but in this one instance, I'm more interested in expressing what's inside. Sure, I started this channel with the intent of convincing my friends to play all these great games, but mostly I want to come to grips with what all this means to me, wrapping my head around not only what I enjoy, but why I enjoy it. But on a much less subjective note, this is an amazingly well-written story that does a commendable job at both tying into Silent Hill 1 and wrapping up any possible loose ends the series may have had. Which does make sense, as this was supposed to be the end of the Silent Hill series, and while that didn't exactly pan out thanks to Konami wanting to milk it for every red cent it could squeeze out, you can really feel the finality of things after beating 3. It's clear this was supposed to put the nasty events of Silent Hill to sleep, and if you're even remotely interested in finding out where all these twists and turns end up, trust me, you're gonna wanna experience this story. So no matter what you do, whether it's emulation, real hardware, Let's Plays on YouTube, as long as it's not the HD collection, you definitely wanna put yourself in a position where you can experience this story. I promise you, it will be worth your time. Silent Hill is a series that was always dedicated to emulating and improving on the survival horror experiences that made the genre great. Sure, they could have changed up the gameplay, made it fit more in line with the types of games that were more popular at the time, but Team Silent had a vision, one that they were clearly dedicated to. So why do I mention all this up front? Well, Silent Hill 3 is exactly like Silent Hill 2 in that they are both perfect progressions of the games that came before them. The same survival horror gameplay that you got used to in Part 2 is all present and accounted for, in addition to a few incremental upgrades that serve to give you more options in combat, but before we get into combat, let's talk exploration. Silent Hills 1 and 2 were pretty similar in the sense that they were separated into two distinct but overlapping sections. 
one where our character would be exploring the actual town of Silent Hill, and another where they would be confined to a more strict interior area. When you had the freedom to explore the town, the game toyed with a very open world kind of feel, but of course nothing like what we know as open world today. Something more akin to Stalker, where most of the environment is cut off to the player, but a bit of persistence and some luck would have them stumbling upon a cache of healing items or ammo. Now, if you'll remember, in my review of SH2, I said I was a little disappointed by the fact that it spent a little less time in the town and more time navigating the narrow hallways of an interior area. Well, I'm sad to say Part 3 continues this trend with even less time spent in the actual town than Part 2. Of course, in its defense, you do spend a good chunk of the game outside of the eponymous town itself, but still, I would have loved to have seen more familiar sights. Okay, so a little bit less frantically running around Silent Hill looking for spare health drinks. It's not ideal, but there are certainly worse things, so if we're spending even more time indoors, do these parts do enough to make up the difference? Well, in my opinion, Silent Hill 3's exploration gameplay blows both of its predecessors out of the water. I think a lot of it has to do with me finding the layouts of these areas to be just the perfect cross-section between organically explorable and realistic-feeling architecture. Don't get me wrong now, SH2 had amazing locations to explore, but oftentimes they would seem sort of contrived. Honestly, I'm not really sure how to explain it. Maybe too video gamey would be the right way to say it. And of course, there was my one lingering complaint with 2 not having an abrupt shift to the other world, making exploration seem like it lasts twice as long. Well, good news is Silent Hill 3 has you bringing the other world forward at set points in the area, and just like 1, this helps immensely with keeping exploration from feeling stale. Almost like clockwork, as soon as I started to feel fatigued with an area, something would trigger Heather to manifest her fears and inner darkness into the environment. This means an altered layout and more of a challenge combat-wise, which was amazing for keeping me engaged. <laughs> As far as combat goes, you guys know the deal by now. Hold a trigger button to ready, press X to attack, hold it for more powerful attacks, and there's a stray function, once again, that I never really used. This time around, I was happy to see a few more melee implements to mess around with, and overall the combat feels much more tight and challenging. In part 2, you really only had to position yourself correctly and make sure your swing landed first, and you were all but guaranteed a victory thanks to long stun states. In 3, enemies seem to recover from being hit much quicker, and it also feels like they have much less of a wind-up before one of their attacks land, meaning I was way more likely to take damage in a fight than I ever was in Part 2. Even when I had a good situation on my side, I would get caught with the odd close-range haymaker. This little tweak made sure combat was something I was scared of, something that served as an equalizer for the overall gameplay, and a reassurance that I would not be flush with healing items for very long. Which leads to my next point. This game is far more conservative with giving out ammo and supplies. At the end of Silent Hills 1 and 2, I was full to the brim with health drinks, first aid, and ammo. But in 3, I had to scrimp by with next to nothing for long periods of time. Sure, I had plenty of handgun ammo, but that was because I was actually running from most enemies. A tactic I only engaged in by habit in the older games instead of necessity. So yes, the game is more difficult in a traditional sense, but it's more rewarding in a survival horror sense. But they did add a couple of options that would help you mitigate this. Beef jerky can be found that will have most monsters worried about eating it instead of you, but this was always hit or miss for me. Sometimes I would put it down, it would perform its intended purpose, and sometimes monsters would just bypass it and make a beeline straight for me. This led to me not using it that much, but it's nice to have on you in a pinch. And in keeping with the theme of Team Silent making only small, incremental changes to their formula, Silent Hill 3 features items that can modify combat to a degree. From a bulletproof vest that decreases damage but reduces run speed, to a silencer that makes it easier to fight without alerting everyone in the room but decreases attack power. These little additions feel great and add a layer of complexity that wasn't present before. Of course, if you don't like messing with tradition, you can always elect not to pick these up or just not using them. For me, this was a genius way to augment your average survival horror combat without messing around too much with the pillars that make everything what it is. And speaking of which, it can have survival horror without puzzles, and I have to say the challenge here seems a little more mechanical than previous games, which I know doesn't make any sense, so let me explain. Silent Hill has always been known for puzzles like figuring out which keys on a piano to play, or where to put certain items based on some type of riddle or poem or math problem. And while 3 definitely has a few examples of this, it seems like most of the puzzles are the find obstruction then apply item to obstruction sort of variety. I was actually surprised by this, since the years have caused me to remember things slightly differently. Looking back, I always remembered the challenging puzzles in this game, but coming back to it, 
I was taken back when I found a more Resident Evil style approach to puzzles. Now, this isn't exactly a downside, I mean both types are pretty damn satisfying, and it's not like the quality of these head scratchers has been diminished, they're just different. Maybe in a way that only someone playing these games back to back would ever really notice. But there is one thing that got on my nerves a bit, and it's going to be very, very hard to verbalize, so here it goes. It seems like the environments were developed in such a way that they are just a bit off-center in regards to how Heather moves. Okay, so I know that doesn't make much sense, but this scene behind the mall has always been my benchmark for this. See here how I can't keep Heather in a straight line? Kind of like the direction of this alley is laying in between forward and a diagonal in regards to Heather's possible degrees of movement. So why the hell would I spend so much time trying to explain such a dumb concept? Well, first off, if you're anything like me, you're going to notice it anytime you need to run long straight lines. And, well, the rest of the gameplay is absolutely phenomenal. There's literally nothing to complain about here except for one very small thing that I can barely figure out. It's essentially the exact same experience as the game that came before it, but improved in such a way that it's totally noticeable and very subtle at the exact same time. If you ask me, this is the perfect sequel. It not only draws from what the previous games accomplished, but sets out to do even more, all without changing the general feel of playing a Silent Hill game. Without a doubt, this is the apex of the series, and even though it's not a perfect game, it is a perfect Silent Hill game. Sure, people that aren't keen on survival horror or psychological horror still might not like it, but as far as the genre goes, you just don't get better than this. To me, SH3 is one of the greatest horror games ever made. It's not only interesting and deep in that way only Silent Hill games know how to accomplish, but it's also a perfectly polished experience with next to no glitches, spelling errors, poorly programmed assets, or any of the other issues we've grown used to from modern AAA releases. So, if you're looking to spend a good portion of your time equal parts scared, excited, and suffering from extreme amounts of existential dread, and let's face it, you should be, pick up a copy of Silent Hill 3. It truly is a marvel of creative and technical know-how, and should serve as the game all modern attempts at survival horror must be compared against. Well, I've been pretty clear that this game's story and gameplay are the absolute best in the series, and I don't think I'm going to be blown any minds here when I say its presentation is also the best in its class. But even outside of a Silent Hill context, I'll be damned if this isn't one of the best looking games on the PS2. And I think most of this comes down to Team Silent's near mastery over the hardware they were working with, but a huge amount of the credit has to go to a solid eye for art and design. Sure, it's nice having what was a powerful gaming machine at their disposal, but the characters and environments would look flat and lifeless if it weren't for the team's incredible art direction and affinity for realistic lighting. Now, I know it can be hard to look at old 480i footage and hear someone calling it good looking, but check out how well it holds up against Onimusha 3 a graphically impressive game in its own right that dropped a full year after SH3. Now, I know this isn't exactly apples to apples, but Capcom scanned Jean Reno's face into the game. We can assume they're going for a more realistic look, but as you can see, Silent Hill 3 achieves it to a much more believable degree, let's say. Well, okay, comparing old PS2 games is fun as hell, but let's get back on track by comparing some more old PS2 games. Taking a look here, you can see just how much ground was covered in the short time between the release of SH2 and 3. Faces seem to have more points of articulation and animate much more fluidly, and you can see so many more little details of things like hair and clothing. And since we're making good with the comparisons, I have to mention how happy I am to see the option to disable the static overlay being available right from the get-go. I ended up playing through both versions of the game without the static filter on, and I think just like in Part 2, it is a much better looking game without it. Right along with the static option, there's something much more interesting to play around with. The display option lets you toggle something essential, and one of the only things I've ever seen that made me question Team Silent's art design. For some reason, I will never know. By default, Silent Hill 3 uses a kind of bilinear looking filter that gets applied to all of the game's graphics. Now, I'm sure there are some of you watching right now who don't like seeing sharp pixels in their video games, and while beauty is ultimately in the eye of the beholder, well, I mean, there's just no way of getting around it. You're wrong, and honestly, I suggest you get help. But in all seriousness, I can't see any scenario where you would want to do this to your game willingly. And as a guy who first experienced the game on a CRT, I can confirm it looked even worse on its intended display tech, so no blaming this one on upscaling. Why anyone at Konami thought this was a good idea, I will honestly never know, but on the plus side, they did end up giving us an option to disable it, so no harm, no foul, I guess? 
And going back to previous problems, this game is skewed off-center vertically just like Part 2 was. Luckily, Part 3's screen position option doesn't trigger any weird artifacts at the bottom of the screen like SH2 did, so that issue, while still a puzzle for me as far as why it's there, kind of ended up solving itself, so that's good. But hey, there were bound to be a few flies in the ointment, right? If you ask me, these guys deserve eternal credit for pushing the PS2 to these limits, but how does the game look in context to what we expect from a Silent Hill game? Well, enemy designs are definitely up to the series standard, only with this time less human looking proportions compared to those found in 2. Enemies all seem to fall into the Lovecraftian formless horror type of look, and you really start to see the Jacob's Ladder influence when characters like Valtiel show up. There's also some nods to the first game with the incorporation of wheelchairs in parts of the environment. And since we're on the subject, man, this game has nailed realistic looking locations. Exploring the mall and subway station is incredibly surreal. These places look very convincing and show off Team Silent's well-known obsession with detail. For some reason, this area right here though, just outside of Heather's apartment, always struck a chord with me. I'm not sure if it's the lighting or design, but this place always felt real, kind of like it's somewhere I've been to before. But these locations are only half the story, and fans of the series will be happy to know that Silent Hill 3 does the other world justice. Just like its story, this is the ultimate culmination of what Silent Hill has accomplished over the years. These locations look even more uninviting and downright terrifying than they ever have. The rust is rustier, and the designs are even more dreamlike. I really like that the team made the other world look much more similar to how it did in part 1. I mean, sure, Part 2 looked awesome with its ghost town decades after it's been abandoned and possibly hit by a natural disaster kind of look, but 3 hammers home a very similar design language to the first game, which I really, really appreciate. Getting just a bit off the beaten path, one thing that struck me after all these years of playing Silent Hill 3 is that the game doesn't use any pre-rendered CG cutscenes, which is a really crazy idea when you consider the fact that pre-rendered cutscenes essentially sold the last game. Now, this isn't a complaint for me because I really think it helps immersion when you don't have to be teleported to a CGI world every time someone needs to talk to you, but it was a really odd concept when it struck me because I never really noticed it, which is kind of cool. Once again, a huge emphasis on realistic lighting is present here, only this time with more of a focus on colored lighting in the environment. While the flashlight still uses a per-vertex solution leaving triangular boundaries visible, there's a bit of a blur applied to the effect which makes it much harder to notice. The same perspective correct shadows can be found on a lot of assets in the environment, and to this day, these still blow me away. One of my all-time favorite areas is the subway train near the start of the game. This one spot uses such an amazing blend of real-time and pre-baked lighting, great texture work, and realistic design to make this one area seem legitimately real to me. But hey, we're spending all this time talking about how good Silent Hill looks in the context of a PS2 game, but there is another option. A PC version of SH3 was rolled out only a few months after the original, and in a move that surprised the hell out of me and everyone I knew, Konami actually made up for their shoddy job porting SH2. Included is a configuration tool letting you set resolutions up to 1280 by 1024 and the game even lets you set rendering resolution, effectively allowing for a super sampled image. Once again, this is a port that I snagged on launch, and the experience compared to SH2's nasty PC version is night and day. I had no issues getting this up and running on my old Dell Optiplex back in the day, and everything from graphics to sound just seemed to work with no fuss. And I do have good news for you, modern operating systems do produce a similar result. I'm running this game essentially stock, with the exception of a widescreen patch allowing me to get a full 1080p out of this bad boy, and I gotta say, it looks out of this world. Seeing these incredible looking PS2 assets in even more positive light is a life-changing event, and if you don't agree that PS2 graphics upscaled to 1080p isn't life-changing, well, I think you may have stumbled across the wrong YouTube channel. For real though, there's so much detail here, and the dark black levels really help draw you in. Sure, I still have a soft spot for the PS2 original, but damn, it's hard not to jump ship and fully recommend this version. Unlike Part 2's PC port, there are far less inaccuracies to be found, and I gotta assume that's because there was no Xbox version to pull from. Whoever ported this game just had to bring over the full PS2 base experience, and it's a better game for it. Of course, there are a few flaws that become noticeable with the increased fidelity, but they're pretty small. 
For example, in some scenes you can see a squared off boundary for Heather's flashlight lens flare, and if you're really scrutinizing the environment, you might notice a few low res textures, which honestly is totally understandable. I mean, we are pushing this game much further than it was intended to go. Now, a back to back comparison isn't exactly fair in this scenario, but just for shits and giggles, let's see what we get. Obviously, the PC version takes the win here with its incredible look, accurate porting, widescreen capabilities, X input support, and, well, more accessible nature if you're keen on sailing the high seas, if you get my drift. In my opinion, I still have to side with the PS2 original based more on my initial experience on the platform and my flat out love for the console's impressively unique video output, but even I have to admit the PC version is probably the best option to go for if you're trying to play Silent Hill 3 right now. Honestly though, it doesn't matter which version you go with. Either way, you'll be looking at one of the most graphically impressive titles of its day, and hey, disagree if you want, but to me, Silent Hill 3 looks much better than most Xbox 360 launch games. Now, most of this is thanks to a near maniacal level of attention to detail and a strong focus on art design, and while I can admit a bit of a bias on my part, I just don't think any other console of its day could have produced such incredible results. So I'm happy to say whether it's PS2, PC, or even emulation, this is a game you absolutely have to see with your own eyes, because if your dead body's gonna get drug away by a tall, otherworldly creature, it better be a high fidelity, tall, otherworldly creature. Well, by now you guys have probably noticed, I don't spend as much time on Akira Yamaoka's incredible music in these videos, and trust me, it's not from a lack of interest. These soundtracks are some of the finest music I've ever heard, but despite my background in recording music and fronting a band, I still just lack the words to express how amazing this stuff is. Well, luckily I have a friend who does not suffer from this problem. Evan over at the YouTube channel Game Music Minutia knows two things above all else, Silent Hill and how to describe music, so in the interest of finally having someone on here who knows what the hell they're talking about, take it away, Evan. Hi everyone, this is Evan, also known as Game Music Minutia. As Jared explained, I love talking about game music, and as my early years of work on YouTube prove, Silent Hill is one of my favorite sets of scores to praise. So let's just get right to it. Through the first four entries in the series, composer and sound designer Akira Yamaoka managed to elevate the already beautiful and haunting visuals within the Team Silent games, making the scores and sounds an integral component of what we know as Silent Hill. Starting with the first entry, Yamaoka pulled inspiration from unlikely places, like Twin Peaks composer's Angelo Bandalamenti, to create tracks that feature a melding of industrial, experimental tones with freeform and, oftentimes, avant-garde jazz. What's more, the impeccable sound design, from the sound of Harry's footsteps on metal grates to the incessantly terrifying radio feedback, brings Silent Hill to life, while also teaching the player how to differentiate between danger and safety. Pretty cool. Yamaoka carried that same quality to Silent Hill 2, however, bringing a refined focus on characterization. If Silent Hill's score was designed to inject added soul into the sleepy town, then Silent Hill 2's was crafted to distinguish the differences and similarities between the characters trapped there. Tracks like Promise, Heaven's Night, and Theme of Laura help us step into the emotional states of James, Maria, and Laura, even if we didn't realize it on a conscious level. And then came Silent Hill 3, which, in my personal opinion, served as a showcase for Yamaoka's best work in the series. Heather's struggle to understand her troubled identity and not conform to the town's will was brilliantly represented in Yamaoka's scores. Every song had a dual nature, reminiscent of Heather's confrontation with the pagan zealot, Claudia. Breeze in Monochrome Night and Dance with Nightwind, for example, feature the iconic experimental and industrial ambient sounds we've come to associate with Silent Hill, especially in the first century, but fused with delicate piano melodies and steady beats, which could be representative of Heather and her sense of modern normalcy. In other words, it's an auditory play on the old world mixing with the new world. In addition, Silent Hill 3's score features several songs with lyrics, like the killer I Want Love, which brings some lounge-style music to the overall package. And pro tip, get the album and listen to the studio mix of I Want Love because it's life-changing. There's so much more I could say about the soundtrack, but for the sake of time and not hijacking Jared's video, I'll leave the praise there for now. Thanks for listening. It means a great deal, and everyone watching should be happy to know that they're supporting a great guy who works extremely hard to bring us content on so many amazing games. So thanks again, Jared. Back to you. If this really is the work of God, then I'd say she has lousy taste. 
Well, by now, I hope my feelings on the matter are very, very clear. In my opinion, 3 is not only leaps and bounds above the other amazing entries in this series, but above most other PS2 games as far as satisfying gameplay, incredibly immersive stories, and razor-sharp graphics are concerned. This is truly the result of Team Silent's collective talent reaching some kind of theoretical maximum goodness. It's a culmination of all their techniques and know-how built up over the years, and it's fitting that Silent Hill 3 have that honor, as it was intended to be the last game in the franchise, according to certain members of the team. I mean, it makes sense they would go out with a bang, and even though it sucks to have something you've enjoyed for three entries and two console generations come to an end, it's nice being present for a climactic ending to an incredibly interesting saga. But if you ask me, that's what makes it truly impactful. An ending. Sure, Silent Hill's world's seemingly infinitely interesting, but knowing it could last forever is not appealing to me. I like things concluding in a satisfactory way, and without spoiling anything, SH3 is exactly that. It's a very fitting end to the long and sometimes confusing tale of a foggy vacation town and the cult that lives within it. Now, I know we're only three videos in and I have already given away my feelings on the rest of the series, but I'll put it bluntly. If you're here waiting for me to cover a game in the series that tops three in production value, art direction, playability, or good storytelling, well, that's a long wait for a train don't come. Silent Hill 3 is for me the concept of skilled game creation made real. It represents my expectations for sequels to beloved franchises and is the reason I'm mostly disappointed with modern video game creation. Sure, we have more tech and advertising available to us than ever before, but we seem to have lost sight of what makes people play deep, meaningful, story-driven video games. We've somehow lost the character that was forged in the furnace of console limitations and very narrow genre borderlines. You know, when I think about it, maybe that's why Silent Hill 3 means so much to me. Maybe it represents the last of a dying breed, a group of misfits all dedicated to producing real art and given the financial freedom to do so by what should have been a soulless AAA company. I doubt very much that I will ever see a game like 3 again in my lifetime, and honestly, I'm okay with that. This will always be a story and experience that will stick with me, and it's in that that I have to admit one thing. You guys never stood a chance at getting a fair, unbiased review of this game. But if you're not currently furiously typing me an effigy in the comments section for something I've said here, I hope I've either made you want to give 3 a shot, or at the very least, made a reasonable case for my side of the argument. And if I didn't, well, the good news is we'll be shitting on the Silent Hill HD collection next, so maybe stick around for that one. And to those few brave souls that made it this far, thank you very, very much for watching the Silent Hill Retrospective. Alright, so before we get into what will likely be 15 straight minutes of me screaming into a microphone, I gotta talk shop with you guys. As you may have heard, new regulations have made YouTube a relatively shaky platform to make a living off of. Well, more shaky than usual is probably more accurate. The rule has always been, content like mine will always make less money than your average family friendly stuff, but now on top of that, anything seen as remotely family friendly but not listed as such runs the risk of bringing down a $40,000 fine from the FTC, an amount of money I've never even seen all at once before. So if there was ever a time to support content you enjoy, it's now. I have my Patreon linked here on screen and in the description, and if you think independent game reviews with a focus on retro video on original hardware is worth a buck a month, well I'd sure appreciate it. If for whatever reason you can't or don't want to throw some support my way, maybe think about doing it for someone else you enjoy. I guarantee you they likely need it more than you know. And for those of you that can't for any reason at all, thank you anyways. You guys have brought me feelings of satisfaction I never dreamed of, and I love you all for it. So with that in mind, enough shilling, let's dive face first into this turd. Well guys, we have made it to THE video a lot of you have been waiting for. The Silent Hill HD collection is world renowned for its terrible quality. Stories of its corner cutting, bad decisions, and flat out incomplete nature of its final product have been told far and wide but have you had the courage to jump in and see this disaster for yourself? Well, I don't know about you guys, but I've never touched this accursed box. That is until today. 
Yep, I dirtied my hands with this abomination to finally figure out exactly what was done wrong here and what, if anything, could have been done to save it. And for those of you looking to save a bit of watch time, I will not be taking on the entire internet and singing this remaster's praises. This collection is exactly as bad as you've heard. The goal today is just to explain exactly why that is and, hell, maybe figure out what led to all this madness. So strap in, SH fans, and make sure to keep an eye on the newcomers. This is going to be an incredibly bumpy ride. So, last chance to chicken out. No? All right, everybody. Welcome to Silent Hill. Ah, Silent Hill, a series that started a bit of a revolution. It led the way for games that were looking to deliver a more visceral horror experience. Yeah, for a while, Silent Hill was a trusted name that assured a certain quality of design, but nothing lasts forever, and sadly, after SH4, Konami saw fit to break the band up. Team Silent, the group of misfits that had issues following orders and shared a creative vision of how horror games should work, were no more, and the Big K wanted other developers to get a shot at the franchise. And regardless of how you feel about that decision, the fact of the matter is, core fans of the original games felt cheated. The series and sometimes characters that they loved were being used in ways the original creators would have never stood for. Of course, it turned out there would be no shiny new graphics, as this was more of a remaster than an HD collection, which brought up a few issues. Sure, a 16x9 aspect ratio and a higher operating resolution were nothing to sneeze at, but a lot of us were already experiencing these modern comforts with the PC versions of 2 and 3. You know, the versions that were already capable of all these things. And that wasn't even the worst issue. This so-called collection wasn't anywhere near complete. Only Silent Hills 2 and 3 would be included, and if the goal was to make money off of series nostalgia, why not include the game that started it all? Well, the answer to that was pretty obvious on its face. They would have had to have remade the original PS1 game if they wanted it to share the same HD look as the other two, which was understandable, but still a bitter pill to swallow. And then they would go on to contradict even this idea by not including the other PS2 release in the series, Silent Hill 4. So no matter how you look at it, fans were getting screwed one way or another. And all of this was just some of the drama that went down before the game hit shelves. The real chaos that is this game's existence wouldn't be clear until it was spinning in 360s and PS3s around the world. And from here, I want to lay out some ground rules. First off, we will absolutely be comparing these so-called remasters to the source material. I know some people would want these games judged based on their own performance, even though they would fail that metric too, but these are adaptations, so we're going to treat them like any other port of a beloved franchise here on Avalanche Reviews, and that means scrutinizing the absolute shit out of them. Second, the footage will be coming from the PS3 version of the games with no patches applied. Now, I know there were some issues fixed with a patch eventually, but most people who played these games had to play them for months and months in this state. And my goal here is to analyze the product of their work and not their last minute rushed patch job. And with that out of the way, <sighs> all right, let's dive in. Torn flesh, smashed bones, spattered blood. First and foremost, we have to deal with the presentation side of things. Now, I know what you're thinking. What could be wrong with the graphics? Isn't this just the original games but up -resed? And in a perfect world, that's exactly what it would be. But we're not living in that world. We're living in a world where Konami would give the go-ahead to start an HD remaster project after they had lost the source code to the games being remastered. And a company with zero knowledge of breaking down and recreating a game in higher resolutions would sign up to be the ones to do it. So what we ended up with was a plethora of inaccuracies and differences all piled on top of a solid core of graphical nonsense. Now those of you who watched my video on Silent Hill 2 will know Team Silent worked very, very hard on a real-time lighting engine. In fact, I'd say it was one of the best looking features of the game, second only to the drop-dead gorgeous cutscenes a subject we will definitely be talking about shortly. But as you know, the way the real-time lighting was implemented turned into a real source of frustration when porting SH2 to other platforms, mostly because it was achieved by utilizing the PS2's hardware in very interesting and mostly out-of-spec ways, ways that wouldn't translate to other tech very easily. So, how did Hijinx handle this very delicate and technically involving process? Well, that's easy. They broke the absolute hell out of it. 
See here in this cutscene, the shadows cast by the bars cut off at the top, and at another area in the Woodside Apartments, you can see the dark clearing out like a fog of war in an RTS game. But I think we both know those aren't the only examples to talk about. Shadows are totally broken across the board, as seen here where some seriously messed up stuff is going on with these shelves. It's clear that zero amounts of time went into bug testing this problem since the example with the bars is in the first 20 minutes of the game. Playtesters had to have seen this issue, which wouldn't be the only problem so early in the game. Silent Hill 2 also suffers from a real odd issue with its pillar boxing. Now, I know some people think the pillar boxes should be there and others think it looks better without them. And to be honest, I'm not quite sure what side of that conflict I'm on, but I am sure Hijink should have definitely picked one because they come and go, sometimes even within the same scene. Make sure to keep your eyes on the black bars on the top and bottom of the screen and witness as the game decides to ditch and bring them back over and over again. Once again, this shows the exact level of care put into these remasters. This cutscene is in the first 10 minutes of gameplay. Either this means no one noticed the obvious issue here, or they didn't find it important enough to fix. And to be completely honest, both options are equally damning since project lead Tom Hewlett claims he petitioned Konami for this idea on the grounds of him being a Silent Hill superfan. And you know how I can prove that's not the case? Silent Hill's fog, the one thing that defines the series, the one thing that must be done right, is an absolute mess in this collection. With both games, the fog is much lighter and less thick than the originals, sometimes not showing up at all. Hell, there are points where it's so thin that you're able to see things you weren't meant to, like here in this cutscene where you can actually see the boundaries of the map and where they terminate into nothing. Of course, if you're not mega familiar with the originals, you might not notice some of this, but I'm confident you'll notice the hard line that is the fog's boundaries. I mean, look at this, it's so poorly done you can actually see the line where the fog is drawn in. I probably shouldn't have to mention this, but this is not how it looks in the originals. I would also sometimes get an issue where fog would interact with other stuff in the background creating this big bright ball of white light. And sadly this level of incompetence was not limited to Silent Hill 2 by a long shot. Yes, the very best game in the series, in my opinion, got the same lazy destructive treatment as part 2. The first thing I was really able to notice in Heather's little romp through self-realization are the incredibly hard edges found on shadows. This tells me they didn't just scale up the original lighting effects since here in the original we can see that shadows have had their edges softened, which makes them look more real and convincing compared to the razor sharp edges on the HD collection. And getting back to the fog again, all of it is missing from this intro scene. Now what possible reason could there have been to not include such a key aspect of this game's visual style? Well, other than laziness of course. And moving back to Silent Hill 2, we have to get into the absolute terrible job these guys did with that game's biggest selling point. Back in the day, these 60 feel per second cutscenes were the talk of the industry, and for good reason. Their smooth, fluid motion and incredibly detailed look are still impressive today, but sadly that is not the case with the remaster. For some reason, instead of grabbing the PS2 originals and working some up conversion slash progressive scan magic on them, Hijinx just snagged the 30 frame per second highly compressed cutscenes from the Xbox version of the game and proceeded to shit all over them. In order to get these CGs running at a faux 60 frames per second, these absolute monsters added interpolated frames in between each real frame of video. And what I mean by that is every other frame is a composite of the previous and next frame blurred together. This leads to a blurry overall look and an insane amount of ghosting. Which is the craziest part of all this because these fools went through all of this effort to get 60 FPS versions of these cutscenes working instead of just ripping the gorgeous PS2 originals that already ran at that frame rate. Sure, 60 interlaced fields per second is not the same as 60 progressive scan frames per second, but are you telling me my $300 frame meister can deinterlace and upconvert these videos just fine, but the hundreds of thousands of dollars of equipment at Hijinx's disposal can't? Without a doubt, this is the most confusing and infuriating aspect we've covered so far, and fair warning, it's only going to get worse from here. It's also worth noting there's no longer an option to turn on sharp display mode in part 3, but the game's so sharp there's really no need for it anymore. And this is where, in the name of fairness, I do have to give some compliments. So let's hurry up and get this over with. Both games actually look quite good given the HD treatment, or at least they do in some select scenarios. Some of you may have noticed that I'm actually playing part 2 with the static filter on, and that's because it looks really, really good. My main issue with the original game's static was the individual grains were too large and it obscured how great the game could look normally, but the implementation here is damn near perfect. 
Looking at the options side by side, and trust me it does hurt to say this, the HD collection takes the win here. And in another odd victory, Hijinx replaced the lossy pre-rendered cutscene at the start of Silent Hill 3 with actual in-game graphics. Now I know it doesn't sound like a big deal, but this video always stood out since it was the only one in the game that was pre-rendered and it was done so at a very high compression rate, so it didn't look very good. This is pretty out of character for Team Hijinx as their modus operandi so far has been to do the least amount of work humanly possible, but they actually had to grab the scenes present in this pre-render from the in-game cutscenes, which is probably the most amount of effort I've seen in this remaster so far. Not that it's very much, mind you. Also of note are some 2D assets that seem to have either been redrawn or replaced with higher res originals. Now it's worth saying that not everything got this treatment, but some things like text and maps look really good. Now I would have of course preferred sharper, more pixelated text like that found in the original when upscaled, but the softer font used here does fit the quote unquote HD look pretty well if I'm being honest. And I know I already talked about it, but SH3 is amazingly sharp in this collection. During cutscenes, it's easy to just sit back and marvel at how good it looks. But all of that sharpness does come at a price we'll talk about a bit later. Okay, so there are a few compliments worth giving out here, but overall this HD remaster is an absolute mess graphically speaking. I wish it were just inaccuracies, because then I could admit that the fanboy in me resents the collection, but newcomers could play this version of the games and get a good approximation of what the originals were like. As we've seen though, it's not just inaccurate. These remasters break things that worked perfectly before, and manage to ruin the look of the originals instead of improving it. And on top of that, the bastards had the gall to replace the font and design with Comic Sans. Someone start a petition immediately. Actually, I don't really care about that as much as everybody else seems to. Yeah, it's kind of funny, but I don't know why everybody lost their mind over this. From the very start, it's clear that Tom Hewlett and his team had absolutely no idea what the hell they were doing. I mean, why did they work with unfinished PS2 code instead of looking to the PC versions both games already had? These ports could already hit HD resolutions, and it couldn't have been too hard to reverse engineer them. Well, I think we all know the answer to that question, but there's still a query that needs attention. Speaking purely from a graphical standpoint, should someone new to the series and looking to experience these games in a more modern HD light play the HD collection? And the answer is a very firm no. Not only do these games look worse than the originals, but they do so unnecessarily. HD versions of these games are already available on PC, and even the integrated graphics baked into my $70 Ryzen 2200G can handle them at 1080p. So no matter what you're rocking, it is almost assured you can play these games at a much higher level of fidelity than what's on offer here. So I'd say it's only fitting for you to avoid this collection with the same creative zeal and energy Team Hijinks puts into avoiding doing real work. So, the hotel was your special place, huh? I'll bet it was. Okay, so the graphics here are terrible, that's unquestionable, but a bad looking game isn't the end of the world as long as it plays well, so I'm sure all of the lazy and poor decisions that went into uprising the graphics didn't bleed over into gameplay, right? I mean, the game was already programmed and gameplay already existed, so all that's left is just to copy it over. There's absolutely no way they could have fucked up the gameplay, right? Well, the good news, or the bad news, depending on how you look at it, is the gameplay issues are spread pretty evenly across both of these games, but oddly enough, each game is broken in its own unique and interesting way. Starting off with 3, we see giant, and I mean giant dips, from a max of 60 frames per second to what feels like lower than 20. Now, this might not have been so noticeable if the game was locked at 30 FPS, and believe me, the last thing I want is a game running at a slower frame rate but when you drop 40 frames, it's much more of an issue than if you had only dropped 10. And when frames start dropping, prepare for slow motion. Something I wish was a joke, but sadly is not. You'll find it does it at the most inconceivable times. Like here in this hallway, I was getting a lot of slowdown when these closers were on screen, but after I pass them, it gets even slower somehow. You've probably also noticed that there are random hangs where the game will freeze for just a split second. This actually happens a lot more the further into the game you get, and it never stops being annoying. Even here in an empty hallway with no 3D models on screen other than Heather, there are freezes, slowdowns, and some really odd looking ghosting. Here in the subway, it seems the actual environment is causing both slowdown and ghosting, as you can see when I move the camera around. Now, the slowdown aside from being absolutely ridiculous for a PS2 game running on a PS3, 
is a complete mystery. Sure, when resources get a little tight, some slowdown is gonna happen, but there's no reason at all it should be causing ghosting, especially during a cutscene where only one character is on screen at a time. I can't for the life of me think of a situation where these two issues went hand in hand, but hey, don't you worry, the poor programming didn't forget to bless Silent Hill 2 with damn near game-breaking issues as well. And sure, a slowdown is an issue here as well, but for some reason it's not quite as bad as we saw with Part 3. Instead of slowdown making the game hard to play though, it's a long, pointless fade to and from black that takes place anytime a cutscene is triggered, you look at your map or go to your inventory screen. An issue that was kind of present in the original, but the length has easily been doubled in the HD collection. Thanks to this, some cutscenes in the game are completely missing as they start and stop all on the amount of time it takes for the game to display graphics again. The biggest contender being the Pyramid Head introduction. This is a pivotal scene that represents Team Silent's theme of sex and death throughout the game, but a large portion of context is missing here as it takes so long to actually be able to see it. Now, of course, every black cloud has its silver lining, and for both of these games, I'm sure series vets will be able to appreciate the much shorter load times. Some doors in SH3 can take a little bit to load to the next room on real hardware, but the HD collection makes this a nearly instant process. Then again, this is often undone with long fades to black and terrible slowdowns, so it kind of evens out, honestly. Regardless of which game you decide to play, the Silent Hill HD collection will serve as the absolute worst way to experience that game. I honestly had to force myself to play through these piles of trash, and that's really saying something. Both Silent Hills 2 and 3 are some of my absolute favorite video games of all time, and yet I kept making excuses not to play them. For example, I'm writing this sentence right now because I got to the subway station in SH3, saved the game, and decided starting a Word document would be a more entertaining use of my time. Listen, if the graphical screw-ups weren't enough to scare you away from this collection, I honestly hope the gameplay issues will, because I really do want you guys to play these games, but Without a doubt, this bastardized remaster is not the way you want to do that. More than an HD collection, this game serves as a physical representation of what happens when a company lacking oversight teams up with a man with the world's largest ego. Well, so far we've covered the objective stuff. Problems with gameplay, graphical shortcomings, and all manner of glitches, but Here's where we get subjective, and by subjective I mean personal. If you've watched the rest of my Silent Hill retrospective, you'll know these games really do mean something to me, especially Silent Hill 3. These characters, the world they live in, and the trials they go through are all very much a part of me, and I don't have a problem admitting this is when I get pissed. See, Tom Hewlett had a few other plans when pitching this HD remaster project to Konami. He wanted to hire all new voice actors and pen an entirely new script for them to read. Of course, re-rendering cutscenes with new lip-syncing would have been impossible without the game's source code and some people who knew what they were doing. Two things sorely lacking on this project. So he decided to settle for replacing the voice actors of two games that were world-renowned for having an amazing voice cast. Now, I'll be the first to admit they didn't skimp on the VA budget. The voice of Joel from The Last of Us and all-around stud Troy Baker is here to voice James. I'm looking for Mary. Have you seen her? and Mary Elizabeth McGlenn, the absolute talent behind Major Kusanagi in the best anime ever aired on TV, Ghost in the Shell standalone complex signed on as well. Guys, there's no getting around it, these are top tier voice actors. They played some amazing roles and I am without a doubt a fan of their work. That being said, they absolutely butchered this game. But before I go off on a tangent, let's talk about all the reasons they were needed at all. As the HD collection started to get press, James Sunderland's original voice actor, Guy Seehe, contacted Konami looking for money he believed he was owed. See, Konami only ever paid him for his initial work on the PS2 version of SH2, and this HD remaster would essentially be using his motion capture and voiceover work without compensating him. Of course, it is important to point out that residual income isn't really a thing in video game voice acting traditionally, but legally speaking, there is a precedent for it. Now, Konami does claim Guy signed a contract allowing them to do this, but Guy claims otherwise, of course. After this whole shit show hit the internet, the new voice actors went on attack, making sure everyone hated Guy for wanting to be, in my opinion, fairly compensated for his work. And what really killed it for me was how hard Mary Elizabeth McGlenn went after him. She made sure to bash him anytime she made a public appearance and a lot of the times lied about the situation. They said, he said, you owe me 10 years of royalties. I'm gonna call the other actors. They're all gonna get royalties too and we're gonna sue you, blah, blah, blah. 
I mean, this was an artist I really respected. Her voice work was incredible, and her vocal talent on Akira Yamaoka's music just can't be denied. But in this one situation, she was very clearly in the wrong and acting kind of like an ass. Well, Guy would eventually decide to allow for the use of his voice and motion capture work, and even used his pull with the fans to push Tom Hewlett into allowing for players to have the option for new and old voices. Sadly, Silent Hill 3 did not have such a happy ending. For some reason still unknown, Part 3 would only have the new voice cast as an option, and, well, it's about time we get into that. You gonna be okay alone? I'm not a child, you know. I'm gonna make a bold statement here. These very talented and impressive voice actors flat out suck in this game. Now, I know what you're thinking, and yes, this is the opinion of a biased fanboy, but I do have some more objective evidence to back these claims up based on my experience sharpening my vocal chops here on YouTube and in recording slash performing music live. So why not start out with the needless and ridiculous amount of reverb applied to every single spoken word in both of these games? I just prick myself. Are you okay? Yeah. Now, I'm no audio engineer, but reverb like this is only supposed to be used to simulate an environment that could cause such an echo, but I doubt very much an open graveyard filled with fog would cause a lot of natural reverb. Excuse me, I... Oh, I... I'm sorry. I... I was just... No, it's okay. I didn't mean to... Here in this tall, echoey entryway to the mall, reverb is totally acceptable and even expected. This open-air alleyway? Well, not so much. Another issue I had was the way voices are dropped into a scene with no effort to blend them. Now, this was a problem I struggled with for a while. Something just sounded off and I had no idea how to describe it. But I think I've come up with something. Here, listen to this clip and try to pay attention to how well the voices blend in with the scene and the environment around them. I'm on your side. So you say. But how do I know you're not with her? Her? You mean Claudia? Please don't lump me together with her. She was totally brainwashed by that crazy old hag. Now the same exact clip, but with the new voice actors and recording. So you say, but how do I know you're not with her? Her? You mean Claudia? Please don't lump me together with her. She was brainwashed by that crazy old hag. See how the voices sound like they've been layered over the clip? It's almost like the original voices are actually coming out of the characters' mouths, but the new ones are just somewhere in the sound field. There's never a difference in volume when characters are further or closer to the camera either, and you're never really spatially aware of who's saying what. I'm sure this has to do with bad mixing, but it's almost like they layered the voices on top of every other sound, and it leads to what I can only describe as an old kung fu movie dubbed in English. What do you want? Is that one-eyed bastard here? Who the hell are you? You dare call our boss that? Compounding this issue is the terrible lip syncing you're gonna find. James. <laughs> Wait a minute. Kinda tired. Now, obviously these new actors aren't going to be able to perfectly replicate the original pace and delivery of the old voices, so this was necessarily going to happen. But someone far more petty than I might point out this would be a very obvious argument against re-recording the voices in the first place. Now, sticking more in the realm of the objective, some of the voice actors were poorly cast regardless of their talent. Laura's voice makes it very, very painfully obvious we're listening to a woman in her late 30s act like a child compared to the actual child who voiced Laura in the original. What is it? A letter from Mary. What? I want to go get it. Is that okay? Yes. And sadly, the same issue repeats itself with Heather. In the original, Heather sounded like a teenager. In the HD collection, she sounds like a grown woman trying to sound like a teenager and failing horribly. A detective? Really? Well, nice talking to you. For some reason, Troy Baker saw fit to drop into a deep, breathy low register plagued with awful sounding vibrato, and regardless of whether or not you like the way this sounds, it clearly doesn't fit James's look or build. You can't open it? Yeah. Maria, give me a hand here. Come on. I almost feel like this was intentional since Mary Elizabeth has a naturally low voice and maybe she wanted a consistent sound to the two main characters. Who knows, honestly. All I know is these new voice actors, with almost no exceptions, do not fit the established characters they're coming out of. And yeah, if you haven't noticed, we have just crossed over into the realm of subjective fanboy anger. 
Aside from these voices not fitting their characters, they change the overall mood of the game. And I know that sounds dumb, but think about it. These voices were a pivotal aspect of the game's development. They were recorded after physically acting these scenes out for motion capture. They fit perfectly with the actions on screen because the same people perform those actions. No matter how talented the new cast is, they could never be as convincing given the circumstances. On top of this, these new guys sometimes deliver lines with totally new emotions, which really clashes with the feel of some scenes. If I knew that, I wouldn't be so confused, would I? If I knew that, I wouldn't be so confused, would I? There's also a few small rewrites, and for the life of me, I can't imagine why Tom Hewlett would do this. I mean, here's a guy who claims to be the ultimate SH fan, thinking the series needs to be perfected, and by him no less. Very rarely does the guy cleaning paintings at a museum hold himself in as high regard as the original artist who made the works he's in charge of dusting off every night. And all of this isn't taken into account the nearly infinite amount of audio glitches, misplaced pieces of music, altered sound effects, and whatever the hell this is. Listen, I know Tom Hewlett got a lot of hate for what he's done to this series, and while I don't like the idea of people getting harassed, it's not exactly hard to see why that happened. He came to Konami with the idea of a remaster, but what he really wanted was a remake, and luckily the entire world laughed in his face as he failed to competently run a much smaller affair. The fact of the matter is, the HD collection is more than just a failed remaster. It's a slap in the face of every Silent Hill fan. Not only is every aspect of these ports better represented than PC versions of these games, but more accurately as well. Sure, there are some things that didn't successfully make the jump from PS2 to PC, but after what I played today, these may as well be perfect recreations carved in solid gold by comparison. No matter what you do or what your experience with the series is, please stay away from this collection. It is a work of pure hubris and incompetence. Not only does it sully what used to be a respected name in gaming, but also makes these games harder to pass on to future generations. I mean, think about it. Imagine your first time with a series was an experience not only marred with slowdown and weak voice acting, but design decisions and glitches so bad they can lock your console and corrupt your save data. Now, does that sound like a series of games that you're interested in further pursuing? Of course not. The Silent Hill HD collection has likely scared off more people from the series than antiquated controls and a dead genre ever will. So if you're looking to see me burn this game alive, well, here it is. This is an offensive piece of garbage that has no right having the word Silent Hill printed on its cover. A disc that would be better served acting as the lining of my cat's litter box than spinning in one of my consoles. And more than that, this was a terrible waste of what could have been an amazing event in video games. Something that could have brought back the survival horror genre. And I sincerely hope everyone involved in making it never find work in this industry again. May the Silent Hill HD collection go down in history as the worst Konami game ever made. They're huge. Will you stop? Oh, God damn it. Well, guys, I gotta say, it's good to see you all again, but I kind of thought we were finished here. Heather's little tale of self-discovery is over with, and the demon god she carried inside of her now only exists on the pages of a certain secret cult's holy scripture, so... I'm left wondering what exactly has brought us together again. I could have swore we put an end to all these odd events, but even now, I can't help but feel like there's just one more story stuck here within the walls of some crumbling building. One more series of events we're meant to see, so I guess we better see this thing through to the end. And with that in mind, you guys better strap in. This is going to be one very weird trip. Oh, and for the newcomers, welcome to Silent Hill. Silent Hill 4 The Room is a very divisive title in the Silent Hill series, and if you ask me, there are a few very good reasons for that. First and foremost is the fact that it was never meant to be a Silent Hill game at all, and I know just the mere mention of that has some of you furiously typing the comment section, but after an insane amount of time spent researching this game, trust me, it's not just a fan theory. According to both members of Team Silent and the team that developed The Room, this is most certainly the case, and I'm sure you've noticed that I differentiated Team Silent from the team that made this game, and that's because most of the people involved in this game's creation were only tacitly involved with Team Silent. Oftentimes, The Room is described as being made by Team Silent's B Team, a group of background artists, font designers, and people who organize data onto game discs. 
but if you ask me, Team Silent is the sum of its whole and not something that can be broken down into one or two key members. The room's director, Sugeru Murakoshi, while contributing to Silent Hill 2 as a scenario writer, never had any input on series canon, and while Akira Yamaoka's music in the series is now and forever will be absolutely incredible, he's never contributed to any original Silent Hill story. To further add weight to this, 4 was in development during SH3's production, so the core of Team Silence simply couldn't have been involved. I mean, sure, technically the guy grabbing everyone's coffee in the office was a contributing member of Team Silent, but I doubt very much his involvement made or broke the series. So no, The Room was not made by Team Silent, despite the fact that nearly 30% of them were present. And if you disagree with that, I have some lovely swamp land to sell you here in South Florida. It's nearly 30% actual land. As for SH4's origin as a non-Silent Hill game, well, that's another hotly contested idea, and for the life of me, I cannot understand why. I mean, the game's producer said in an interview with Games World, well, keep in mind, SH4 was not originally supposed to be a Silent Hill game. And then there's 4's art director, Masashi Subayama, responding to Eurogamer, confirming that the game didn't start off as a Silent Hill game, and then further specifying the game started its life as Room 302 and existed outside of Silent Hill, only to be rolled into the series later. And I know what you're thinking, well, Jared, that's only two of the key members of the game's development staff and core members of Team Silent. That's not enough proof for me. Well, then there's Akira Yamaoka, who seems to be rationalizing the reason for the room's inclusion into SH right there on the spot during an interview. Now, I know some of you guys will be able to find quotes stating the contrary, but you gotta ask yourself, why would nearly the entire team behind this game say it was never meant to be a Silent Hill title? I mean, think about it, they gain nothing from saying this, while Konami, on the other hand, stands to lose a good chunk of invested money in the project if it's not carrying a very famous name, maybe Silent Hill, for instance. Hopefully, I've illuminated the subject for a lot of you, and if you remain unconvinced, well, let's face it, I never really had a chance of changing your mind anyways, but I do appreciate you hearing me out. So with all the controversial stuff out of the way, let's get to the other controversial stuff I will definitely be saying in this review. I think I'm gonna puke. <sighs> the room starts off with our main character, Henry Townsend, just a normal guy living in an everyday normal apartment with the exception of the fact that he is physically unable to leave said apartment and has been suffering from bad dreams for the last week or so, which, on a personal note, I always thought was kind of funny. The game sort of gives more prominence to the bad dreams at first instead of the infinitely worse issue of the assortment of chains on his front door keeping him from leaving. He's all like, damn, it kind of sucks being stuck in what seems like a pocket universe that keeps me from breaking free from my apartment, but yo, these nightmares are something else. Anyways, Henry's handling the whole situation impressively well when a hole suddenly opens up in his bathroom, and after deciding to crawl through it, which is what you do, he wakes up in a subway station and meets with what I can only describe as a woman of ill repute. I'm kinda scared all alone. I'll do a special favor for you later. But sadly, the friendship is short-lived. After finding her bloody body with numbers carved into her chest, our boy wakes up in his bed and notices that emergency workers are pulling a body out of the same subway station and describing the numbers carved into her. Hurry up and get that ambulance! Quit yapping and move her already! Damn, she's got numbers carved into her chest. I wonder if... And sadly, here's where we have to cut it for you newcomers. Thanks to the confusing and tangled nature of this story, much of its appeal comes from uncovering it yourself, so you guys know the deal. Skip to the time on screen or the link in the description to make sure I don't spoil anything for you. Alright, so with that out of the way, throughout the story, roughly the same exact situations keep playing themselves out, with Henry running into future murder victims Finally, it's gonna happen. and almost always failing to save them. And in between all this, we're able to find little notes and diary entries in the apartment. These plot-driving sticky notes will make almost no sense to anyone up until the very end of the game, which I guess I can appreciate on some level, but it seems a bit odd to make so much of the exposition read like utter nonsense until someone's second playthrough. And to be honest, even after the game's ending, there's a good chance you'll still be in the dark with a lot of stuff, as this is one of the most confusing and poorly told stories I've seen in a video game so far. And I know some of you are just ready to pounce in the comments section, so I do have to clarify that the general story beats are pretty straightforward. An orphan raised by Silent Hill's own demon-worshipping cult 
is led to believe he will be united with his absentee mother if he completes what's called the 21 Sacraments, which is essentially a religious murder spree where each victim is chosen for a very specific reason and killed in a very specific way. Henry later finds that his involvement in all this is because he's supposed to be the final victim. And on its face, that's a pretty simple story, but it's all the specifics that have been so hard to nail down. Walter being a serial killer isn't too hard to wrap your head around, but him being a dead body that kills people in their dreams kind of throws a monkey wrench in the whole ordeal. Oh, and of course then there's the fact that there are two Walters, one dream adult form and one child form intent on stopping the other him. Plus there's the implication that all of this is a lie and is actually necessary for the cult's god to return to Earth, which kind of clashes with everything we've been told so far. Wasn't this cult already engaged in the whole Alessa business at this point? And if not, there wouldn't be much of a cult left after their entire leadership structure was taken out by Harry and Heather. I mean, think about it. These people have seen a failed writer and a teenage mall rat both kill the earthly embodiment of their god two times at this point. I doubt very much membership numbers are at an all-time high. And I also have an issue with the way all of this is delivered. Instead of exploring the town of Silent Hill and discovering files and records of the cult's actions for yourself, Notes and records, some of which left by a child, are literally delivered to your doorstep and none of it's going to make any sense until some of the final moments of the game. Now, I know saving all your info for a late game revelation can be cool as hell, but you're going to have to open your scrapbook and look back at an entire game's worth of exposition, some of which is cut off and purposely cryptic. And I just know someone is ready to scream about other Silent Hill games slowly unfolding their stories in a similar way, but in those games, the full story would need to be uncovered through the direct actions of the player and not hand-delivered at set points in the game. Plus, there's the simple fact that this story is just a little too fantastical for my taste. Now, I will admit the first hour or so did a great job at setting up a good mystery, but after it starts introducing wormholes that lead to dream worlds where you die in the real world, it gets a little hard to suspend my disbelief. And here's a perfect example. What part of Silent Hill is supposed to house this huge towering orphanage? According to the lore of the game, this orphanage does exist in Silent Hill, but does it only exist in the dream world? Because otherwise, I think we would have noticed the thing that spirals into the clouds. And if so, how the hell are they getting kids in there? The entire game is full of odd stuff like this, and to my knowledge, most of it is never addressed. Another main issue which keeps me from caring is the flat-out lifeless nature of the main character. This guy says something like 20 words the entire game and rarely displays anything coming close to real human emotion as he reacts to the supernatural things happening to and around him, which is really surprising given the previous game's talent for having some of the best voice acting out there. It looks like my apartment. What the hell is this? Even now, after doing research into the ending, I'm not sure I understand it all, and to be completely honest, I'm not exactly thrilled with the idea of playing the game again just to fix that. Now, I know I already ranted about how this game is not truly a Silent Hill game in the sense that it started its life as something else, but really my main evidence to this effect is its story. It's so very clearly nothing like the other games in the series, and sure, maybe some people like that, but think about it. Take the cult out and omit one cameo from James Sunderland's father and you have absolutely no ties to anything Silent Hill related. The town itself is not the source of what's happening here since Walter's body is dead as a doornail and safely located the next town over. And forgive me for expecting a little too much, but I feel like the sequel to a very famous series should at the very least include elements from that series. Okay, look guys, I know I can be a bit of a stickler for SH canon, but this just does not feel like the type of story Team Silent wanted to tell. And no, having cryptic exposition and an overarching mystery is not all that's required. If that was the case, Metal Gear Solid 2 would be king of the Silent Hill games. Raiden, turn the game console off right now. What did you say? So let's get down to business. No more analysis. Is the room's story good? In my opinion, no. It suffers from way too many open-ended questions that never get answered, and the subject matter is either too based in reality for how fantasy it is or vice versa. And like I said before, it just does not feel like a Silent Hill story. So I've got to give this one a pretty big thumbs down. But that being said, I know that I went into this with a lot of expectations and even more of a bias, so naturally, I don't think that means this is an objectively bad story. It just doesn't strike any of the right chords with me. I've heard from several people that this is their favorite story in the series, so take everything I've said here with a giant grain of salt. 
Sure, I may be a fanboy, but maybe I'm not the right kind of fanboy to be covering this game. Regardless, for me this game just does not live up to the stellar narrative set up by the previous games. Without a bit of crowdsourcing, I doubt very much you'll have all the info you need to figure this one out, even after multiple playthroughs, and if that sounds like a good time to you, well, more power to you. If you ask me though, I'd say most new SH fans would not be missing out on much if they gave this game a pass. Okay, so we've established that the room doesn't exactly tell what I would call a Silent Hill tale, and sadly the gameplay isn't going to be doing a lot to win over hardcore SH fans either. Now I don't want to mince words here, I find Silent Hill 4 to be a pretty hard game to get into, and none of that has to do with it breaking with a lot of Silent Hill tradition, so let's split this up into two parts. First up, let's talk about everything this game has done to separate itself from the series it shares a name with and then we'll go over some of the things wrong with it in a more traditional video game kind of way. And without a doubt, no conversation about the room is complete without talking about the titular domicile. Since Henry can't leave his apartment, it becomes a major hub for everything that happens in the game. This is the only place where you can save at, it houses storage for excess inventory, and just being there heals you. Now on its face, there's nothing wrong with this gameplay concept, but having a small central hub that the player must return to just to perform menial tasks that used to be a button press away is getting pretty far away from the original vision for the series. Hell, if anything, this seems to echo more of a modern 2019 gaming trend than anything. And then there's the other aspect of it that shies away from series doctrine, that's the perspective you take on while you're in the room. In the outside segments, you see things in the familiar third-person style, but moving into the apartment sees Henry navigating in first-person. Now, before you start typing, yes, I am 100% aware that this was an intentional move to get the player to feel more like they're actually there. But aside from this making simple tasks just a bit more complicated to complete, it also messes with immersion. Transitioning from first to third-person several times in a few hours just kind of takes me out of the experience and reminds me I'm playing a video game. And since we're on the subject, the same thing could be said about the combat. Of course, on the surface, it would seem like this might be the most Silent Hill part of the game. I mean, you hold R to ready a weapon and the action button to use it, but where things get different is what happens after that shoulder button gets pressed. A little charge meter appears on the screen along with your life bar and just copy-paste my earlier complaints here. I don't know why, but this might be the biggest betrayal for me. In fact, when I first played the game, it was the PC version, and I wasn't more than 30 minutes into it before I put it down because of how, for lack of a better word, gamey it felt having these meters on screen. Now there is an option to auto-hide these things, but sadly, it only hides them during normal gameplay. Readying a weapon or taking damage will see them rearing their ugly heads, and I just do not like them. Staying with the combat, I actually do like how much more fluid swinging melee weapons feels in comparison to the other games, and the charge attack does feel kind of cool to pull off, but the added mobility while in the ready state is kind of off-putting. Once you hold that shoulder button, you get locked into a direction, and the game takes over with aiming. When fighting one enemy, this works perfectly, but oftentimes in a group, you'll miss an attack because just as you press the button, the game decides the dog you've been pummeling is less of a threat now and some off-screen asshole is more deserving of your attention. On the positive side, I actually like the dodge move you can pull off by pressing the run button, but with that added mobility, well, this can happen. And to be completely honest, I'm not really sure whether or not this is a good or bad thing. I guess just decide on your own for this one. Another one of my issues crops up with this on-screen inventory. Sure, you might not like the typical Silent Hill inventory system, but like any good survival horror clone, this is a place where you can go to collect your thoughts and select from your assortment of killing implements. The room instead uses a real-time approach, which will have you cycling through your items trying desperately to find that one health kit as an enemy continues to rain down blow after blow. Now, you could definitely make the argument that this makes the game more engaging from an action-packed point of view, but I think that kind of clashes with the more traditional survival horror type setup. Like I said what seems like an eternity ago on my video on Resident Evil 3, while I absolutely love the survival horror style of gameplay, it just isn't suited to a fast-paced twitch reaction environment. And speaking of enemies raining down blows, it seems like their attack frequency could stand to be tweaked just a bit. In previous games, the enemy might hit you with an attack as you're running by, but in 4, the hit stun caused by just one attack might leave you open for as many as 3 more. 
And even more of an issue for me is the fact that your inventory is now limited, which means you will not be stockpiling ammo and healing items like you're used to. Of course, this was an intentional decision likely made to play into the action focus I was just talking about, and you can apply my previous complaints here as well. Having to stop what you're doing and trek back to your apartment because you've been playing the game too well and have no more room for key items just does not jive well with the established style of the series. But not to harp on about the inventory system too much, the camera also fails to live up to SH Doctrine, and in the oddest way imaginable. In the earlier games, the left trigger would recenter the camera behind the player's back, which is exactly how it is in 4, but instead of the camera actually traveling into position, it snaps behind Henry with no transition whatsoever. This is such a jarring change that it wasn't uncommon for me to get disoriented and lose my way in even the most simple of environments. I honestly can't believe such a glaring flaw wasn't picked up during playtesting, leaving me to believe it was intentional. And here's where we transition out of the Silent Hillness of the game, man if that wasn't a word before it sure as hell is now, and move on to the more broad concept of good gameplay practices. One thing I think is sorely lacking in the room. Like I touched on before, the constant trekking from your current area to the apartment can get tedious, especially when you factor in that it will often be healing items and weapons that take up all of your inventory space. Now I know some of you are going to be wondering, what the hell are the differences between this and, say, early Resident Evil titles? Well, for one thing, Resident Evil didn't split your handgun ammo into separate 10-round stacks, further adding to the issue of the limited inventory slots, and you are crazy if you think they weren't going to do the same thing with healing items. If you're asking me, this whole inventory thing is the worst aspect of the game, but to be honest, despite how bad of an effect it had on the objective experience, subjectively, I kind of liked it. I've always been a fan of limiting the player in order to get them to play more creatively, and I think that's exactly what the devs were trying to do here. I don't think it worked exactly as planned, but I still think it's a pretty cool concept. One that needs a little more polish, but cool nonetheless. On a related note, the constant transitioning between the dream world and Henry's apartment starts to grate on you almost immediately. Here, let me explain the process step by step. Let's say you either don't have a necessary item on you, or you need to get rid of a few 10 round stacks to make room for one. First, you'll need to use a hole to travel back to your apartment. That's one loading screen, if you're near it already. Then, since it dumps you into your bedroom, you'll need to use the door. That's another loading screen. Then you can access your item storage and make your way to the bathroom. That's yet another few seconds staring at a black screen, and from there, you'll need to use the hole again, meaning this trip took us through four loading screens just to complete a very simple action. And yes, to some of you that may sound very similar to playing through a Resident Evil game with moving through different rooms and hallways, but the big difference there is you will be moving through hallways and rooms filled with enemies, and you're going to have to either engage with them or run around them, either or being a risk-reward scenario. With Silent Hill 4 The Room, you're just moving through loading screens in an area where you know enemies can't spawn in. It is incredibly tedious. And this isn't exactly something you can avoid if you know how to play the game very well. You'll likely be going through this at least once or twice per area regardless. I mean, I know they were going for a specific feel in this game and wanted gameplay to inform that feel, but why not just put the hole in Henry's living room? Then you could dump him in the main area the player would be using most, cutting down on most of the unnecessary downtime. I mean, sure, maybe you'd lose the very obvious allusions to the dream motif these guys are constantly shoving down your throat with waking up in the bed, but... On the plus side, you'll have a game that's actually fun to play. And to those of you who thought they might be able to mitigate these trips with good planning, well, the apartment also heals you. And thanks to the genre's typical lack of healing items, you can go ahead and double the amount of time you can expect to spend looking at loading screens. Which wouldn't be as much of an issue if the game's enemies didn't lock onto you with razor-sharp accuracy and never let up. The small sectioned off design of most major areas means you'll be navigating smaller rooms and hallways populated with monsters. Monsters you will likely not be killing since that requires a lot of resources. So running through becomes the only option, but taking damage while legging it is almost guaranteed. So if you don't know exactly where you're going in an area, you're going to take a lot of cheap hits, which will send you back to the apartment since you don't want to use one of your two healing items, and the vicious cycle of loading continues. In a more general sense, I had a huge gripe with interacting with things in the environment. Anytime you examine something, check a locked door, or try to pick up an item, the game's music stops, and for some reason that really bothered me. 
On the plus side, the gameplay also stops so you don't have to worry about taking damage while checking a door like you did in previous games. But there's another complaint here that brings us right back into the negative. When trying to pick up an item, use something in the environment, or climb a ladder, the game's going to ask you if you really want to do this, and that in and of itself is not an issue. It's actually pretty common for survival horror games to play this way, but the room defaults your cursor to the no option, meaning if you're trying to pick something up under stress or speed your way through a text prompt, you're accidentally going to hit no more often than not. This was a giant issue for me, even after I made myself conscious of it. I'd still be stuck picking up an item like three times, and those failed attempts really started to add up. Now, I am willing to admit this next one may be a just me kind of thing, but man, I really did not like the way Henry controls. He feels way too loose, kind of like he keeps moving a few seconds after you let go of a direction, and his run speed doesn't seem to match up with his run animation. Kind of like he's moving way too far for how slow his legs are moving, I guess. While I do like the fact that three consecutive button presses result in a nice little combo like it typically does in these games, combat always feels really janky thanks to Henry auto-targeting the wrong enemy at the wrong time. And the ability to charge up a haymaker is nice, but again, seeing this gauge on screen just takes me out of the Silent Hill frame of mind. Take this! This'll teach you the wheel! But I will say there are times when the planets are gonna align and combat will feel very good for you. You'll land a few big swings on some hideous monster and you'll really start to have fun. But a few seconds later, you're going to accidentally walk into an area with four dogs in it and die before you get to take your next three steps because they can both outrun you and attack so fast that you have no chance when fighting them in a group. Puzzles in a Silent Hill game are essential, even if it's in name only, and there are some pretty okay ones here, but they never really piqued my interest to be honest. And now we have to come to the moment a lot of you vets were expecting. The one major flaw working against the room. Doing its best Devil May Cry 4 impersonation, about halfway through the game you have to trek through every area you visited already, but this time with the added fun of a persistent escort mission. Which is exactly as fun as it sounds, and it sounds about as appealing as five nails through the neck. And if I'm being totally honest, the frustration here just is not worth it. Now, I don't think I've ever said this about a game I've covered before, but unless you are really, and I mean really invested in the story, this part is just not worth finishing. But that's not the damning criticism that it sounds like, or maybe it kind of is. Listen, I have a lot of weird thoughts to get out. Silent Hill 4 The Room is not what I would call a must play. It has a lot of issues that bring it down, and for someone not really interested in the psychological horror genre, trust me, this will not be the game that wins you over but there are some very interesting things going on. Most of my issues stem from mechanics and gameplay styles that I'm used to seeing in other, better Silent Hill games, but twisted a bit, nearly to the point of unrecognition. But all that being said, there is another way to word this. If you're a Silent Hill fan, but have found yourself growing tired of the series formula up to this point, this may be the game that brings you out of the fog, as it were. The typical approach to making an SH game has been turned on its head, and even though it's not to my taste, I imagine someone out there is bound to appreciate that. As for me, I really dig the unique take on Silent Hill. Sure, it may not have worked out from an enjoyable gameplay perspective, but these guys took a chance and tried to switch things up a bit. One part of me wants to use this as evidence that The Room was never truly meant to be a proper SH game, as it seems clear a lot of this probably already existed, and the shell of a Silent Hill game was draped over it at some point. But I think I feel some heart buried in here under all the confusing and annoying gameplay. I don't know, maybe I've gone soft in my old age, but coming back to this game after putting it down because I didn't like the fact that there was a heads-up display nearly 15 years ago really gave me a new perspective on it. Sure, it's without a doubt the least fun game we've covered in the series so far, but if there's anything running a YouTube channel has taught me, it's that I have some downright weird taste in games. So maybe there's something here for you, the passerby, wondering what all the Silent Hill fuss is about, or you, the guy who's grown tired of all the trappings from previous centuries. In my opinion, SH4 is the result of a game's concept destroying its playability, but I've talked to plenty of people who swear by the room, so I can't really slam my fist down on the table and declare it to be an objectively bad game. Besides, that's not really my style here. Either way, this is definitely not for me, but I can give credit where it's due. Silent Hill 4 is one frustrating, unpolished, confusing trip, but one that might be worth taking if you've seen or heard anything here that interests you. So I guess this game is going to get a very unsure shrug from me, which as we continue into the series is going to look like a glowing recommendation, trust me.
Well guys, I hope it's no secret that Silent Hill games have built up a bit of a reputation for wowing people with some revolutionary visuals. From the first game's incorporation of obscuring layers of fog into the game world to help free up resources for the incredibly detailed 3D model and environments, to Part 2's use of an unfeasible real-time lighting engine with true perspective correct shadow casting, and finally Part 3's jaw-dropping facial animations and fluid motion captured in-engine cutscenes. Silent Hill is about as famous for optimizing and mastering Sony's hardware as it is for creepy storytelling. So it pains me to say that Silent Hill 4 is a very middle-of-the-road, boring affair as far as visuals are concerned. Now don't get me wrong here, it's not a bad-looking game, but it just doesn't push any envelopes and even manages to ditch all the previous accomplishments in the series. All that being said, there are a few noteworthy things to talk about. It seems like textures wrapped around these 3D models are very, very high-res internally. All kinds of little details like beard stubble and freckles can be made out, which is very awesome to see in cutscenes, but sadly you'll be spending way more time actually playing the game and there's just nothing worth pointing out here. Environments are relatively okay looking and might even share the same high-res textures, but you're never really going to be close enough to tell the difference. The dreamlike nature of the game means they can design some pretty otherworldly places to explore, and in context of this game's setting, I think it works really well. In the previous games, they might have broken the more real-world look of a lot of areas, but here, it just makes sense. What absolutely doesn't make sense, however, is how bad the lighting is here. I mean, Silent Hills 2 and 3 were absolute marvels of accomplishment with their realistic lighting engines and dynamic shadows, so it's disappointing as hell to see that Henry's shadow just looks kind of blah. And even more insulting are the shadows cast by light sources in the environment. When I first started the game up, I kind of just figured the game's shadows were, I don't know, bad looking, but then I came to find out that they are almost all static 2D images placed over top of the environment, and I can prove it. Look here where the light being cast behind Henry affects the angle and length of his shadow, and now look as the same light source casts a shadow for Henry that moves in the opposite direction of the shadow cast by the objects on screen. Sometimes you'll see that a light source overhead will have your shadow relatively small and circular, but there'll be objects placed in the area with long sweeping shadows, like there was a light somewhere in the environment that was just lighting those objects. And of course, as you walk across these shadows, you'll see that you can't interact with them in any way, shape, or form, meaning that they are a layer below Henry, a 2D object placed over top of the environment. What exactly was the purpose of ditching such an incredible visual feature in this game? I have to assume 4 and 3 used the same engine, so why not benefit from the amazing work being done by Team Silent? It's almost like, and hear me out here, like this game started its life as something completely different and only became a Silent Hill game so late in development that they couldn't use assets from other games. And the list keeps getting worse. Light sources in the game do have a really cool looking bloom sort of effect, but it's too opaque looking and can even be seen through objects, so if you see a light source up ahead, it doesn't matter if there's a big fuck off tree in between you and it, you'll see the full effect of the light source straight through it. This really puzzled me. I mean, these games are world-renowned for how well they handle real-time lighting on such low-power hardware. In comparison to the previous entries, this game looks utterly flat. Now, there's a solid chance that I'm judging SH4 too harshly, and maybe I should let it stand on its own, but if that was the case, they should have never put the word Silent Hill on the box. Sticking with the theme of light, this game is very, very dark. Now don't get me wrong, I like dark environments, but it's not just a lack of light in an area. It's also that the game puts out a very dark picture on top of that, so jacking up the brightness on my frame meister even just a little bit results in a mostly gray screen instead of black. Now I'm not sure why this is the case, I mean the level design is pretty good looking, and when you happen across areas with a lot of light, you get to really see all those details and sharpness you've been missing out on. The previous games had very dark areas too, of course, but they were well lit enough that you were able to see your surroundings. In the room, it's not uncommon to miss items in an area because you just can't see them, and in a game that's already limited in how many resources they give you, that's a pretty bad move, I think. Coming back from all the negativity, I will say that some characters in the game look and animate very well. Definitely not on the same level as Silent Hill 3, but they still look great. The downside to this is it really helps highlight how poorly Henry looks and emotes. Look at how many points of articulation can be seen here in Cynthia's face, and by comparison, how little can be found in Henry's. Now, I know they were trying to make Henry a kind of introvert, but introverts have muscles in their face. They experience surprise and sometimes even open their eyes a bit. After playing through the game's intro, it seems like Henry wakes up to a supernatural apartment keeping him from leaving with the same energetic zeal on his face as a guy having Linux code explained to him by Ben Stein. Oh man. 
What a dream. Now, Henry isn't the only one suffering from facial paralysis, but he is the most surprising. I mean, wouldn't you want the guy who will be present for every piece of dialogue to look convincing, I guess? And since we're on a roll here, I really don't like how some pre-rendered cutscenes drop the frame rate to slideshow levels. Now, I know this was done to mimic Japanese ghost movies that were popular at the time, but it just looks dumb as hell to me. And you know, it just dawned on me we should probably talk about the room that's in the title of this game, which looks, I don't know, okay, I guess. For some reason, the environment here is less sharp than the Dreamworld areas, and there's a bit of screen blur when the cameras move, which can be kind of annoying. Some of the 2D textures can also stand out as kind of low res, but overall, this is yet another graphical element in the game that's just kind of boilerplate. I will say one thing that really works well is the sense of voyeurism the game gives you as you're playing. At first, I liked the ability to look out of Henry's window because it gave us a nice little look at the world around him and made the game feel more grounded. But then as you start to experience the loneliness and claustrophobia that the apartment's so good at conveying, looking out the window, through your door's peephole, or the hole that's opened up in the wall, you really start to feel like a voyeur. The feeling of being on the inside looking out is very effective, and if the rest of the game pulled off the intended message this well, the graphical blandness would be much easier to ignore. And just to clarify, I'm not saying that the game looks bad. In fact, as far as the majority of games released around this time go, the room looks pretty good. It's just that it's coming from a series with a well-deserved pedigree of impressive visuals. Maybe I'm expecting too much, but like I've said over and over again, these two games were being made at the exact same time and shared staff. There's really no reason for one to look so much better than the other, and there's even less of an excuse for the room to have such flat, lifeless lighting. I honestly just can't wrap my head around some of these design choices, and since we're harping on about bad choices, whose idea was it to have Henry voiced by a robot who's only ever heard of human emotion via punch card inputs? Honestly, it takes me out of the game every time he talks because he experiences the most earth-shattering things happening right in front of his eyes and his response is always some very low-volume, basic-ass comment. This guy reacts to seeing the corpse of murder victims with the same deadpan straight face that a normal person would wear when looking at a ham sandwich. In this scene, he's watching a woman he found in the dream world dying a brutal, bloody death right in front of him. And at the sight of her nearly dead, blood-soaked body, he has this incredible performance. Are you okay? And for some reason, he always speaks at a much lower volume than everyone else. Honestly, there are going to be times when you have issues making out what he said if you don't have subtitles turned on. And it's really disappointing since a lot of the other voice cast are giving very good performances, and here comes Henry with a quiet whisper and the most boilerplate commentary you've ever heard. Well, I'd love to shit on whoever thought hiring a person with severe social anxiety to voice a game's main character was a good idea, but you know we gotta touch on this game's ports. Both the PS2 and Xbox versions of the game launched at the same time, and just as a change of pace, we've been playing the Xbox port for a majority of the footage you've looked at so far, so why not take a look at how the PS2 fared? And right off the bat, there are a few noticeable pluses. First off, the picture is much brighter than what we're seeing in the Xbox version. I played both of these games with the same brightness settings on the Frame Meister, but the PS2 port seems to have much better contrast levels, so that solves one problem. Next up is the sharper looking image. Now, it's important to note that this is probably due to me using a very low quality component cable on my Xbox, or this could be a trick of the aliased effect of having less pixels on the screen. Normally, you'd expect 480p to look sharper than the 480i output that the room has on PS2, but let this be a lesson. If you don't have high quality components in your video chain, you aren't getting the best possible picture. There also seems to be less motion blur in the apartment segments, and you'd figure this would be the opposite with the amounts of deinterlacing that needs to be done here. Stepping out of the positives, the PS2 version of this game uses heavy amounts of dithering, like PS1 levels. I don't think I've ever seen this much dithering on a PlayStation 2 game before, which is really interesting. As usual, this trick is used to either improve on performance or trick the eye into seeing more color depth than is actually there, but Neither of those should be issues here on the PS2, so this is a real mystery to me. It may not be as noticeable when the screen is in motion, but if you stop and look at a particularly dark part of the screen, you're definitely going to see what I'm talking about. And I have to assume this will be a deal breaker for most people. I myself am not too bothered by heavy amounts of dithering thanks to my love for the Dreamcast RGB output, but if you aren't a fan of these little dots, I'd say the Xbox version is definitely the way to go. And normally I go in depth talking about the PC version of the game, but I ran into an issue here. The room's PC version is relatively good, all things considered. It's pretty easy to get a hold of, depending on your experience out on the high seas. It'll work with modern controllers right out of the box, and with a readily available patch, can hit resolutions at or above 1080p. 
but no matter how many times I uninstalled and reinstalled it, I ran into a bug that would crash the game the second I picked up any item in the apartment. Notes under the door, the chocolate milk in the fridge, nothing was safe to grab. Even though the presentation is expectedly the best out of the ports, I can't really recommend it. But you know that's not going to stop me from lining them all up for a quick comparison. Overall, I'd say the Xbox version is the way to go here, which hurts because I would normally recommend that you always go with the console the game was designed for, but the inclusion of heavy amounts of dithering doesn't make up for the much nicer brightness levels. Like I said before, the PC would normally have my recommendations since it's obviously the sharpest and best looking option available, but since I can only play up to the orphanage area thanks to that bug, I really can't recommend you try it out. Of course, this could be caused by any number of things, and you guys might be able to get it working with no issues at all, so I wouldn't exactly rule it out altogether, but if you're looking to play Silent Hill 4 right now with as few issues as possible, I'd say get yourself an upscaler or a high-quality CRT and snag that Xbox version. Ouch! Damn it! Well, this has certainly been a bit of an emotional roller coaster. I mean, there are a lot, and I mean a lot of negatives stacking up against this game, but for a lot of the more subjective stuff, I'm left wondering if it's my love for the real Silent Hill games that has me judging it so harshly. I honestly went into this video with an open mind, and even got excited to finally give the game the fair shake I thought it deserved, but there are some legitimate game design flaws to be found here, and no one version of the game is free from some kind of visual issues. If I had to sum up my feelings, I'd say even dropping all of my love for the previous games in the series, Silent Hill 4 The Room is the most unenjoyable gameplay experience you're going to find in the series so far. While I did find certain aspects of the combat to be fun, and the general exploration actually felt really satisfying and familiar, the on-screen heads-up display really ruined Silent Hill's trademark immersion, and the constant trekking from outside to apartment to take care of the most mundane task will grate on your nerves by the second area. I can, with no issues whatsoever, recommend that the average Silent Hill fan stay away from this one based solely on how bad they fumbled general gameplay, but that's not the totality of my thoughts. Listen, I know that there are plenty of games that someone could objectively call broken, but I love anyways, and most of the time that's due to those games having a world or story that makes me forget about all that. And while the tale here is nowhere near what I think a Silent Hill game should be capable of, I can understand that it might speak to some of you out there so I can't just damn the room outright. I honestly think there's going to be some of you that are more than willing to endorse some of these terrible gameplay ideas and god-awful voice acting from the main character in favor of the interesting world this game sets up. And to those, I say, fucking go for it. I've been on the other end of this argument way too many times before to just declare this as unplayable. But I do come into this game with tempered expectations. I will tell you up front, you are not going to find a polished experience here, regardless of how much you like the story, but if there was one person who could understand not caring as much about that, it's me. So in the end, no, this is not and never will be a Silent Hill game, and at no point was it ever in danger of being designed well, but I can admit there's a bit of charm peeking through all that. It certainly doesn't emulate the same emotions I felt in previous Silent Hill games, but it does do its own thing and I can appreciate that. Now, mind you, not enough to ever play it again, but hey, to each his own. Well guys, that'll about do it for me. If you're looking for more bad Silent Hill games, don't you worry. We have officially made it into the non-Team Silent era of SH, so expect an incoming shit show. But until then, I want to thank all of you for watching the Silent Hill Retrospective. Well guys, we have regrettably made it to what I like to call the non-Team Silent era in the Silent Hill timeline, an age that would see Konami separating the team that brought them financial success in the hopes of essentially subcontracting the series out to any dev house with an email address. And if it wasn't apparent in my voice already, I am not a huge fan of what happened next. That being said, I did endeavor to cover all of the Silent Hill games and well, I'll be damned if I'm not going to do just that. Besides, maybe I'll end up liking some of these games. Hell, I never thought I'd enjoy RE6, but being forced to play through titles I wouldn't otherwise touch has broadened my horizons somewhat. And in that vein, let's take a look at the first mobile title in the series if you don't count the GBA Play novel. Silent Hill Origins would serve as a bit of a taste test in regards to what we could expect from Konami's new practices, and, well, it didn't exactly taste good. 
So I hope you're ready for a trip back to that old rickety town in the hopes of explaining everything that led up to our first journey through the other world. Ladies, gentlemen, welcome to Silent Hill. The Silent Hill Origins development cycle was a very Capcom-esque type of debacle, and what I mean by that is it was a complete and unmitigated disaster, which you would have to assume given Konami had just franchised this series out to a studio that up to this point had developed almost no games worth talking about, with the exception of Sudeki, a game that everyone agrees existed. With Climax LA working on a game series that was pretty well based in a foreign understanding of American horror, well, you could understand why the fan base would be a smidge worried. And, well, the company didn't do much to quell those worries when early info pegged the game as a kind of dark comedy, which is insane for an infinite amount of reasons. But on the other hand, this was going to be a PSP game, and the idea of playing a cool survival horror title on the go was pretty damn attractive. Sadly, a cool idea wasn't enough to float the studio through working on hardware they weren't familiar with, and in the process, Climax LA ended up closing its doors, passing their work on to Climax's UK studio. And despite whatever gripes I may have with the finished product, I have to give props to this team for fixing the utter travesty Origins was shaping up to be. The LA Studios build of the game was an absolute joke and seemed to be trying a little too hard to be the next RE4. Uh, hold on, I'm, I'm sorry, I misspoke there. It was trying a little too hard to be RE4. The footage you're looking at now is from a preview build of the game, and trust me, it is every bit as bad as it looks. Now, it's worth saying my harsh judgments come from the perspective of someone who was expecting a Silent Hill game. As a standalone horror title, honestly, this could have been interesting. I feel like there's a real lack of third-person shooters on the console, and I'm a sucker for good horror games. But Climax wasn't looking to make a horror-based third-person shooter. They were trying to make a Silent Hill game, and it was very clear that they were failing miserably. But Climax UK took over the project and, to their credit, did a very commendable job shaping it into something much more comparable to the other games in the series. And as you know, SH games live and die by their stories, so there's no doubt these guys understood the source material, right? Lisa? Travis? Origins, as the name would suggest, serves as an origin story for all the characters and events that led up to the first Silent Hill game, and uses Travis Grady as a vehicle to tell that story. One night, Travis is driving through Silent Hill, and in a bout of, we couldn't think of a better way to start this game, so basically here's the beginning of SH1, Travis has to slam on brakes to avoid hitting an apparition of Alessa. He then for some reason gets out of his truck and chases her down, till he stumbles upon Alessa's house, which is now on fire. Now Silent Hill fans were likely very excited at the prospect of exploring events that, up until now, had only been mentioned in notes and newspaper articles, but it's very clear Climax didn't really understand Silent Hill's story quite as much as they thought, and these very first moments will do a great job at preparing you for the inaccurate fan theory level analysis you can expect going forward. So our boy Travis braves the flames and finds Alessa's charred but still living body. Now, you may have expected this to be a cathartic moment, actually being able to take part in the events that landed this girl in her magically induced coma, but right off the bat it seems like Climax is among those who believes Alessa was burned on purpose. Why did no one help? You all left that girl to burn. So we did. Which might have something to do with a file that explains these circumstances not being easily found in certain versions of the PS1 original. To give a very, very brief summary of the events, this was not a case of Dahlia burning her daughter to death on purpose because, of course it isn't. The plan was always to have Alessa get pregnant with the malevolent demon and bring him to term, physically birthing him into the world with her psychic powers, allowing that process to take place. Herein lies the mother's womb, containing the power to create life. Besides, if you'll remember, Alessa's current charred state is actually what put a damper on the process in the first place and allowed her to split her consciousness. So clearly, a blaze taking out five or six houses in the neighborhood was not on the itinerary for these people. Now, I completely understand if you don't think this is the hill I should die on, but what actually happened, and has been documented very clearly in Silent Hill 1, is the ritual to impregnate her caused Alessa to unwillingly manifest her psychic abilities, stressing an old antiquated boiler in her basement. And this can be confirmed when Silent Hill firefighters or cops cite the basement as the origin of the blaze. 
which contradicts this game's opening, seeing as how Travis rescues her from the second floor. Anyways, back to the actual game. Travis reaches down to help her, but it seems like Alessa doesn't want to be saved. On the way out, she uses her powers to help Travis, kind of running counter to her quest to be allowed to die, and for some reason uses the seal of Metatron here. Upon reaching safety, Travis falls unconscious and wakes up in the fog-ridden town, wondering what the hell happened to the girl he saved. After hoofing it to the hospital, we talk to Michael Kaufman, and it seems clear he's hiding something, because he's always hiding something. Well, upon further inspection, Travis finds the hospital to be filled with hellish creatures, including busty nurses, because of course it is. You okay? This being a Silent Hill game made by people who severely lack an understanding of the series lore and what monsters are supposed to represent. From here, we learn that Travis can actually control when he crosses into the other world, a mechanic we will definitely dive deeper into a bit later. After he searches the place, Travis falls unconscious again and wakes back up in the regular world, a theme that repeats itself throughout the entire game's runtime. The general pattern is, Travis gets an idea to go to a place, and then he gets there, searches it for more clues, fights a boss, then passes out as Alessa's projection gets near him. Wash, rinse, repeat, over and over again. Of course, while the main mystery of Alessa and Silent Hill's cold is being solved, Origin sees Travis unravel his own personal issues, which leads right back to my main criticism for these post-Team Silent games. But it's here where I have to give a bit of a spoiler warning. We're going to be going pretty in-depth, and there's a chance I might ruin either this game's story or some elements from the originals. So click on the timestamp on screen or follow the link in the description to keep from fracturing the space-time continuum due to forbidden knowledge. For some reason I will never understand, Silent Hill 2 has become the standard that the rest of the series should be held to, despite it having almost nothing to do with the overall Silent Hill lore. Now don't get me wrong, the first time I played through James's insanely touching trek through his own fractured psyche caused by him killing his own sick wife, well I was drawn in for every second of it, but that trick only works once. Every single developer that has ever touched this franchise since the release of Silent Hill 2 have all believed this to be the desired format, despite it differing vastly from the other three entries in the series, and sadly, Climax is no different. Throughout the game, Travis gets these odd flashbacks to past events in his life, mostly concerning his parents who died at an early age. Of course, as dictated by international law, Travis being an SH main character has to navigate the town of Silent Hill as it presents him with aspects of his own mental baggage till he remembers some traumatic event and then comes to grips with it. A little ditty I like to call the Sunderland Sundance. The tragic event this time around is that his mother went crazy when he was young and tried to kill him. Oh, and his dad hung himself. Now, I'm not saying this isn't an interesting little twist to find, but like I said before, the old SH2 trick only works once. As the game progresses, it becomes painfully clear they're just aping every single element of 2 they could, and hell, there's even a giant monster following Travis around while doing messed up things to the town's monsters and carrying an oversized weapon being clothed in butcher's attire. Listen, I know I'm not in the majority with how much I criticize Silent Hill 2, but like I've said a million times, it's still an amazing game. It was a real masterwork of storytelling, and even though it was a clear spin-off type of scenario, it served a very, very vital purpose. That being filling out the world of Silent Hill without having a major impact on the story at large. This approach is only retroactively degraded after every single, and I literally mean every single game released since The Room, has included a main character with a troubled past who needs to travel through Silent Hill encountering aspects of his repressed memories until he remembers and confronts those memories. Honestly, looking back, I think I just described the plots of Silent Hill's Origin, Homecoming, Downpour, and Book of Memories, which seems like a really big missed opportunity. I mean, the world of Silent Hill allows all kinds of amazingly supernatural things to happen, but anyone who touches this series seems to only be interested in having the town serve as some kind of psychiatrist and its spiritual power be used to help people face their inner demons. And yeah, at one point this was a very novel approach, but trust me, it is an effect that is greatly diminished over countless repetitions. That being said, this is by no means a bad story. I wasn't really expecting much, but there were moments when the game really immersed me into its world. I really do like the idea of taking part in events that led up to Silent Hill 1, and this game helps iron out details you might have wondered about, like who saved Alessa from the fire? How was she able to separate her consciousness while under the control of the cult? 
The only issue is, even your more fair-weather fan of the series is going to be able to spot some huge inaccuracies and even bigger plot holes. Like, how is Travis able to cross into the other world when Alessa wasn't able to create it yet, as her powers are being held at bay until the events at the end of the game? On top of that, the familiar characters that you'd be excited to interact with all act well outside their established personalities. And it's all these storyline mistakes and altered characters that made me assume this was a reboot type of deal. And maybe that was the idea at one point, but everything I've been able to dig up on the game states very clearly that it's meant to tell players what happened before Silent Hill 1. Sometimes it's just better to assume ignorance, and well, that's what I'm doing here. I don't think the guys at Climax were looking to rewrite the series lore, I think they just didn't understand the original game's events very well, and were probably making things up as they came to an element they couldn't explain. A practice that should look very familiar since it's exactly what most fans do when creating theories for things that have already been explained in the games. Look, I know I've been using Origins and accurate ties to the rest of the series as my main point of criticism, but if you're not actually familiar with those games, you might get into this one. It's plenty dark and deals with some pretty disturbing subject matter, and I think it's mostly the elements taken from the main series that gives this story its relatively effective feel. So I guess if you're just a fan of Silent Hill's world and you're looking for another glimpse into it, you could certainly do worse than Origins. Most of my issues stem from how many liberties are taken with established canon, but I'm self-aware enough to know that's just a personal bias of mine. You may very well enjoy a tale like this, and if you've sort of forgotten most of the events in the series, this might be a pretty damn enjoyable experience. For me though, it was a chore to get through. I didn't really like Travis as a character, and the changes made to already existing SH characters kind of made them unattractive as well. The twist about Travis's past has a good amount of pacing, and especially in the sanitarium, is really well introduced. At first, I thought all the files I was reading were just random stories of patients there, not some overarching narrative about our main character. Aside from that though, this was a mostly blah kind of story for me. It's not what I would call an insult to the art of storytelling, but it's not the best thing either. So I guess come for the gameplay, and if you like the story, well hey, that's just icing on the cake. Gameplay-wise, Origins does just as good of a job at emulating OG Silent Hill as it does completely missing the mark. I mean, on the surface, there's a lot to lead you to believe this is a game in the same vein as the original. After all, you do explore the town of Silent Hill, find a place of interest, run between this world and the other world collecting info and items that will allow you to backtrack and uncover more info and items. Which, don't get me wrong, is actually satisfying as hell, but it's everything in between that's been tweaked to a point that fans are no longer going to be able to recognize it. The first major issue for me were the controls. Now, you guys know I'm an avid supporter of tank controls. I don't know why, but that kind of setup is just intuitive as hell for me. So yes, I would have preferred a tank control option, but games like Silent Hill 3 have implemented really effective control schemes that work more akin to your modern 3D style, so it is indeed possible. It just seems like Climax wasn't up to that task. Origins controls terribly in my opinion, and I think that's because these guys refused to pick a side. They wanted the more modern control scheme, but also wanted to keep the rapidly changing fixed camera angles that are more traditionally seen in the genre. Which, hey, you know I love a well-placed camera system, but the benefit of tank controls is you always know which direction is forward. Origins likes to switch camera orientation often, and with its controls, that means whatever direction was forward for you before the switch might be a completely different direction after. I can't tell you how many times I was running near one of these collapsed portions of a road and had to actively fight to get back out of the fixed camera area. Of course, it would be unfair not to mention that this game uses a system that'll maintain your controls after a camera angle change as long as you keep holding that direction. But once you let it go or move the stick just a bit off access, bam, you're headed in a different direction, oftentimes leading right out of the camera angle. And this tedious process repeats itself often. The frustrating controls also give way to some very awkward combat. First and foremost, we have to talk about the big idea Origins has built its gameplay around. Instead of following the other games in the series, Origins has you finding hundreds of different kinds of melee weapons, all of which degrade with use. Meaning instead of finding and relying on the most powerful weapon in your arsenal, you'll be smacking enemies with IV stands till they break, and then switch into a portable CRT. Listen, I don't think breakable weapon systems are inherently bad. There are a few choice games that have done really well making that type of mechanic work. 
but almost all of them allow you to fix your weapons to avoid them permanently breaking. I think the developers wanted to make the weapons act as a stressor for the player. Like you would walk into an area, take out a few monsters, and then you'd have to scramble for something in the environment like a pipe or broken piece of wood, which on the surface sounds like a really good idea. In theory, this would make for a pretty tense time, but Climax sort of bungled the implementation. Instead of dynamically controlling how many options the player has at any time, Origins accounts for the lowest possible skill level of the player and scatters a near infinite amount of melee weapons in every area. And instead of relying on what's at hand, you'll be cycling through more than 50 options till you find that one katana you remembered picking up at some point. After the halfway point, I started using the secret unlockable weapons that come from beating the game only because they didn't degrade. And you know what? It was a much more fun experience. Now, I know what you're probably thinking. If the combat's a chore, this is a Silent Hill game. Why not just avoid the enemies? And that's what I tried to do for most of the second area, but Climax has made one small tweak to traditional SH combat that makes avoiding it a much worse choice than engaging in it. In the original Silent Hill games, you could navigate the environment running past most monsters, picking and choosing exactly where to use your precious resources. It was a game of risk versus reward since a monster in a hallway might take a few hits and maybe a health item to take down, but at least you wouldn't have to worry about dodging one of their melee attacks as you crisscross the map constantly running by them. Well, enemies in Origins all have grab attacks that will instantly teleport them onto you, and these can be initiated with little to no visible windup. That means unless you're out in the wide open streets of the town, your best bet is to down every enemy you come across. Either that or chance them grabbing onto you every time you cross them. But in their defense, they do allow you to shake enemies off, sadly using quick time button sequences, which makes the saddening first appearance of QTEs in a Silent Hill game so far. But since some enemies require some button mashing and others have random button cues, it's pretty easy to take a few cheap hits from these attacks. And adding insult to injury, once you do clear an area out, there are respawns that seem to happen at random leading to me running out of healing items on several occasions despite using the powerful New Game Plus weapons. And in a survival horror game, this would be the desired effect, having the player always running low on supplies, but if 90% of the damage you take comes from cheap hits due to enemies grabbing you out of nowhere or running right into melee attacks thanks to the terrible controls, well, we've officially left the territory of tense horror gameplay and entered the world of frustrating game design elements. But let's move away from the more outwardly annoying stuff and move into the more subtle ways that Origins actually does well. If there's one thing Origins gets right, it's exploration. Areas in this game are fun to explore and their atmosphere feels incredibly authentic given the source material they're working from. I really liked seeing more of this foggy town and the game does a good job of providing a bit of fan service alongside new and interesting locations. And if you'll remember, the original Silent Hill games used the other world as a way to alter the environment around the player effectively doubling the size of any area. Typically, you would explore a location in the town, and then at a fixed point, the other world would take over, forcing you to find new routes and allowing you to access more of the map. Well, Origins has a similar take on the practice, but with one giant alteration. As the player, you are free to initiate these other world transitions whenever you want, as long as you can get to a mirror. Now on the surface, I'm sure that doesn't seem like a big deal at all, but it radically changes the flow your typical SH fan will have been used to. Instead of forcing the player to forge new paths and discover new items, the other world is used almost as a puzzle element. Instead of exploring each version of the world separately, Travis moves between the two at will, and that means using this mechanic as a progress further button. In the other world, doors that were locked might be open now, and these new areas might have key items to be found. It essentially plays directly into exploring one area instead of compartmentalizing that process into two separate individual experiences. I'm not sure why, but this seemed to cause me to grow pretty fatigued with exploration towards the end of any location, but I will admit it does make for an interesting little twist. The purist in me doesn't like such a big change, but realistically I think it works really well at turning the entire environment into a puzzle. I'm kind of torn, because on one end, it does seem to make each area feel a little too long, but it also forced me to think outside the box and made for a really interesting way to explore the environment. Of course, this game was a portable title first and foremost, and I would be letting you guys down if I didn't cover how it played on its home console, the PSP. 
and in an odd turn of events, I find the PSP version of Origins to be much easier to play for a multitude of reasons. First off is the controls, which just seem to work better on the PSP. I can't really quantify exactly what's going on, but it's a noticeable difference. And complementing the controls is a frame rate that somehow runs smoother than the console port. Sure, there were still dips here and there, but this game feels like it runs at or near 60 frames per second most of the time. Of course, you do have to factor in how cramped the physical controls can be on a PSP, so you may not want to play this one for hours on end, but in its defense, Origins is a pretty easy game to pick up, make some progress, and then put back down again. Now, I know I just front-loaded a lot of complaints, but that's because everything outside of the complaints is pretty damn close to an authentic Silent Hill experience. I remember my first time playing the PSP version of this game, marveling at how close it got to the real SH kind of feeling. I mean, sure, the explorable parts of the town had to be trimmed down to keep it working on such a low-power platform, and yeah, that does feel a little odd on the PS2 version, but it really does come within inches of feeling like a real SH game. The puzzles will definitely have you scratching your head, and the environments are pretty damn interesting. I may not be the biggest fan of the story itself, but the exposition and cutscenes are spread evenly across each area, so you always feel like you're making forward progress. And it's always exciting going back into the streets of Silent Hill and finding more of the town to explore. I know I went pretty hard on the game at the start here, but rest assured, even in the face of those downsides, this game will rekindle a bit of that old SH nostalgia you have deep in you. And yeah, you may be frustrated the entire time, but at this point, beggars most certainly can't be choosers. So yeah, this might not be the best Silent Hill game ever made, but it's definitely not the worst either. If you've grown disillusioned with the modern SH series, but are still looking for that familiar psychological horror experience, well, you could do much worse than picking up Silent Hill Origins. You have a habit of popping up where you're not wanted, Mr. Grady. Isn't it time you left town? So even though Origins started out as a PSP title, there's still a good amount to talk about graphically speaking. I mean, the PSP was a surprisingly powerful handheld at the time, and I think games like Origins really shows that off. But well, first, we gotta talk about the PS2 release since that's where I spent most of my time this playthrough. And the first thing we gotta talk about is the static filter. As you guys might know by now, I'm a bit of a series heretic since I really don't like these static overlays in SH games, and whenever possible, I will turn them off. I know it's supposed to be a defining look for these games, but this just looks ugly as hell to me, and I'd rather see the game's artistry without any obstructions. The only issue with this is, Origin only unlocks this feature after you've beaten the game, so I had to resort to a bit of trickery. On the PSP, it was easy enough to get going since I just had to download a save file, plug my PSP into my PC, and drag it over, but I didn't know if I could do something similar with the PS2. Well, thanks to the custom firmware, Free McBoot, I was able to download a save file, use a special program that unpacks all the file's contents, transfer it to USB, and use the file browser from Free McBoot to transfer the save file to my memory card, which took a bit of trial and error, but actually worked really well. So regardless of whether you're playing on the PSP or PS2, make sure to import a save file from the internet with one clear game already on it, so you can disable that static filter. I have heard this effect is a little easier on the eyes when viewed on a CRT, but until I find a quality PVM or BVM, I'm not going to be able to test that myself. And with that issue out of the way, it is clear there have been some serious upgrades in texture resolution and 3D model complexity from the PSP original. Lighting and contrast have also been tweaked, but sadly that did not end up working in the game's favor. While the PSP version was pretty damn dark, it seems like the PS2 release is much much darker. You're likely going to struggle trying to see anything outside of your flashlight's cone once you're inside one of Silent Hill's buildings, but if you ask me, this actually helps add to the atmosphere. Sure, you might miss a few items on the floor, but I was able to play through the game without an issue, honestly. The only time this really becomes a problem is when you're recording footage for a YouTube video, since compression artifacts are much more visible in darker areas, and the method Google uses to compress and display all the video uploaded to YouTube can cause a loss in color information on dark screens. Of course, I would turn up the brightness in the game's options, but apparently this is something that Climax thought didn't deserve to make the transition over to the PS2. And if I increase brightness a little too much here in the editing software, it's just gonna mess up the picture, so let's go ahead and just leave it dark. On the brighter side, I really like the way items move back and forth on your screen once you've picked them up. But going back to the complaints again, I really don't like how using the D-pad to switch weapons 
brings up an ugly weapons inventory. Listen, I've said it a thousand times by now, but the real appeal with survival horror games is how immersive they are. The effect is lost if you don't feel like you're in the game's world, and in my opinion, the fastest way to ruin immersion is to show QTE-style button prompts or inventory elements on screen. Especially after you've collected damn near 100 melee weapons, you'll be sorting through this thing for hours. As far as the town itself goes, I think this is a pretty respectful rendition of old Silent Hill. It's certainly been simplified thanks to Origins handheld, well, Origins, but it still looks great to me. Level geometry can be a little simplistic, but textures in the PS2 version are high res enough that the town ends up looking really convincing. Most of the game's cutscenes are in engine, which is always good in a Silent Hill game, and after playing parts 2 and 3, it's pretty damn cool seeing a per pixel lighting implementation for Travis's flashlight, as opposed to the other games in the series using a per vertex style. The only issue with that being shadows cast by it can be very blocky and alias looking. In most rooms and hallways, this is a non-issue, but when you walk into an area with a lot of set dressing, you'll notice a kind of shimmering effect on the background from all the moving aliased edges. Monsters in the game look relatively okay enough, but they all seem to be takes on previous series monsters, specifically the bubblehead nurses and lying figures. To me, this kind of shows that Climax were at least familiar with some of the surface level SH elements, but not enough to understand that enemies in the game should reflect fears and negative emotions from within the character's own psyche. It seems to me these guys were just kind of thrown in monsters everyone would be familiar with, a practice we are going to see repeat itself many times as this retrospective goes on. All in all, this is a pretty good looking PS2 game. Of course, it doesn't hold a candle to games that are native to the platform, since they didn't have to make any concessions due to development on a handheld, but it still looks great to my eye. Of course, it helps that it brings some advantages over the original games like a per pixel flashlight illumination code and really fluid animations. But it also brings a few other things to the table, and included in that is really odd graphical glitches. For some reason, I found that in this version of the game, when you reload any gun from the menu, the weapon's image will turn into the last gun you had equipped. Now, as far as I've been able to see, this is merely visual and doesn't carry over into actual gameplay, but it seems like a pretty easy bug to catch, so I gotta assume no one playtested this PS2 release. That being said, as far as bugs go, this is a relatively benign one. And with all that out of the way, let's take a look at the original release of the game on the PSP. Now, this is the version of the game I experienced first, and this is the game that showed me just how powerful Sony's little portable was. I was really blown away at how complex the level design was from an aesthetic standpoint, and how well it ran given the full 3D world with much less of the dialed back features you tend to see on other PSP games. On the console's sharp little screen, this game really shines, but I was surprised to see just how good the game looked upscaled through the frame meister and zoomed in a good amount. Going from the internal screen to the PSP Slim's component video output brings two flaws with it though, but if you ask me, they are pretty minute. First off are these horizontal lines visible throughout the picture. Now, I couldn't really tell you why these are here since I've never seen them in any other PSP game, but they really didn't bother me much at all. If that's something you won't be able to live with though, I'd say the PSP screen is the best bet for you. Second are the more muted colors. Now, I'm not really sure if this is a result of the video passing through an analog converter or just the PSP screen masking some of this issue, but you will notice less overall color depth and some washout with the black levels, which again is not a big deal at all given the fact that playing PSP games zoomed in on a big screen is novel enough to forgive a lot. As you can see here, the PS2 release isn't just a straight port, as details have been added in the environments and 3D models, but to be honest, I think I kind of prefer the PSP version. Not only is it a cool novelty playing portable games on a crisp upscale 1080p picture, but the game seems to run faster and control better than the PS2 release. That being said, both are solid choices, and I kind of struggle to stay objective with this one. I mean, if we're being technical here, this is on the low end as far as what the PS2 is capable of, but I can't help but be impressed with its portable origins. Maybe I'm just a sucker for these type of portable remasters since I had a similar problem being critical in my review of Resident Evil Revelations. Well, regardless, Silent Hill Origins may not stack up to the other games in the series visually speaking, but it does a solid job of trying to. So much of this game just feels like a proper homage to the series' typical look, and Maybe they didn't get all the way there, but in this day and age, a western developed game getting this close to that Silent Hill look is no small accomplishment. Daddy, 
Wake up. Peace, Daddy. I'm not sleeping, son. And I think that's a perfect analogy for every part of this game. Each element included, minus the more modern implements like QTEs and an on-screen weapon inventory, all look like a very good copy of what Team Silent was going for in their games. No, it definitely doesn't meet the incredibly high standards set by the series' original creators, but it feels like a work of supreme appreciation. The one and only real issue I have with the game is its story. Sure, Travis's tale is by no means boring or unentertaining in any way, but it's the elements that are supposed to lead into SH1 that get me. There are a ton of liberties taken here, either that or these guys really did not understand the original story. Either way, it ended up leaving a bad taste in my mouth. The inaccuracies got so bad, I ended up researching whether or not this was supposed to be some kind of soft reboot or maybe an alternate interpretation. But no, everything I found points towards this being a legit prequel, and if that truly is the case, consider that mission failed. I mean, it's an interesting enough tale, but if you're even kind of knowledgeable on SH lore, you're likely going to be too busy counting mistakes to actually get too much out of this story. Of course, it's important to note that the story here is perfect in getting you from point A to point B, and it's not the worst thing in the world, it just kind of strikes me as odd. And I know this video has been up and down, but I really do recommend this game. It may not achieve the same heights as the originals, but it gets damn close. Hell, this is by far the most Silent Hill feeling Silent Hill game made by Western developers, and even though competition isn't exactly what you would call neck and neck in that department, that's still a hefty compliment. So if you've already run through the originals more times than you can count, maybe the PSP will be a pretty serviceable method of transportation to get you back to that foggy little town. And that's about all I can say about Origins for right now, but I do want to thank you guys for supporting this series and the rest of my work. Make sure to stick around because the absolute nightmare that is SH Revelation is up next, but until then, thank you so much for watching the Silent Hill Retrospective. Well, here we are, officially one entry deep into the post-Team Silent era of the Silent Hill franchise, and while there were a few things about Origins I really liked, well, let's just say the new Western developers of the series have not done much to win me over to their side. So you can imagine my dismay when the news concerning the next Silent Hill centered around the idea of reimagining the events of the first game, a game that a lot of us hold very near and dear to our hearts. Now, of course, I'm not saying such a thing isn't possible. I mean, I love the RE2 remake, and that was way more new stuff than old. But when you dig into altering what was a very story-based experience, the red flags become visible from low orbit. Through interviews and trailers, SH fans found out the intent here was to completely rewrite the story of SH1, and let me tell you from experience, there were not a lot of people even remotely happy with that concept. But hey, we're here to see every single thing the town of Silent Hill has to offer, and maybe a new perspective on our first run-in is exactly what the psychologist ordered. So, once again, I'm asking you guys to follow me into the foggy roads of that eerily deserted vacation resort. Ladies, gentlemen, welcome to Silent Hill. The development of Silent Hill Shattered Memories was pretty controversial from the word go. At first, rumors of an SH1 remake had a lot of us very excited for understandable reasons, but the slow trickle of news seemed to be pointing in a very different direction when official sources started to get involved. The word reimagining was getting thrown around a lot, and when you're dealing with a cult classic like Silent Hill, well, that's not the type of nomenclature you want to hear. The story of SH1 was incredibly satisfying already, and a lot of us were worried having a Western developer take a shot at it would negate a lot of the nuance that came from the very foreign concept of psychological horror Team Silent brought to the original. That being said, I always felt like people outside the original Team Silent writing staff would likely never produce an accurate SH story, so the idea of starting from scratch was not the most unattractive thing I could imagine. I mean, I would obviously have preferred this to have been its own spin-off kind of thing, but hey, I'm not so ideologically possessed that I can't see the benefit in having a fresh pair of eyes take a crack at something I love. But that's not to say I was totally open-minded on the subject. The other part of the pre-release hype was the fact that Shattered Memories would be released on Nintendo's Wii, a console that I hold just above the Jaguar in terms of enjoyment. From the start, I was very skeptical of motion controls, and after seeing how poorly they worked in almost every Wii game I ever played, 
I was counting down the days until they died out. And I know some of you listening to this right now probably like motion controls, and I'm not so rigid I can't admit, listen, sometimes, you know, people are wrong, and obviously that's you. <laughs> but we had a lot of controversy here before the game even hit shelves. Of course, one could understand this kind of move given the full context. You could call the OG Silent Hill a lot of things, but easy to comprehend would not be one of them. On top of that, the Wii was proving itself to be a gaming milestone for how far it was able to penetrate the casual or even non-gaming market. An SH game on the console would no doubt have to be retooled as far as the story goes, and while I can totally understand how that drove some people mad, I found myself more and more supportive of the idea lately. Well, before we get too far into the weeds, we're going to need to discuss the particulars of that story. My daughter's missing. That road's not in my jurisdiction. What? You want state police. You're kidding. Just before Shattered Memories released, you couldn't go five minutes on the internet without seeing an interview including the word reimagining, which is fitting because that is exactly what this game is, and I'm going to have to go off the reservation just a bit here, but I don't necessarily think that's such a bad idea. Now, had this have been a proper remake like it was rumored to be, this level of alteration would have put me into some type of psychotic rage. But as it stands, I can think of a million things far worse than viewing SH1's story through a completely different lens with a totally unrelated game backing it up. But I haven't always felt that way. In this game's day, there were no shortage of hardcore SH fans shouting down the developers for messing with what they saw as perfection, myself included. I swore off Shattered Memories based solely on my love for the game it was messing around with, and that lasted literally until I spun this bad boy up for this very review. Looking back with 2020 hindsight, I was being petty and kind of immature. I mean, sure, the idea of changing such an awesome and deep story still gives me chills, but as I played it, it became clear that this was its own thing. It didn't reflect on the original at all and kind of formed into a unique little experience sometimes using very minor elements of Silent Hill's story as a pool of inspiration. Of course, one could argue such a low level of relation to the source material would kind of negate the whole point of reimagining it, but before we get into that, we should probably cover what exactly that story is. I wasn't supposed to be here. I shouldn't have been here. SM starts with a familiar event as we see Harry Mason crashing his car in Silent Hill. But from here, we're taken to a psychotherapy session where a very different Dr. Kaufman starts asking us to delve into some pretty deep-rooted stuff. These therapy sessions are cut into the game after pivotal story points and both serve as a narrative framing device and act as a kind of psychological profiling type of deal. But as you might assume, it's very basic. Of course, I'll dive deeper into that when we cover gameplay, but I will say I'm a little mixed on how I feel about these parts. Sometimes they play into the story really well, but sometimes Kaufman just changes his established character, which is really off-putting. Plus, I don't like having to fill out forms and order items when I'm really getting into the game's story. And speaking of which, let's get back on track here. After the car wreck, Harry goes looking for his daughter Cheryl, and this is where all of the similarities stop. Harry spends his time exploring a mostly empty Silent Hill looking for his daughter and ends up meeting characters named after SH1 mainstays, but instead of them all having some kind of involvement with a secret cult or the town's spiritual power, they're just people. Regular people you'd probably expect to see in a small town. Which leads me to the very different feeling this game gives me compared to the original. Shattered Memories feels more like a psychological thriller than a survival horror story. In fact, I got very hard Dark City and In the Mouth of Madness vibes the longer the game went on. There was a lot of stuff the game was hiding from me, and it seemed like everyone I talked to was privy to a lot more info than I was, and actually that's what I like about this game. In SH1, finding Cheryl is your goal, but after an hour or two of gameplay, figuring out what the hell is going on in this town becomes the main draw. You meet a very limited cast of characters, but all of them seem really off in a very David Lynch dream logic kind of way. Herein lies the mother's womb, containing the power to create life. In Shattered Memories, the empty town, strange occurrences, and odd characters aren't even the main questions you're going to want to answer. See, this time around, Harry is the mystery that needs to be solved. Who is this guy? Why can't he find his daughter? And why can't he remember very simple parts of his life? Everyone he talks to seems to point out parts of his story not really matching up quite right, and it seems like no one's able to give this guy a straight answer. He sometimes flashes in and out of memories or what seems like made-up events, 
and you'll sometimes leave a room and have a person you were talking to be replaced by a stranger that seems to know you. You really get the feeling that Harry's losing it, and instead of people being frustratingly cryptic, as is tradition with Silent Hill games, characters in SM don't have answers for Harry's questions because those questions only really make sense to him and us. When Harry returns to the address on his ID, there's someone else living there, and they obviously have no answers for him. To them, he's a stranger spouting gibberish. And given that same exact situation, I don't know if I'd be much help either. This game's version of Sybil isn't very interested in helping Harry, but this time around it's because of how suspicious he is and how much of his story just doesn't add up. I really liked how well this game was able to make me question everything I was seeing. I honestly wondered if what I just saw really happened after nearly every cutscene past the middle of the game. As a matter of fact, this kind of story and this type of experience, well, it plays right into my wheelhouse. As that guy on YouTube who's known for reviewing survival horror games, it may surprise you to learn that I really don't like horror movies much. From ghosts and serial killers to extra-dimensional terrors and mass slashers, I just don't get into 99% of the scary movies out there. However, I have a soft spot for zombie movies and psychological thrillers. I really get into stories that make me feel like I might be losing my mind right along with the movie's lead character, and that's something that SM does very well. I never really felt like I understood what was happening, but at the same time, I always felt like I was just on the verge of figuring it out. That kind of balance is what I often look for in this type of experience, but it's rare that it's done this well in a video game. And here's where I have to go a little deeper than some of you might be down for. If you don't want aspects of this game and the original Silent Hill's ending ruined for you, click the link in the description or skip to the timestamp on screen to avoid serious spoilers. As for the rest of you, now let's jump down this rabbit hole. Are you on something? I'm Dahlia. Hottest piece of ass you'll ever see in this town. As you play the game, the developers throw a lot of hints at you that things aren't exactly how Harry thinks they are, and in my opinion, they do a really good job of keeping the exact nature of the endgame revelation relatively hidden in plain sight. And while I'm sure I wasn't the only one who guessed the ending before seeing it, I was still pretty stoked to see how well they pulled it off. So let's go over what we have to work with so far. Harry Mason gets into a car crash in a snowy silent hill and begins looking for his daughter. In doing so, he finds out people are living in his house and have been for some time. His seven-year-old was somehow enrolled in the local high school and an older, slightly pathetic Dahlia claims that they're married even though Harry has no knowledge of this. So, after working our way through both the town and Harry's fractured psyche, we're taken into the last area of the game where Sybil meets us letting us know that Harry Mason died 18 years ago, mirroring the bad ending of the original game, an ending that, might I mention, I think is unduly shit on. Yeah, maybe nowadays it's kind of cheap, but as an early teen, the idea that the whole game was some kind of fever dream caused by a deadly head injury, well, that hit me right in the feels. Anyways, getting back to the game at hand, upon entering the lighthouse, which was supposed to be the last and only place we could find Cheryl, we're taken into another session with Dr. Kaufman, and as he rails on about accepting the past, our Harry just walks right through the door, revealing that we've been Cheryl the entire time, working her way through accepting the death of her father, and the realization that he wasn't the knight in shining armor her seven-year-old mind thought him as. You've been with me for so long. I always will be. I think this was a pretty heart-wrenching scene and worked as a nice in-game reveal. Instead of the supernatural hook I was expecting the entire time, we were just working our way through some damaged woman's memories of her dead father. This fit in perfectly with my love for psychological thrillers and even seemed to be drawing from the same exact design elements. I'm sure some of you will have figured out this scenario by the time this scene takes place, but for me it was a nice little surprise and the ending with Cheryl packing away all the extra trinkets we found in the game spoke to the idea of challenging the typical and then everyone lived happily ever after type of game ending. It seems like, at least in my interpretation, that there is a chance of Cheryl ending up okay, but overall her dad's still dead and her entire upbringing was worse off because of it. She really has no choice now but to move on and who knows if that's even going to bring her any more happiness than the fantasy of her dad still being alive did. Honestly, this really got to me. All in all, like I said before, it was a surprisingly emotional end to what was a very enjoyable story, but I think it's time we let the newcomers back in. Alright, so we went over the ending, and for those of you who skipped the spoilers, I want to say I really enjoyed this game's story and how it ended up. 
It was well told with all kinds of little hints at the resolution scattered around the game, much of which seemed very obvious looking back in hindsight. The psychological elements of the story are very well done and in a respectful way avoid beating you over the head with drawn out in-game explanations for very subtle details. It really did shock me how much I ended up getting into Harry's exploration through these events, but that being said, there are some elements that were pretty poorly done in my eyes. Throughout the game, there's a very creepy, isolating atmosphere, which is exactly what I wanted, but it seems like the developers weren't very confident in selling the experience solely on that atmosphere alone. So they scattered around a bunch of unrelated creepy text messages and voicemails. How it works is Harry's flashlight will flicker and there'll be a kind of static noise when one of these bits of nonsense are nearby, and then after some kind of ghost explosion or ridiculous shadow person skittering away, you'll get a message that sometimes points towards the game's ending, I think, but mostly they're unrelated events like a boy accidentally drowning his brother or some teenager dying from choking himself while he jerks it. You have a nice day at school. Sure, Mom. Don't do anything I wouldn't do. Sure, Mom. Whoa. Oh. Now don't get me wrong, I don't shy away from dark story elements in my horror games, but that's just it. Shattered Memories isn't a horror game. As far as its story is concerned, it is strictly a psychological thriller. All of the weird horror elements don't tie into the overall narrative and end up feeling out of place. Now, there are some messages that angle towards parents fighting and divorce, things like that, which does help along the general point of the story, but the quote-unquote scary stories you find are just kind of pathetic feeling in comparison. It's like you're reading a really good Lovecraft tale, turn the page, and suddenly Freddy Krueger starts carving up teens in their underwear. It just clashes really hard. Of course, these little tidbits aren't so common that they ruin the tone of the story by themselves, and as a plus, if you don't want to, you never really have to see them. So as far as complaints go, this is a pretty minor one, which means you know damn well there's a bigger one to discuss. And that is the Silent Hill elements of the story. Like I said before, I really and truly enjoyed this story and even respected the hell out of the process used to tell it. But throughout the entire experience, I just kept wondering why the hell this needed to be an SH game. There are no elements that tie it into the series at large, minus the mandatory in new Silent Hill games, inclusion of the town helping characters through their mental baggage. I mean, SH2 was a totally unrelated affair as far as the core SH story was concerned, but it at least felt like it took place in the same world and timeline. This story, for all of its quality and style, never once broaches anything even approaching a common Silent Hill theme. The only thing that's been carried over is the beginning two minutes of the first game and the names of the characters in town. Those characters don't have the same roles, and the town doesn't function like it does in the original, so I'm left wondering why it needed to say Silent Hill on the box. I would have enjoyed this tale just as much, if not more, if our main character wasn't Harry Mason. This could have been a groundbreaking psychological experience on a console that was sorely hurting for such a thing, but instead the developers decided to strap on all the baggage that comes with reimagining a very beloved and well-established franchise. I'm sure there are plenty of you watching right now who never touched this game for that exact reason, and that really sucks because all of us missed out on a really deep and meaningful story in the process. I guess my point is, despite all of the care and talent that went into writing such a cool story, there was just no need to call this a Silent Hill game. As a matter of fact, I get the feeling that the association with the rest of the series might have drugged the process down a bit. But with those two complaints out of the way, I have both surprised myself and likely a lot of you. I just did not expect to like this game as much as I did. The original Silent Hill story was one of my first run-ins with a truly deep and touching video game narrative, and the thought of altering that even a little bit turned me off until this retrospective forced me to play through it. So what I'm trying to say is, don't be like me. I missed out on a really interesting and well-told story. If you like games that challenge you mentally and force you to consider deep psychological issues in a really creative way, well, you aren't exactly flush with options, are you? So make sure you experience this story for yourself. I didn't expect to enjoy it as much as I did, but now that I have, I want all of you to as well. Much like the story, Shattered Memories Controls had a lot of opposition from me right out of the gate. I've been a very vocal detractor of the waggle controls found in most Wii games, and more specifically, I just didn't feel like that approach has any business being in a Silent Hill game. Now, I have some good news and some bad news, and since I'm an optimist, we'll go with the good first. About 75% of the game controls really well. The pointing and aiming of the flashlight works perfectly and does feel novel enough to warrant a play. 
Of course, it does suffer from the typical issues that comes with motion controls, but given the circumstances, I doubt there would have been any way to avoid them. To be more specific, it gets kind of tiring holding your wrist in the same awkward position for an extended period of time, and any time I wanted to reach for the record button in my capture software or grab a drink or something, I was stuck watching Harry spin in endless circles until I got my controller back to where the sensors could see it. Annoying little issues to be sure, but a majority of the time I was completely satisfied. And before we get into the aforementioned bad stuff, we should probably talk about what I like to call Shattered Memories split gameplay model. See, most of the game is spent in the town just kind of wandering around, and in these portions you'll be either using the Wiimote to shine your flashlight and adjust your perspective, or you'll be solving very, very, and I can't stress this enough, very simple motion control puzzles. An approach that sounds like a losing idea on paper, but something about the environment combined with its atmosphere, man, it just made me fall in love with these parts of the game. The devs seem to have struck this perfect balance between making the world seem bleak and uninviting, but still interesting enough that I wanted to explore every little area I could find. It actually kind of reminded me of the Stalker games, a series of Ukrainian first-person shooters that has you exploring the exclusion zone around the Chernobyl nuclear reactor. In those games, the vast majority of the gigantic maps on offer are uninhabited and offer no reward for exploration, but the environment was built in such a way that you just can't help but do that. I think SM has the same exact feeling, even though my only reward for going off the beaten path was the odd trinket, which by the way has no impact on the story, or a quip from Harry triggered when zooming in on specific items in the environment, I just wanted to do it. On top of that, you have an in-game cell phone that lets you take pictures, check your map, and receive messages, and I gotta say, the integration of this little gimmick into the game world, while very minor, is actually pretty cool. Examining your environment will have you come across all kinds of phone numbers, each one actually dialable, and while it never does much outside of minor world building, I still thought it was a really cool idea. Further utilizing this idea, certain spots in the environment will trigger a message from the people of Silent Hill, sometimes acting as an analog for Harry's real world situation, and just like I said before, these little pieces of side content end up feeling kind of cheap given how well the rest of the game is able to rely solely on the grim atmosphere of its setting. Having a crying child desperately trying to find help for his drowning brother, while dark and depressing in its own way, just doesn't feel right here since you know full well it has no bearing on the game's story and will never be brought up again. Aside from that one very small complaint though, I honestly don't know why, but something about the way Silent Hill looks and feels in this game just inspired me to see more of it. I found myself dreading moving on to the next area since I was never sure I'd seen everything. If you're asking me, the entire game could have been these slow moving investigation areas and I would have been totally happy. Sadly, that is most definitely not the case, so we're going to have to get into that bad stuff I was talking about earlier. The other 25% of the game consists of these chase sequences, and god, I really do not like these things. The motion controls that work perfectly in the slow moving exploration scenes really don't lend themselves to fast paced running, where you may need to make very sharp turns and pull off some complicated movements. How it goes is, you'll see the world ice over, much like the transition to the original's other world, and then you'll need to run your ass off to avoid getting grabbed by one of the game's one and only enemies. Once you're grabbed, you're gonna have to do some Wiimote waggling based on where they're at on your body, and I never quite felt like I was getting these right. Specifically when they're latched onto my back. I'd be performing the exact motion that was displayed on screen, but Harry just would refuse to throw these guys off. And to add to the frustration, this also happens when you're doing the right motion. Randomly, Harry will throw the enemy off on the very first try, but sometimes that's not the case, and there will be little to no visual indication that you're doing the right movements. So I was stuck constantly wondering if I wasn't throwing a monster off due to me not performing the right motion cue or the game's random nature. As far as movement is concerned, you're going to need to be making a lot of snap decisions, which does not bode well for using a Wiimote to turn your perspective. Now each of these are essentially a maze that loops back in on itself and oftentimes you're going to need to run through it a fair number of times before you figure out the right combination of turns. Of course you could pull out your map on your phone, but that requires awkwardly reaching your thumb up to the D-pad on the Wiimote and then having Harry stop his sprint and reaching down to the A button so you could zoom the map in. Now this is possible in the very first areas since you won't be as swamped with enemies, but towards the middle to end of the game, pulling out your phone can just be a shortcut to an instant game over. 
Speaking of which, dying will only drop you back at an entry point or sometimes a midpoint of the area, which is more of an annoyance than anything. And since there's no real weight to dying in this game, it doesn't feel like a loss, more like a time-wasting mechanic especially when I often felt like a death wasn't my fault, either due to the wacky motion controls or the fact that I couldn't get up over a barrier. Now how this is supposed to work is you hit A to jump over something, open a door, or do whatever. But while you're running, these actions are supposed to be automatic. The key word there being supposed to be. More often than not, the wide berth needed for turning with the Wiimote's look controls means I was approaching obstacles at very odd angles, and the automatic actions never kicked in, which would cost me a few milliseconds, aka just enough time to have three monsters grab me from behind. I probably don't need to say this, but these parts of the game were incredibly frustrating and really clashed with the rest of the game for me. Most of the time, I'd be slowly exploring an area, really drinking in the atmosphere, and then I'd see the world start to ice over and I'd get pissed off at the thought of stopping the fun gameplay I was doing to solve some kind of simple maze. And the fact that these are the only times in the game when you're in danger of failing kind of makes for a bad dynamic. The pacing of the exploration slash investigation scenes is so well done and then for some reason the developers shoehorn in this really awkwardly controlled high intensity chase scene. You know that one scene from Tom Savini's Night of the Living Dead where Tony Todd is delivering that heart-wrenching monologue about what he had seen in Carson City? Well, imagine if they would have just abruptly cut to a car chase in the next scene. That's what it feels like. I get that there had to be some stakes in the game, and I get the idea of resetting the player's expectation at certain points, but I would have liked to have seen these other worlds slash enemy sections integrated more fluidly into the overall gameplay here. And on a much smaller note, it seems really odd the ability to peek through doors was included here. I mean, sure, you could argue it was good for avoiding enemies in the chase sequences, but you already know where those enemies are. Just move your cursor over a door, and the static will let you know exactly what's on the other side. And on top of that, you're gonna have to go through the door anyways. Why drag it out? Compounding that issue is the fact that the same mechanic exists in the normal world where there are no enemies. All this does is just slow down the pace at which you can explore, and even though it was a very minor annoyance, I still would have liked to have seen a version of the game where this wasn't included. And since we're already bitching, why not continue? Like I mentioned before, the game makes a lot of effort to let you know that it'll be profiling you in order to form the game to your exact sensibilities, but this is dumb for a lot of reasons. First off, the way in which this is accomplished runs counter to the intended gameplay. Sure, answering a questionnaire in the therapy sessions isn't too intrusive, but the game also keeps track of the things you look at while exploring. The only problem there is they made the game world so damn interesting, I wanted to look at everything. Parts of the game that had advertisements for lingerie or mannequins modeling sexy clothes had me terrified to look at them lest the game label me as some type of pervert. And worst of all, they don't have an effect on much of anything. I mean, if you think having the main character wear a different shirt in some scenes is a massive payoff for this kind of nonsense, well, I guess more power to you, but I just don't see the point in it. Now, I know I'm walking a very thin line here since I just got done praising the hell out of the game's exploration, atmosphere, and general mood, and now I'm ripping it for some dead serious problems, so I want to be very clear. The vast majority of this game had me wrapped around its finger. I was truly enveloped in the world and enjoyed the absolute hell out of exploring it. The film noir vibes I got while searching the empty town for Cheryl just can't be overstated, and I really want to mention again, these exploration scenes are absolutely the reason you should be playing. That being said, these chase sequences nearly ruin the game for me, emphasis on nearly. Of course, there's always the chance that my bias against motion controls and my own preferences could be at fault here, but either way, rest assured, the rest of the game makes up for the flaws I just listed. Of course, talking about Shattered Memories gameplay is not a simple binary matter since we have a healthy amount of ports to take into account here. SM was released first on the Wii, but also made its way onto the PS2 and my favorite handheld of all time, the PSP. So, how did they fare? Well, let's start with the PS2. Over on Sony's little black rectangle, the experience is relatively similar all things considered. And yeah, you're gonna lose your ability to move your flashlight with your actual real-world hand, but you can use the right analog stick to accomplish that same exact goal. And while I will admit it does feel much more fluid using motion controls, I was also really happy not to have the downsides of those controls present. During chase scenes, you're gonna have to perform quick time events instead of waggle controls, and I gotta say, this is much more agreeable with me. I may not like QTEs in general, but they work here, or at least they work much more effectively than motion controls. I'm not a big fan of the button overlays on screen, but I have to assume they'll go away after the first few areas like it did in the Wii release. 
Moving on, you can expect more of the same from the PSP release, and I have to say how impressed I am to see this full Wii and PS2 game working in the exact same way on such a limited platform. Every single part of the base game is here, and much like the other two options, I had way more fun playing a single father detective than running from faceless pink things. In both the PS2 and PSP versions, the motion control puzzles are still workable, only this time with the visible cursor being controlled by the analog sticks. And this concession doesn't detract from the experience at all in my opinion. One thing to note is a much more noticeable amount of slowdown in the portable iteration, but given the platform, I think that should be expected. And truth be told, neither home board escapes moments of slowdown either. For some reason, the loading between areas seems to be a major hit on performance for each platform, but oddly enough, the PSP version skates away with the least amount of this. So it's a wash as far as which one works best. What isn't, however, is the fact that both Sony ports control much more reliably in the chase scenes. Since you're not required to bring an on-screen cursor to the edges of the display in order to turn, they automatically feel much better while running. Although these portions of the game still aren't very fun, they're just much more tolerable. Honestly, I would love to recommend these two Sony ports as the best way to play the game given my obvious bias for their consoles, but even I can admit the motion controls work really well for pointing your flashlight, and call me crazy, they do a great job at immersing me further into the game world. I really wish there was a way to include the great motion controls from the exploration areas and mix them with the traditional controls from the PS2 and PSP chase scenes because that would without a doubt make for a much better game. But since the Wiimote really did a great job as a stand-in for a flashlight, I've got to go with the original Wii release as my recommendation. Now keep in mind the other two are not very far behind that version at all, so if you can only get one of them, you're not going to be playing with any kind of major handicap. So of course, feel free to pick the right one for your situation and your setup. All things considered, gameplay was another avenue that surprised the absolute hell out of me. While the story did a lot to keep me interested, the awesome exploring and investigating were the real draws for me. I really and truly did not expect to like this game as much as I do, and I'm happy to say even the very badly designed parts of it don't detract from that. It does kind of feel like two separate teams are responsible for the two gameplay types, but 90% of the game gets a big thumbs up from me, and that coming from a hardcore fan of the original entries in the series should really hold some weight. If you're like me and stayed away from this title strictly based on your loyalty to the game it's trying to reimagine, well, I'd recommend you putting your series allegiances to the side and experience a really interesting game. I know it may be kind of hard to lock onto here with just my words and a few images on screen, but trust me, I didn't think I'd be enjoying a game that was mostly shining a flashlight at old sales flyers either. For some reason, it all just works and manages to be one of the most immersive experiences you can have with a Wiimote in your hands. Without a doubt, Shattered Memories did its namesake and shattered a lot of my pre-existing biases. So if you like a little detective work sprinkled on your dark and depressing exploration of an abandoned town, which who doesn't, maybe dust your old Wii off for a little bit, or at least update the plugins in your Dolphin emulator. This is one modern SH game that deserves a lot more love, and I can assure you that was incredibly hard for me to say. Come on, son, finish it. I am ashamed to be your father. Just like gameplay and story, Shattered Memories has a lot of really impressive things to offer graphically speaking. If you'll remember, I was pretty let down when Silent Hill 4 The Room had such bland, middle of the road lighting, and I'm here to say Shattered Memories more than makes up for that. The real time, perspective correct shadows cast by your flashlight are very impressive and even outshine RE Darkside Chronicles, which used to be my benchmark for how good lighting could be on the Wii's meager resources. Of course, they're not perfect, and you will see objects casting shadows onto parts of the environment in very odd ways or weird angles, but 99% of the time, the lighting engine had me totally impressed. On top of this, it's clear that a lot of time was spent on facial animations, and without looking into it too much, I would assume some type of motion capture work was done to get this effect, because these animations are pretty spot on most of the time. Of course, I did come across some animatronic looking conversations, but overall, this game seems to follow in the footsteps of its forefathers as far as graphical benchmarks go. Texture work in SM is pretty passable in my opinion, meaning there wasn't anything that particularly blew me away, but at the same time, I never saw any blurry work or anything that stood out as low quality or effort. But that description only goes for the 3D texture work. The 2D art on display here is doing something I genuinely haven't ever seen before in a 480p game phones out. As you move around Silent Hill, you'll find all kinds of assets, from flyers plastered on walls to signposts and magazines, 
and I was blown away when I found that each and every one of these 2D objects can be zoomed in on revealing incredibly high res assets. In fact, they're so high res that every piece of text in these advertisements and men's rune graffiti is totally legible. I feel like this requires some very serious custom made scaling operations going on in the background since this is not the case when you're just looking around unzoomed in. And if you're looking for it, you can kind of catch the process taking place as you zoom in on something. Honestly guys, I had no idea this was even possible on a game running on the Wii. I mean, these are some of the most high res 2D assets I've ever seen before. And keep in mind, there's text in the RE2 remake that is nowhere near as readable as even the most small, insignificant piece of paper in SM. No joke, I examined every little thing I came across, and it never got old zooming in on some old worn sign and perfectly making out exactly what it says. Look, I know I'm harping on about this one feature here, but damn, I really just can't comprehend a game running at such a low internal resolution, but having such complicated scaling and such high res assets going on inside of it. Color me impressed. Other than the mind-blowing 2D stuff, the town of Silent Hill is really well designed and does an amazing job of capturing that initial SH design while putting its own little twist on things. I mean, the place still feels like a ghost town somewhere around New England, but the devs shine their own little light on it, and I like that. A practice I probably would not have been so happy about had this not have been pushed so hard as a reimagining. I think the ice effect that replaced the rust and chain link look of the other world is cool on paper, but in practice it just kind of simplifies the environment and doesn't really add a lot. That being said, it's pretty cool watching the world change around you in real time, an effect I'm sure tax the absolute hell out of the Wii's tiny little amount of memory. Just like the high res 2D art, it's clear a lot of effort was put into designing certain interior areas in a relatively realistic way. The insides of cars and puzzle elements are all pretty convincing, and everything is where you'd expect it to be, which is a good thing when you'll have to interact with these elements a fair amount. Overall, for a 480p game from a bygone era, Shattered Memories impressed the absolute hell out of me with its presentation. Sure, on the surface, it's got what I would call an expected look to its graphics, but underneath that surface level, there's some real magic going on. Of course, nothing is perfect, and there were a few hiccups I noticed. Slowdown is a pretty common affair here on the Wii version of the game, which is understandable in the areas where the regular and other world versions of the environment are both loaded into memory, but that's kind of annoying nonetheless. On top of that, there were these odd hitches while the game was loading mid-cutscene. What is this place? Is this? It's a boat. It's like a car, but goes on water. I think it loads dialogue specific to the choices you made, which would explain why it needs to load before certain parts of a conversation, but since I'm playing this off of a pretty crappy mechanical hard drive, the dialogue loading in would skip or repeat to make up for it having to spin up and look for the data. I imagine those of you playing off a real disc probably won't encounter this same bug, so I wouldn't worry about it. And since we have a lot to cover in this department, let's hurry up and move on to my favorite part of these videos, covering the ports. Shattered Memories hit a fair amount of platforms in its day, and since I've been on a huge PS2 kick lately, well, let's start there. And I'm happy to report this release cuts no corners that I've been able to find. The real-time shadows and high-res 2D assets are all here, and there have been zero concessions made, minus one very small detail. It's more common than not for Wii games to run at 480p, but as some of you will already know, the PS2 was more of a 480i platform. So you'll see a noticeable drop in detail thanks to the halved vertical resolution, but if you're playing on a CRT, this will be way less obvious. Another very small bump in the road comes from displaying that interlaced picture on a modern display. As you guys will likely know by now, I feed all of my retro video through the Frame Meister for the purposes of upscaling, and despite what others say on the matter, I think it does a killer job at deinterlacing 480i. That being said, it does have its downsides. The adapted deinterlacing used here typically does its job without issue, but games with a lot of slowdown show combing artifacts way more often than games that hit 60 frames per second more often. Not really sure why that is, but every once in a while you'll see these interlocking lines on parts of the picture that are in motion. Aside from that, there's a very clear increase in the amount of slowdown you'll see in wide open areas, which I think was the result of a very mediocre porting job. Don't get me wrong, it was awesome to see no graphical elements were left on the cutting room floor, but the PS2 had software and hardware advantages over the Wii that should have made something like this very doable at 60 FPS. Which is probably for the best, since I can't recommend this version, as for some reason its price has hit the atmosphere in the secondhand collecting market. I have issues spending more than 20 bucks on a retro game. Over 100 would likely kill me. So let's move on to a much more interesting and reasonably priced release. 
Now, I'll admit to being very impressed by the original Wii version of SM, but I did not in a million years expect for every single graphical trick to make it into the PSP port. The shadows, progressive scan resolution, high-res 2D assets, scaling, it's all here and working perfectly. Of course, as you might expect, the 3D textures are definitely more muddy, and I can't tell for sure, but I think the 3D models are a little less complex, but hot damn is this a good looking portable title. And in a cool little twist, I recently snagged myself an open source scan converter, a line multiplier that I honestly thought I'd never get into, but now that I have it, man I wish I would've grabbed it sooner. It may suck ass at dealing with interlaced content, but it handles progressive resolutions like a dream. After getting to know the settings a little, which admittedly was a nightmare, I was able to pull an amazingly sharp picture out of my PSP using its component output into the OSSC for line doubling, and then that output going into the FrameMeister for zooming. Without a doubt, you guys are going to be seeing way more OSSC footage here in the future, but you didn't come here for all that. Instead, let's take a look at all three contenders side by side. As you can see, the Wii has the highest fidelity picture, but the PSP's amazing video output has the Wii beaten sharpness, even if it's only due to a lower operating resolution. Honestly, I'd have a hard time recommending any one of these as the definitive best way to play the game. I'd say the PSP version gets my vote simply for the novelty of it, but I really can't deny how great the Wii release looks. I imagine those of you running CRTs in your setup would likely get an even more appealing picture here with any of these options, so I guess just go with what works best for you and rest assured this is one of the most impressive titles I've ever covered here given the context. Sure, there are plenty of great looking PS2 titles, the earlier SH games definitely included, but even those classics can't hold a candle to some of the downright amazing things going on under the hood here. Now, it's totally possible that all of this will only matter to people like me who have a hardcore interest in graphical tricks like this, but I'd say if you're even a little curious about these kind of things, Shattered Memories more than deserves your attention. Stop talking! You can't talk me out of this! I'm not here to stop you! So, I guess it should be obvious by now, but I wholeheartedly recommend Shattered Memories. I was really down on the idea of recreating Silent Hill 1 for obvious reasons, but I'm very happy to say that this game is an amazingly good time regardless. I don't think the original property did much of anything for the finished product outside of providing a few character names, but all that aside, I had a really good time with this one. It did some pretty interesting stuff with its story, nailed the somber atmosphere it was going for, and accomplished some truly groundbreaking technical effects. If there were one modern SH game that would make me let go of my negative bias, it would be this one. And I think that might explain a bit of my revelry here. I went into this game absolutely expecting to hate it, and every positive thing I saw and experienced started to stack exponentially. I can't guarantee that those of you who have no strong feelings either way will get the same effect, but I'm certain you guys who line up on my side of the original versus modern SH argument will like what's on offer here. And I guess that's about all I have to say on the subject, but I appreciate you guys sitting down and sharing your time with me, and here's hoping I see all of you again right here on the Silent Hill Retrospective. You seem to see the creepy and everything. Is that a nurse thing or just you? Definitely a nurse thing. We have a unique outlook on life. Whatever happened to Bedside Manor? We still got that. For special cases. Silent Hill Homecoming came about at a very odd spot in the SH timeline. At the time, we fans knew that Team Silent would no longer be working on the series, but I think there was still an air of hope surrounding the franchise. Sure, we had seen some potholes in the road previously, but honestly, that's to be expected. Every series is going to have entries that don't work as well as the others, and even though Western developers now had control of the Silent Hill series, there was still a chance we could get something worthwhile out of their efforts. After all, Silent Hill is a beloved name in video games. Those people working on the next one would no doubt be fans of the originals, and as such, we could probably expect them to keep the core of those earlier titles alive, right? Bartlett, I need to talk to you. Yeah? Well, make an appointment in my office. Yeah, well, I assume most of you know how that went. The team working on Homecoming was Double Helix, an amalgamation of other dev teams caught up in mergers and acquisitions. And while the sum of their parts had made some pretty awesome properties, together Double Helix was responsible for maybe one good title throughout their time in the industry. So we knew not to expect too much from these guys as far as a AAA release went, but luckily writing a game's story doesn't require a multi-million dollar budget and a team full of talented creators. All we could hope for at this point was for at least a portion of the staff to be intimately familiar with the source material and have a real drive to write a genuine Silent Hill story. 
So let's talk about how that didn't happen. What's that guy doing? At this point in the retrospective, you guys are hopefully well aware that I hold the original three games in the Silent Hill series in very high esteem. I think they were a perfect combination of psychological horror and religious elements. They spoke to a very understanding of American horror tropes and seem to have been filtered through a lens made up of equal parts Twin Peaks and some low-budget cult documentary, so it probably won't come as a shock that I don't think Homecoming did a good job of emulating that style. That being said, there were a few elements that I thought made for a very interesting story. The game brings a very unique premise to the table, but at the risk of sounding like a broken record, it just wasn't Silent Hill. But before we get too deep into that, let's talk about what exactly is going on here. The game starts pretty radically with our main character Alex Shepard being rolled on a gurney through some kind of hospital. We learn that he's either current or ex-military as he's asking about the condition of his unit. Mirroring scenes found in Jacob's Ladder the game does a lot to show that this hospital isn't exactly in the business of helping people. Not long after being taken to what looks like an examination room, we witness one of the game's monsters attack the staff and our unarmed protagonist takes this as a very clear sign that he needs to jet. After working our way through the disheveled hospital, our guy finds a kid who he apparently knows, and upon chasing him is thrust into the other world. Then after getting killed by a certain geometrical nightmare, yes, I will be bitching about this later, our protagonist Alex wakes up in the cab of a truck, where we find out that Silent Hill Homecoming takes a step away from the series right off the bat by taking place mostly outside the titular town, which isn't exactly a revolutionary idea in the series, but at least worth pointing out. 75% of the game takes place in Shepherd's Glen, a small town that could definitely take third place in a Silent Hill lookalike contest though. That aside, Alex's arrival teaches us a few key things. First, he's a combat vet who's been gone a pretty long time. Second, the town is much more empty and quiet than it used to be, and third, Alex doesn't exactly like being here. After returning home, we find Alex's mom is more or less catatonic, and it seems like she's not going to be helping him with his goal of finding his brother and getting the hell out of Dodge. From here, we're introduced to a pretty extensive cast of characters in Silent Hill standards, and it becomes clear that whatever's happening here in Shepherd's Glen, certain members of the town are either involved or actively covering it up, which seems like a pretty futile effort when most of the town's population is missing and there are bloodthirsty abominations roaming the streets. Either way, Alex is committed to finding his little brother, but it seems like finding out just what's happening keeps getting pushed higher and higher up the priority list. As the game goes on, we're treated to flashbacks that paint Alex's home life as not quite ideal, but they also hint at him being a lot closer to the odd events of present than he first thought. And as far as general setups go, well, that's about it. The baseline standard of OG Silent Hill stories withstanding, it's not the worst attempt to date, but before we get into my issues with this tale, we're going to need to dive a little bit deeper than some of you might be willing to go. If you haven't played Homecoming yet or you don't want all the reveals spoiled for you, click the link in the description or skip to the timestamp on screen. Alright, on to the spoilers. Okay, so to make sure we're all on the same page still, Alex is back in his old hometown specifically to get his little brother and get the hell out. But his brother appears to be missing along with his dad, and his mom has proven to be less than helpful. As our trek continues, we find out that our relatives aren't the only ones going missing, and this mystery is actually pretty good at keeping me engaged at this point. There were these tiny bits of breadcrumbs here and there hinting at certain prominent figures in the town being involved in some very odd shit, but you gotta wait damn near till the end for any of this stuff to get resolved, and that's a little too long to spring a player on with almost nothing in between. For those of you that were patient enough to wait till the end, we learned that Alex was never a war vet. In fact, he never even enlisted. All the time he spent away from Shepherd's Glen was actually in a mental institution. See, the reason Alex can't find his brother is because his brother's dead. Now, I know everybody probably saw that coming, but what you might not have seen coming is the fact that Alex is the one that caused that death. That is, if you had never played Silent Hill 2 before. Yet, we got the old James Sunderland tango to deal with here, only Homecoming wasn't happy with just one big endgame reveal. Not long after the whole brother being dead thing, we find out that Shepherd's Glen was actually established by members of Silent Hill's demon-worshipping cult looking to leave the religion. As the story goes, these cult members cut a deal with their comrades, requiring them to sacrifice their children at specific intervals, and it seems like Alex was the next in line. But when he accidentally caused the death of his little brother, their dad tried to use his already dead son as a stand-in. Now, to be honest, this is a very, 
very cool premise, and in any other media this would have been a home run for me. After all, I love cult stuff, and I get a huge kick out of media that takes horrifying fantasy ideas and plops them down in believable modern settings. However, there are two big issues with this approach, at least in my opinion. First off, the whole Alex causing Josh's death and forgetting about it thing would have been a lot more interesting if it weren't a shot-for-shot -shot copy of Silent Hill 2's plot. Now, I know SH2 didn't invent the concept, but at this point in the series, every single Silent Hill entry past four had been a tale of a main character experiencing a traumatic event, coming to Silent Hill, and then dealing with their baggage. Maybe in another property, this could have been a novel approach, but here in the SH universe, it was just another entry in a long list of attempts at snagging some of Jane Sunderland's nerd cred. Now, all that withstanding, I'm more than willing to look past this obvious attempt at copying the one and only Silent Hill game anyone seems to think exists, as long as there's a killer story attached to it. I think I proved in my Shattered Memories review that I can appreciate a cool story regardless of the aforementioned copy job, but there's one more major issue here, and it's a big one. See, every aspect of Homecoming's story is based on an egregious misunderstanding of Silent Hill's lore. Of course, I'm not such a canon snob that I can't appreciate a good spooky campfire tale, but when you draw so heavily from pre-existing lore, you at the very least have to understand that lore. See, in Homecoming, it's the death of Josh and the breaking of the deal that causes the resident demonic infestation. All of the monsters and the other world transitions are caused not by the town of Silent Hill and its spiritual power, but by the god the cult worships, or possibly the cult itself, it's really never made clear. Now a casual fan may not see the issue here, and for obvious reasons, but just in case you haven't seen the other entries in this retrospective, the cult's god has no such power. It essentially exists in fantasy, it's a concept that's able to be drawn into this world after the cult corrupted the spiritual power emanating from Toluca Lake, and even then it required the use of a very powerful psychic. Common tropes in the SH games like Monsters and the Otherworld are all side effects of that power being used for demonic purposes, and it never acts on its own. In every game in the series, this power reacts to a character's own inner need for resolution. In one, the Otherworld was a result of Alessa's inner torment leaking into the real world thanks to her split persona. All of the monsters that inhabited the town represented negative aspects of her life as a comatose burn victim. In two, the town reflected James Sunderland's internal desire for punishment derived from the guilt of killing his wife. And in three, Heather being a copy of Alessa, she was still pregnant with the cult's god. A combination of her latent psychic abilities and the very real fetal demon god mixed with the part of her that remembers her god-awful fate led to the hellish otherworld leaking into reality. But in Homecoming, all the negative things going on are the result of a deal between the two groups not being honored. The monsters roaming Shepherd's Glen are a punishment for the townspeople. It's like the cult of Silent Hill is weaponizing the spiritual power of the town, but that's not something they can do. Later in the game, members of the cult actually come to Shepherd's Glen kind of like foot soldiers, which backs up my theory. All these monsters and horrific events, they aren't coming from someone's damaged psyche nor the result of a botched demonic pregnancy on a psychic. It's like the writers thought that Silent Hill's cult were the ones that wielded this power, like their god had any effect on the real world, which it obviously doesn't thanks to the events of Silent Hills 1 and 3. I mean, if it did have such drastic control here in this world, why would they have needed to birth them here? I know I'm being hypercritical here, but not one bit of this story holds up to even the slightest bit of scrutiny from someone who actually understands the events of the previous games, which it's clear these writers didn't. This one seemingly insignificant part of the story shows a very gross misunderstanding of the rest of the games in the series and further proves my theory that most Silent Hill fans have no idea there are any other games in the series that aren't SH2. It's clear these guys went into this not having much of a clue how established concepts worked and as such started with a very flawed premise. Now this may seem like a little nitpick, but it's like they built the foundation for this story on one very incorrect idea and like you would imagine, Everything springing from that foundation is increasingly shaky the higher it goes. But I do want to continue this complaining session with everyone present, so let's let the first timers back in. For those of you that skipped ahead, I have some real issues with certain events in this game's story, and without revealing any late game spoilers, let's just say the writers likely never got a good ending in a Silent Hill game before. But that wasn't my chief complaint. There are other smaller things that contribute to my overall distaste for what is an otherwise enjoyable narrative, and like the fanboy I am, 
all of them are tied to the rest of the series. One thing previous SH games got right was the isolating feeling they were able to get across. There was only ever a small cast of characters which made the world feel more real. After all, it was very easy to suspend your disbelief when there was never anyone present to see any of the messed up stuff that you saw. And since a majority of these characters were typically working against you, you could never trust a thing they said. In Homecoming, the town is full of people in contrast. There's Alex's mom, his dad, Josh, Curtis, Sam, Elle, Elle's mom, Margaret. Then of course there's Carol, Wheeler, Travis from Origins, and even the movie's version of The Order is here. The town is booming in Silent Hill terms, and that sucks for more reasons than just, it's not like the other games. See, these guys were going for a very similar atmosphere to the other entries in the series, but with a cast so big, you're constantly having confirmation that everything you're seeing is indeed real. And that's the truth. I swear. So you've seen the creatures too. That was a big reason the other games were so effective. Your experience was always up for debate and sometimes an antagonist will call your side of the story into question, making you even more unsure, leading to this ambiguous state where you never truly knew what was real. Homecoming feels more like a big Hollywood horror film with monsters getting a lot of screen time and a small band of down-home Jack and Diane's fighting off the demon horde. On top of this, there are these branching dialogue options that lead to absolutely nothing story-wise. They may give the illusion that there's more than one outcome, but in reality, there are only two times where this is the case. For the rest of the game, anything that isn't the intended option will lead nowhere until you finally exhaust everything but the one choice the writers accounted for. Hey, you're Curtis, right? <laughs> Hello, can I ask you something? I'm busy. Hey man, how's it going? <laughs> this feels so worthless when you're playing and comes across as cheap and shallow and an attempt at winning over modern gamers from its era. At the time, these lame-ass attempts at player engagement were all the rage and very rarely were they done right. Without a doubt, I can say Homecoming is for sure not in that minority. Last of my complaints is the feeling that the writers couldn't quite pick a tone for the game. We go back and forth between attempts at somber lonely atmosphere to a ragtag group resisting a demonic infestation to head-on hostile levels of torture. It's all over the place and maybe one of those parts of the story worked on you, but I have to imagine even this game's fans wish it would have picked one of these many stories. Maybe it could have just been a story about a town under assault after an event led to a sour deal, or a psychological tale concerning a person blocking out traumatic experiences or a story where people torture the main character for no explainable reason. It comes across as disjointed, and most of the time when the story was going in a direction I was liking, it would veer off into some other approach, and this process repeated itself throughout the entire experience. And all of this is even more of a disappointment because there really is a spark of something interesting here. It's a really cool premise that gets brought down every time a needless reference to the previous canon is made. It's like it's constantly taking one really interesting step forward immediately followed by a bland and expected two steps back. I didn't really get into Alex as a character, but he served as a pretty okay avatar for me to experience the story through. He always reacted to a situation like I assume I would given the context, and I started sympathizing with him towards the end. Sadly though, he's surrounded by weaker characters who act irrationally and are never fleshed out enough for us to care much about. Even his main goal of finding his brother becomes dull and old by the middle of the game because we're only ever given one cutscene to humanize him, and it's not exactly what I would call a perfect example of brotherly love. All we have to go on is that Alex claims to love him, but we're never really shown much to cement that in our mind. And I feel like I've railed on long enough here, so I guess all I have to say is the same thing I keep saying in these post-Team Silent videos. This could have been a much more enjoyable story had it not have been attached needlessly to Silent Hill. Sure, it has a million faults, but like I said, it really interested me, and the ending did a number on what I was expecting. That's something I genuinely appreciate. I just wish it would have happened in a game called Shepherd's Glen and not Silent Hill. Oh, and if elected president, I vow to throw everyone who liked having Pyramid Head show up for two cutscenes and having absolutely nothing to do with the story into mandatory re-education camps. Unlike Homecoming's story, its gameplay is rotten right down to its core. It's what I imagine would happen if you ran all the info about Silent Hill's traditionally challenging gameplay into some kind of busted ass AI and hit the modernize button. Instead of roaming a wide open, barely populated small town, 
were led down a very strict linear path with little to no deviation. Instead of the punishing combat found in the earlier titles, we have multi-hit combos with spinning knife strikes, dodge rolls, and counter mechanics. Now I know what you're thinking, damn Jared that actually sounds pretty cool and I kind of agree. Sure it has no place in an SH game, but if done well it sounds like a pretty cool combination. Sadly the combat here is janky to a broken degree and reeks of amateur developers shoehorning in popular mechanics seen in other games at the time. Half the time your dodge will lead to a hit despite the fact that you were still in the middle of your dodge animation. Kind of like these guys had no idea what iframes were. But when you do end up getting through an enemy's defense and line up some offense of your own, you're more likely to push them out of range with your own combo than actually do any real good. To make matters worse, pushing your foe out of range can be dangerous as hell since one single enemy attack can lead to enough stun for four or five subsequent hits. And I can never tell if this is just a pre dial combo or if the computer is randomly picking the most punishing moves all in a row. So what's there to do? Most monsters will guard against your hits, and even more annoyingly, half of them have the ability to knock you to the ground with guard breaking attacks. Well, you do what we always do when a game puts us in situations like this. Cheese the absolute hell out of the mechanics. See, even the game's most powerful melee weapons take more than 8 hits to kill early game enemies, and in that amount of time you've probably taken a big chunk of damage, so you have to counterintuitively rely on the game's weakest weapon. The starting knife given to you in the first area of the game is actually the only weapon you'll need to down every single monster you come across, bosses included. It may be weak as all hell, but it packs a buttload of stun and lets you lock enemies down until they eventually die. Now you would assume this wouldn't work on areas with multiple enemies in the same room, but I honestly had maybe two, three occasions where that second foe would hit me. 98% of the time they just sat there waiting for me to finish the 15 to 20 hits it would take to down their buddy. Even when you go up against monsters that block most of your attacks, you just need to hammer on the light attack button until they wind up for a hit of their own, which you will beat with the knife's low amount of startup frames. Now, in my opinion, this is roundabout the only way to beat the game without being completely frustrated, as it was incredibly stingy with health items and even more so with its laughably low ammo cap. Not to mention the ridiculous amount of serums you'll accidentally use now that the item menu is a radial wheel. The only issue is, it doesn't feel satisfying. During the entire playthrough, I just felt like I was cheating. I often equip less effective weapons just to change things up, but I would always switch back right after I would take a stupid amount of damage from a flurry of attacks that I could have sworn I dodged. Now I know I really came out of the gate swinging here, but unlike other games in the series, Homecoming is mostly combat and that combat is mostly bad. Thanks to the linear nature of both the exterior and interior areas, exploration is out of the question, and as far as puzzles go, 99% of them can be solved with an item found no more than two rooms away. In most survival horror games, running would be an option, and in some rare cases that can be done here, but most enemies are fast as hell and have long range or lunging attacks that will either set you up for further damage or put you in a position where quick time events are necessary. And would you look at that, we just transitioned into another thing that has no place in Silent Hill games. It seems like every turn in Homecoming has you mashing some kind of combination of buttons, and just like the story elements, this is a very clear example of the developers trying their hardest to include every single gaming trend 2008 had to offer. You're likely looking at footage of the PS3 version of Homecoming right now because some saint created a patch for the PC version that among a near infinite amount of other improvements got rid of these god awful butt mashing inclusions. And don't worry we will definitely get into that patch later on in the video. Past the god awful combat and damn near exploitative level of QTEs, we're left with a pretty meh package. Sometimes I would feel that old SH feeling when running around in a great looking section of Shepherd's Glen with all the fog and dilapidated scenery, but then an enemy would show up and I would ready my weapon, leading to a cinematic zoom in to an RE4-esque over the shoulder angle, and I'd start dodge rolling like some Ocarina of Time speedrunner, effectively killing the mood. The typical design of Silent Hill's mostly locked doors, which I really like, becomes incredibly annoying when you attach a very slow animation to them and the transitions to the other world no longer mean having to navigate a new version of your current area because they're only ever implemented halfway through exploring an area, which makes it feel like you're just moving on to another mostly linear path, this time with some new chain link on it. Plus they show up so few times that I can't help but feel like they are only included as visual treats for fans of the movie to squee at. Now take all these issues, put them together, and what do you have? 
Well, a substandard action horror game wearing the skin of a Silent Hill title, but moreover, you have one damn long feeling video game. It may only take 8 or 9 hours your first playthrough, but every time I play this game it always feels like I've been playing it for an eternity. It feels like you go long stretches without any story to lead you on, and there were technical problems that made this stretch out much, much more. If you haven't figured out from the captured footage, I gave the PC version a majority of my attention for this playthrough due to the increased visual fidelity and some extra bells and whistles, but I didn't realize until I was halfway into the game that the save function was completely broken. No matter where I saved on the Steam version, I would always load back into the beginning of an area, almost like the saves were just saving progress up to a certain checkpoint. I don't know if this was just one of those one in a million PC bugs or a common issue everyone has, but since the game is prone to crashing at the start of some cutscenes, I had to replay large parts of this game several times over just to get to the end. So why did I keep playing this busted ass version of the game you might be wondering? Well, don't get me wrong, native 1080p is a very attractive option compared to the muddy internal 720p output of the console versions, but more than anything, I was just looking to play the game at 60 frames per second, and thanks to the aforementioned mod, I was able to do just that. The gameplay experience was noticeably improved at 60fps, but there's only so much you can do to polish a turd, and with that being said, let's see how the console ports fared. Homecoming was released on the major platforms of the day, that being the PS3 and 360, but I honestly never gave those versions too much attention back then. For this video, I grabbed the PS3 port since my 360 finally died on me a little while ago, and right off the bat, the drop down to 30fps gameplay was rough to get used to, especially in a game that requires you to make some quick reads in combat and react with well-timed dodges. Having the frames essentially halves the amount of time I had to react to windups, and even though the knife still cut through mostly everything in the game, I found myself taking a lot of cheap hits. Other than a lessened frame rate, I noticed much more slowdown, but typically this didn't get in the way of actually playing the game. It never seemed to show up in combat, probably due to the tighter camera you get when aiming a weapon, so it was really only noticeable when running around the game world, which is a little annoying, but definitely not the worst thing in the world. One thing that was definitely a welcome change when moving over to the console version was the fact that saves actually worked this time around. It felt really good knowing that if an enemy stun locked me into a cheap death, I could just start from a save point just a few rooms away instead of having to remake a bunch of progress in that area. But really, those were the only differences I found, which is understandable. The 360 and PS3 ran on power PC architecture, so Accurately translating the whole game over to PC was pretty normal and easy to do back then. Overall, I was not thrilled with the gameplay Homecoming had to offer though, no matter what platform it was on. The exploration I expect out of a Silent Hill game just wasn't there, and I don't want to hear anything about bringing the style into a modern era. Even Origins had the good sense to plop the player into a big complicated area and let them navigate their way through the labyrinth. The linear progression here in Homecoming just does not feel right in a Silent Hill game. Adding insult to injury, the scant times you do have to backtrack are contained within the same route that leads from the Shepherd home to the graveyard, so it's not like I could even enjoy the scraps the devs decided to throw me. As for the series staple of challenging puzzles, there were a few that did incorporate more than just mechanical trial and error, but these were very few and far between. Combat is a red hot mess thanks to inconsistent physics, which really drags the experience down because the devs require you to make some frame perfect inputs to do well. The very small amount of leeway granted, mixed with a fluctuating frame rate and constantly varying active frames, makes for an insanely frustrating experience. And while most SH games would allow for avoiding combat, the large size of the enemies and mostly narrow interior areas makes this almost never an option. On top of that, I could not stand the radio menus and separate buttons assigned to the weapon and item inventory screens. Up until the very end of the game, I was still hitting the wrong shoulder button. And even when I did get the menu I wanted, I would flick the thumbstick at the item I needed to use or equip, but sometimes the stick would activate the opposite direction on its trip back to the center, and I would either be holding the wrong weapon, or I'd end up using one of my few health restoring items again. And once again, I'm not sure if this was just me, but it felt like an eternity of gameplay existed between scenes that would advance the plot. I think this may have been one of the hardest games for me to get through, but not because of the difficulty. I mean, once you figure the whole knife thing out, it's pretty smooth sailing up till the end, but instead, I just wasn't having any fun. Which really sucks because there were some brief glimpses of good design dotted all over the place. Times when I fully understood what the game wanted from me and enjoyed doing it, but just as I would feel this game would slow to a crawl or an enemy would lock on to me with an 8 hit combo or I would accidentally use a healing item again. It's actually kind of hard to describe now that I think about it. 
The frustration I kept feeling seemed like it came from the game's nearly unfinished level of bugs and gameplay issues, but in reality it came from constantly having a fun time pulled right out from under my feet. It was like a sawtooth, the game kept going up and down in quality and enjoyment. If it were constantly bad or good, it would be much easier to explain, but that's definitely not the case here. It feels like the developers were made up of two different groups, one that really wanted to make a Silent Hill game, and the other intent on shoving in as many modern game tropes as possible. The only problem being, neither of those groups were very good at making a video game. The bugs, performance issues, and poorly implemented combat just reeks of amateur level game creation, and I honestly can't recommend Homecoming's gameplay because of it. Now, I understand that there may be some of you willing to forgive all that, but coming from someone who lets a lot of stuff slide in the name of story, immersion, or atmosphere, Homecoming is without a doubt not worthy of your time. I know this game has its following, but for the life of me, I just can't understand where you guys are coming from. I really did try with this one, but I just didn't have any fun with it. As far as modern, western-developed SH games go, this is by far the worst one I have played. Silent Hill Homecoming is very much a product of its time as far as presentation goes. While it doesn't run on Unreal Engine like 90% of the games released during its era, it shares a lot of visual quirks with Unreal games. First off, every single part of the game has a glossy shine to it which can be distracting as hell in a game that's supposed to be dark a majority of the time, and it runs like shit. Both the PS3 and PC ports start dropping frames in areas with a lot of fog, and for some reason, just having enemies loaded into the game world seems to drag things to a crawl. And no, I don't mean having several enemies on screen will slow things down. Just having them load in is enough to do the trick. Oftentimes, I would see one of these smog monsters lurch out of the mist, slowing my frame rate down with their presence, and I would turn and run away thinking it would make things run faster, but nope, even when they're well behind Alex and are no longer visible, the slowing effect they have on the game speed is still in effect until you kill them and their bodies disappear. Alex's character model is okay looking, but seems very boxy, kind of like his jacket and pants are a few sizes too big. And on top of that, there was one really interesting thing I noticed. Alex, his dad, and Officer Wheeler are the only characters that have any depth to their facial textures. The rest of the characters have these oddly smooth faces that look very doll-like. I can't really understand why this would be the case. I mean, even major characters have this issue. In the first few minutes of the game, you'll talk to Alex's mom, and it looks like she's recently peeled away most of the layers of her skin on her face. And speaking of faces, it seems like the devs over at Double Helix had no idea how to animate mouths. Alex seems to get away with some very, very simple animations, but other characters like Elle and her mother seem to have very few points of articulation. Their lips wrap under their teeth, and Elle specifically looks like her lips were modeled closed, and the team just warped that same model as a flat line. Kind of makes it look like she's got more duck face than a 2010 Facebook page, though. Officer Wheeler, on the other hand, has almost no animations in his mouth in certain scenes, which never failed to get a laugh out of me. One thing that really bothered the hell out of me were the black levels and dark scenes. Some dark areas looked believably inky and impenetrable, but most others had this hazy gray look to them. Kind of like how it looks when you jack the brightness up on your TV looking at media that was recorded way too dark. This really ruined some parts of the game, and for some reason the gamma slider in the options menu just wouldn't do anything, so I was sort of stuck with these foggy gray areas where it should be pitch black. Finally getting to some compliments though, the town of Shepherd's Glen looks really convincing. The streets and storefronts are all in shambles, and the thick fog that covers the whole place just fits together perfectly. Interior areas can be hit or miss sometimes, but mostly I liked how interesting they looked. If you're really paying attention, you'll see some repeated props and textures, but nothing too egregious in my opinion. Sometimes a cutscene will put you in a position that makes the low resolution 3D objects seem a little more obvious, but using this PC version, we are pushing the game a little further than it was meant to go, so that's understandable. More than anything, I think Homecoming did a great job of laying out a thick and oppressive atmosphere more often than not. Some stuff didn't make any damn sense, like the police precincts looking like it had been left to the ravages of time, despite there still being an active police force, but a majority of the game's areas just look gloomy and effective from a horror perspective. And while I didn't really like the enemy design overall, sexy nurses and pyramid head very much included, I did really like the way some of the bosses looked. There's a good amount of body horror going on here, and a few of them do a really good job at mirroring that Silent Hill creature design that we all know and love. Really, the only exception is this lanky doll boss, which just looks kind of basic to me. Oh, 
Like I said before, most of my experience with this game comes from the PC version, and trust me it has some dead serious visual bugs, but thanks to a few patches I was able to find, there was only one major one that showed up here in this last area. And speaking of patches, why don't we talk specifically about the PC experience without them? Being one of the laziest attempts at a PC port, a vanilla install of Homecoming on modern platforms like Steam won't really come with any more visual fidelity than on console. I mean, yes it will of course look a little better here, but changing the resolution is damn near impossible without crashing. If you are able to force a higher resolution though, the shadows don't scale appropriately, and sadly the frame rate remains locked at a sluggish 30fps. On top of this, it was terribly optimized to the point where my fairly respectable Ryzen 7 1700 and GTX 1080 Ti still weren't able to keep it at a locked 30. Since I have a bit of history with this version of the game, I knew right off the bat that I would need a bit of help getting this bad boy running the way I wanted. So after a quick Google search, I was taken to its section, the PC Gaming Wiki. From there, I downloaded these two patches, which both fixed many of the game's issues with crashing and added the visual tweaks I was looking for. Using a DLL injector instead of Homecomings.exe, I was able to get 1080p 60fps working no problem, along with having access to a wider FOV, getting rid of the nasty static slash film grain filter, options for saving anywhere, and multi-sampling and de-aliasing with VSync. Although slowdown was still very much a thing in certain circumstances. Without a doubt, these patches are a must-have when spinning up Homecoming on PC. They definitely can't fix the many, many, many issues this release has, but they do make the experience much easier to stomach. But we should at least give a little bit of attention to the way most people saw the game at launch. The PS3 original, as expected, is a much lower res, blurry affair, and sadly this lack of resolution does not mean a smoother frame rate. Even at a lock 30 frames per second, this game slows down every chance it gets. Getting used to dropping from playing the game at 60fps to 30 was hard enough, but I couldn't even play it at a constant 30. All that being said, I very well may nominate this console version as the definitive way to first experience the game, which seems crazy for me. Sure you might miss the hell out of the added fidelity that comes with 1080p and getting rid of the dumb looking scratchy film grain filter that's over every single frame of this thing, but I don't know, the muddier softer look of the graphics here do a really good job at hiding a lot of the many imperfections. Those porcelain smooth faces I was talking about before don't stand out nearly as much here, and even the spots that force you to get up close and personal with the low res textures don't seem to look half as bad here on console. The save system actually working is a very nice plus, and button overlays actually reflect the controller you're using, which is something sorely missed in the PC port. I know it sounds crazy, but at least in this one instance, the blurrier option seems to be the best option. Of course you knew I wasn't just going to leave you hanging without a comparison, so here's how the two versions of Homecoming look side by side. As you can see, there is a very clear and noticeable difference from one to the other, but trust me when I say you're going to be begging for that console downgrade after just half an hour with this buggy mess of a PC port. You know, after the relatively positive experience I had with Origins and the absolute surprise Shattered Memories gave me, it's a little sad to not like Homecoming even a little. Don't get me wrong, there are a very small number of things it gets right, but most of the time those small accomplishments are left surrounded by poor optimization, buggy effects, badly designed areas, and an absolutely broken combat system. Like I said before, the moments when Homecoming shines tends to make the game much more annoying, since all that does is leave you wishing you could be playing a game that was mostly this good. Since the story has no real effect on any long-running SH canon, except for cementing my theory that western devs have just been remaking Silent Hill 2 over and over again, hoping we won't notice, you're not exactly missing out on anything if you decide to give this one a pass. If anything, the only reason I would say this game should be played is to really contrast how well-made the first four games in the series were. Sure, it may be hard to look at a game running in 480i nowadays, but at the very least that game will look better artistically, play better, and run smoother than anything you're likely to see here. So maybe Shepherd's Glen was a wasted stop on our little trip through the events surrounding Silent Hill's sordid past, but make sure to stick around, because next up we'll be checking out the game most fans of Modern SH swear by. Now of course until then, I hope to see all of you again right here on the Silent Hill Retrospective. Well, hello there guys. Thanks for sticking through this one, and thank you so much for all the love and support you always seem to throw my way. Please, please stay safe in this very unsure time, and make sure to cancel any unneeded expenses if you're hurting for money right now. 
That means if you support me on Patreon or sub to me on Twitch, please take that money and put it towards keeping you and your family safe. Don't get me wrong, I really appreciate the support, but you guys gotta make sure you and yours are taken care of before little old me. Everyone, keep safe, and I will see all of you next time. If I were to say that the Silent Hills series has had a bit of a downturn since Team Silent was disbanded, I'm sure there wouldn't be too many people in disagreement. But throughout the process of covering the more recent SH titles, I've heard one thing fairly often. It seems like a majority of you guys feel like Downpour is the most well put together SH game to come out of the post Team Silent era, and while I'd love to agree or disagree, I've actually never played it. So today is going to be my first time in this version of that forgotten little town by the lake, and well, I guess it would be nice to have a bit of company, just in case this doesn't turn out to be the trip everyone says it is. So, if you're willing to strap in and brace for a new look at that old town you're so familiar with, well, I'd love to have someone watching my back. So, now that that's settled, ladies, gentlemen, welcome to Silent Hill. From the very start, it seemed like Downpour was destined for a future as an SH2 clone. The goal from day one was to create a standalone story that featured a random assortment of characters drawn to Silent Hill instead of focusing on the cult or already established plot points in the series, which seems a little redundant to say as it's been the go-to move for any developer touching the series since Team Silent was disbanded, but I guess it's a working formula and if it works I can't knock it too much, right? Other than keeping up the status quo in the series, development seemed to go relatively smoothly. This time around, Vatra Games would be at the helm, a company that doesn't exactly have the kind of street cred normally required to start developing for one of Konami's most popular IPs. I'd honestly love to figure out why a company made up of businessmen looking to make money would trust such a financially important franchise to such an untested candidate, but at the time it seems like Konami was saying yes to anyone with the funds to put together a PowerPoint presentation. But hey, I'm not a total asshole, I'm willing to give these guys a shot. Besides, who knows, maybe they did what no one else has been able to do so far. Maybe they penned a very authentic feeling Silent Hill story. Or maybe it's a total piece of garbage. Did I? I think I just created Schrodinger's plot. These clothes, I didn't... Is this not a sick joke to you? No, I, I swear. Silent Hill Downpour occupies a very odd space as far as these non-Team Silent SH games go. It isn't what I would call a quintessential Silent Hill narrative, but it does actually tell a pretty interesting story. And I know what you're thinking, a good story is a good story, so why criticize it? Well, first off, that's kind of what I do here, but more importantly, when you take on a project that exists within a larger narrative, you have a bit of a responsibility to stay within that established world. In my opinion, this is not what Downpour did, but it kind of did? It's hard to explain, but before we start breaking it apart, let's look at what it really is and appreciate it for that. In Downpour, you play as Murphy Pendleton, a guy serving what seems like a pretty long sentence in prison. The game opens with Murphy making his way to the showers, where it looks like he's made a bit of a deal with the guard to get him in the room with this guy. As Murphy proceeds to have a bit of a boot party with Chubby here, it seems clear that there's some history behind this beating. This doesn't seem to be your average jailhouse ass kicking, and on top of that, there seems to be some conditions for the guard's involvement. All things considered, this is a pretty killer opening if you ask me. After this scene, we're taken to what seems like a resulting prison transfer, and a CO that seems to hate Murphy just a bit more than everyone else does. During the trip, the prison bus crashes in Silent Hill, and when he comes to, Murphy does the only logical thing one can do, and legs it the hell out of there. In the first few minutes of exploring the foggy town, Murphy gets to experience all of the typical Silent Hill trappings that makes it such a wonderful vacation town. You know, crossing over into a hellish nightmare reality, talking to townspeople who refuse to speak any language other than vague riddles, you know, the usual. During his travels, he comes across a few people that seem to be just a little more messed up than him and even finds out the female CO from his bus is still alive and determined to recapture him, sometimes at the risk of her own life. And as far as setups go, this is pretty much it. A prisoner gets lost in Silent Hill and must make his way out of the town while metaphorically making his way through all of his own mental baggage. Certainly not an uninteresting take on things, but it is the same song and dance we've seen since Konami pulled the plug on this franchise. And while I do love seeing developers take cues from one of my favorite games of all time, I also can't help but wonder if there are any people currently working in the video game industry who are aware of the fact that there are at least a few other titles in the Silent Hill series that aren't SH2. 
And yes, I have complained about that a million times, so we're not going to waste a lot of time on that, but I've only given you the surface level stuff so far. There's still more of this story to discuss, but I've got some good news and some bad news for you. The good news is there are parts of this story that I really, really liked, but the bad news is we're going to have to spoil some things in the process. So if you're looking to experience this game for yourself, maybe click the link in the description to get past all the spoilers or skip to the timestamp on screen. Okay, so now the formalities are done with, let's jump back in. So we know our guy Pendleton was in jail and is currently navigating the twisting nature of some kind of repressed mental anguish. So what's up with that? Well, as you play the game, there are hints that are relatively subtle for the most part, but you start to get the feeling that whatever happened, it was between him and his son, until a little past the halfway point, you finally get the whole picture, or a portion of the whole. It seems like at some point Murphy's son was drowned and maybe molested, although I'm not too sure on that last part. There are a few lines in the game about Murphy hating child molesters and Napier, the guy who killed his son, was a child molester, but I don't remember anything in the game definitively saying that his kid was molested. Anyways, after the guy who killed his son was caught and sentenced, Murphy managed to get himself in the same prison by stealing a cop car and leading the police on a high-speed chase across state lines. Once inside, he made connections with a CO who offered to get him in a room alone with his son's killer, who, by the way, was also Murphy's neighbor. But he's not doing it for free. The guard apparently wants Murphy to take out a fellow co-worker of his who's been keen on ratting him out for all the illegal things he's been up to with the inmates. Knowing all of this does give a lot of context to some of the things Murphy would see in the other world and in Silent Hill in general. The theme of water being prevalent makes a lot of sense now, and if it wasn't apparent, this guy here is Murphy's pyramid head stand-in as a physical manifestation of his desire for revenge and how close he came to becoming a monster in order to kill one. Later on, we find out that Officer Cunningham, the cop with the hard-on for justice, is actually the daughter of the CO that Murphy had to kill in order to get his favor. So all in all, this isn't the worst video game story I've ever played through. In fact, I really enjoyed the darker revenge focus that it had. And while I didn't care for Murphy very much as a character, the shit he was going through was sympathetic and interesting. And if that's where things ended, this would be an overall positive, but there is more to discuss. But let's let the gang back in before we tackle that. So, for the rest of you just coming back, I actually enjoyed a lot of what Downpour's story had to offer, but there are things going on here that I really didn't like. For example, instead of having the player's choices tracked in the background like in previous games, Downpour has a more modern moral choice mechanic, like many of the games of its day. Throughout the game, there will be moments where you're given a few decisions to mull over, accompanied by an on-screen display that, if you know me, you know is not my preferred way to handle these things. However, aside from breaking immersion by having bright, colorful button prompts on screen, there is another issue here. By having these moments be so few and far between, the whole morality mechanic sort of fades out of sight for a majority of the playthrough, which makes it really weird when it pops back up again. The beauty of playing games like SH2 for the first time is that you likely aren't very sure how the game is grading you in the background, and you may have no idea how it is you got the ending that you got. This made it feel more like you were getting a story that was kind of custom tuned to your personality or play style. When you give a player these minute decisions to make as an in-game mechanic right in front of their face, you make sure that they won't make their own decisions, but instead they'll try and shoot for a specific ending. Instead of the player asking themselves, well, what would I do in this situation? They're asking themselves, well, do I want the good ending or the bad one? It goes from the game silently judging you in the shadows to you purposefully manipulating a mechanic. And for those of you that don't know why this may be a bad thing, let me spell it out a little more clearly. When you're immersing a player in a deep, dark story like those you're going to find in an SH game, it's a very good idea to severely limit the amount of things that would remind the player they are indeed playing a video game. And I can't think of something more immersion-breaking than having a physical representation of your game controller shown on screen. Not only is it very unsilent hill, in my opinion, but it also works against the tone Downpour often excels at. On top of that, I really didn't like this game's version of Silent Hill's Other World. Now, I want to be clear from a design and artistic standpoint, there are some really cool things going on here. The almost diorama look it has when in motion is really cool, and I liked a lot of the scenery that these guys came up with, but I liked it in a very general sense. When I hold it up to the rest of the games, it just doesn't do its job quite as well in my opinion. The Other World in Silent Hills 1 through 3 served to deliver very vague visual messages to the player. As James descended into his own mind, for example, you saw the world twist and degrade, as if to say the further beneath the surface you dig in this guy's brain, the more trauma and insanity you're likely to see. 
In Downpour, I feel like these areas are made not so much to tell a visual story, but more to show off some really cool design ideas. And like I said before, I like a lot of those ideas. Having areas with impossible physics and upside down room layouts can look really, really interesting, but they feel kind of hollow, kind of like a badly designed movie set where things do indeed look creepy, but it looks creepy on purpose. Almost like you can see the set designer trying to come up with spooky designs if you squint hard enough at it. Now, I'm more than willing to admit that this may be a personal hang up because aren't they always? but I'm just a bit bothered by stage and game designs that appear to be more interested in selling cool ideas instead of crafting a world that feels real in the context of the game itself. Not to go back to the original Silent Hill again, but in Silent Hills 1 and 3, the other world was very harsh and, and sharp and jarring, and the point was to show the torment and physical pain and anguish that Alessa was going through, but it wasn't cool looking in a sense. There was nothing really interesting or awesome about seeing chain link and rusted metal. It just told the story correctly and put you in that world. But in Silent Hill Downpour, I just can't shake the feeling that we're looking at something that some designer somewhere thought was really cool. And I know I'm rambling a lot, but I really struggle to explain this accurately. So if that makes any sense to you, awesome. If it doesn't, well, I guess that makes sense. To be honest, I had similar issues with areas in Resident Evil Revelations too. Like, sure, having bloody chains with hooks on them hanging from the ceiling is always good for a scare, but what the hell is the purpose for them being there? To be honest, I have issues explaining this out loud, like I said, and now that I'm having to do it, it sounds even dumber. So I guess let's put it this way. If you're selling me on a realistic looking game world, there has to be a reason behind the design of that world. If the only justification for the creepy water slide slash rusty cage world the developers thought it would look cool, then things will look and feel about as shallow as that sounds. Now, I'm positive some of you are ready to point out the symbolism in every single thing I've complained about, and no, I'm not so dumb that I can't see the correlation between a guy who's been in prison and his nightmares containing cages. My issue with that is that the cage theme feels like set dressing. Call me a fanboy because I definitely am, but I just can't help but feel like Team Silent would have been able to weave this kind of a motif into their environment designs very naturally instead of having it exist in the foreground right in front of the player's face. And like I said before, I do think this is a personal hang up, but one that bothered me enough, I felt like I had to talk about it. Besides, every once in a while I get a comment from one of you guys saying you had the same issue, and that goes a long way in keeping me from feeling like the last sane man in a world gone mad. Other than these small things, I will say some elements of the plot felt very on the nose, or maybe cheap might be a better word for it. No! This isn't my son! This thing's a monster, a murderer! Yes, well, I suppose that runs in the family. Sure, the whole revenge is something that will eat you up if you harbor it for too long thing. It's relatable and interesting, but it does feel a little pedestrian when compared to previous games dealing with some very dark subject matter like killing your wife out of equal parts love and resentment or aborting the actual fetus of some kind of elder god. Maybe it's just me, but a lot of downpour feels like a good idea that maybe could have been expanded on further. I wouldn't call it low effort or badly done, but more like it was an idea that could have benefited from a little more contemplation. Instead, we got a pretty boilerplate narrative. A cool one, but boilerplate all the same. The last complaint, and what's starting to sound like an incoherent ramble, is the fact that there are a lot of holes in this story, and it seems like 99% of them were put there by the devs on accident. In accounting for player choice, the developers obviously included endings that would have Murphy and friends making wildly different decisions throughout the game, but Sadly, those endings often negate a solid portion of the story told to you so far. For example, if you get the ending where Murphy was not responsible for anyone's death, you might be left scratching your head as you just played through 10 to 12 hours of Murphy dealing with all the people he killed. And not just implied stuff, he will actually admit to murders he never committed. Now, this kind of oversight might be excusable for an indie game with one sole developer, but if you spend more than a few million dollars making a product, I don't expect mistakes on this kind of a scale. Just like I kind of expected to like at least one of the characters in this game, but that just was not the case. Murphy annoyed me more than anyone else with his constant mutterings to himself, although I will give credit where it's due, this is a much better way to deal with giving the player instructions while still immersing them in the game world. I like to call it the Max Payne effect. Officer Cunningham was completely unlikable by design, and the mailman character kind of messes up the previously established nature of Silent Hill. The DJ not only has a relatively dumb place in the story, but 
also makes it seem like the town is a sentient being that demands constant songs being played on the radio. Owen oh, also uses a telephone to communicate with people, which is dumb for several reasons I hope don't need to be explained. The nun is literally just speaking video game plot language, which means she doesn't say anything a real person in her position would say, but instead says things that would only make sense to a third party who's already figured these things out, aka us the players. And the less said about these kids, the better, trust me. Oh, it's just you. So to close out this gigantic, pointless rant, I really did like Downpour's overall setup and even enjoyed the direction it went in in the end. It's not the kind of story that challenges the player very much, and it doesn't have a whole lot going on once you dig under the surface, but it is entertaining, even if it does a very predictable job. So I guess you might be wondering why there has been such a negative slant for this section. Well, in making this retrospective, the goal wasn't to take each game and judge them as their own entities. I wanted to not only revisit some absolute gems from my past, but also hold them up against where the series has gone since I stepped away from it. And it sucks to say this, but even a good story is made worse when held up to the genius that is the stories from the first three games. So I guess you might have a bit of a decision to make here. Either you take a sharpie and scribbled out the first part of the game's title, and proceed to enjoy the game as a dark and entertaining if not predictable tale, or you take it as an entry in a series and use the full context of the situation to form an opinion on where it lies in that series. Now I'm not saying one or the other is the right way to go. Obviously, I choose to stick with comparing it to its namesake, but no one's going to blame you if you're just looking to kill some time and stay relatively entertained when you start a video game up. So it seems like I have some feelings about this story, but none of them tread even a little outside of totally subjective territory. So I can't really recommend experiencing this tale or the inverse, but I can say that if you do decide to totally leave behind any and all previous knowledge of the originals, you very well may find a cool little story here. Nothing too taxing or complicated, but it's good enough, and honestly, that's not the worst thing I've said about modern Silent Hill narratives. So let's chalk this one up as a win. Bless you, child. I understand this must be very confusing for you. Now here's where things get a little weird. Based on my very limited knowledge going into this game, I assumed it would be the story that really bothered me, but to be honest, it was pretty okay, all things considered. Not exactly my favorite tale ever told, but it did a good job at keeping me interested. So believe me when I say I wanted this to end up as a positive surprise for me. I wanted to come out of this talking about how I wished I would have gotten on board with Downpour years ago. But you'll notice I'm not saying that. Alright, let's get into it. Downpour differs from mainline SH games in a few major ways. Instead of following the typical approach, and for those of you that don't know, the typical approach is you walk around a small section of the town until you find an interior location that essentially acts like a self-contained dungeon. After you find your way to the end, you get dumped back into the town, and through a bit of exploration, you find the next house or building you're looking for. And Downpour definitely does not follow that model. In fact, it's a much more open world type of approach. Past the very start of the game, you have access to a large portion of the map, and while you can go directly to locations that will further the main story, you can also explore the town, finding secret areas, side missions, and new gear. And on paper, I think that idea works really well. My favorites in the series, parts 1 and 3, felt like the town was really open to me despite them actually being very linear. So this game seems to be the next logical step in evolution of SH gameplay in that sense. Or at least it would be if there weren't a few very noticeable and very very glaring flaws getting in the way. And number one with a big ass circle drawn around it is the game's graphics, or more precisely its design and color palette. The entire game takes on this blue and gray tone when you're outdoors, and the design of the town could be incredibly repetitive. Take that and mix it with the labyrinthian design of this place with its roadblocks and alleyway shortcuts, and it can be incredibly difficult to tell one area of the town from another. I got lost a lot just trying to figure out where to go next, and the map does not keep track of some of the smaller passageways, so I'd be standing there trying to figure out how I can use this one dilapidated house as a landmark in a sea of dilapidated houses. And it is important to note that the original games had convoluted paths set up by roadblocks and alleyways as well, but those games would take note of alternate passageways once you discovered them by drawing them in on your map, and inside buildings, Downpour will mostly do the same, but once you get outdoors, all bets are off. 
Now, getting lost in a big open world isn't the worst thing, and oftentimes it's how you stumble across cool ass secrets like this recreation of the apartment from SH4, but, and this is the kicker, I just did not enjoy exploring this version of Silent Hill. There's never really a worthy reward for exploration. I mean, sometimes I'd find a side quest that would give me a weapon for completing it, but that weapon's gonna break just like any other weapon, and thanks to respawning enemies, I was more likely to use all of its endurance on the way to my next target than not. So instead of making me feel free with its open world, Downpour just had me frustrated when I'd come across houses or buildings that would contain nothing but healing items that I never really came close to running out of anyways. And without a doubt, that is a very bad thing. I mean, having an open world where the player has no real incentive to explore it, that's a pretty big failing as far as gameplay and design goes, but most annoying of all is actually the game's performance in these outdoor sections. So I'm gonna say something, and it's going to sound like absolute hyperbole, but I promise you it is not. Downpour is the worst performing video game I have ever played on the PS3, bar none. And usually I would save this kind of a critique for the presentation part of the video, but this game is so poorly optimized that it actually affects playability. Getting lost in a big open world you aren't keen on exploring can be a little frustrating, but nowhere near as bad as turning a corner and having a combination of slowdown in the single digit territory and screen tearing disorients you to the point where you have no idea where you are and where you came from. I legitimately had several times where I was backtracking for minutes on end because I just couldn't get my bearings thanks to slowdown, screen tearing, and samey looking environments. But I would eventually make my way to the next area, and once inside things would become both better and worse in a few ways. Performance would sometimes be much better, but that was inconsistent at best. Some places would have enemies spawning in no matter how long I was there for, which I guess in a regular game wouldn't be that big of a deal, but I spent a lot of time in these areas a little lost or backtracking for puzzle items, which meant I fought a lot, and that means I broke a lot of weapons, which meant I spent a lot of my time looking for weapons, so not only was I lost and looking for items, but I was desperately trying to grab weapons, and if the combat system was satisfying, or at least worked as well as intended, then that would actually be a point in the game's favor, but sadly that is most certainly not the case. But we are going to discuss that later. In the meantime, you'll notice I said that I was getting lost a lot, and that's mostly because reused assets are far more prevalent inside buildings than they are outside. And trust me, that is really saying something. Running around an interior area in Downpour will have you coming across the exact same 10 or 11 3D assets and textures non-stop. And normally this wouldn't really be something I'd talk about very much, but when I'm heading upstairs to open a safe but can't find it because the room next door also has the same bed, desk, TV, and chair in the exact same position, but we've got a real problem on our hands here. So there I was, running back and forth in the same old area, having no idea where I was, and running into enemies every few rooms, which meant I was breaking weapons left and right. And I guess that's a good segue to talk about the combat, which is not very good. Without a doubt, the creators of Downpour had a lot of bad ideas, but sadly most of them made their way into the combat. So first up we have degrading weapons, which are always annoying as hell, but doubly so when they degrade way too fast and you can't repair them. I mean, you might only get through two or three fights before your weapon's gonna break, and typically that means grabbing the nearest usable item, and that also means trying to kill a hell demon from the black abyss of Murphy's inner torment with a rock or the leg of a chair. I don't know, it just doesn't track right. And while that is a really big problem in my eyes, it's the least of my issues with Downpour. Even taking breakable weapons out of the picture, we're still dealing with a very frustrating combat system. See, the general idea is to attack when there's an opening and block incoming blows, only things never quite work out that way and it's kind of hard to say why most of the time. There's just this inconsistency to how the mechanics of these fights play out. For example, here's me taking care of this asshole with zero issues and losing zero health. and here's me fighting the same enemy in the same situation and getting my ass handed to me. Get away from me. There just seems to be no real predictable patterns to follow most of the time, and besides a wind-up for guard-breaking heavy attacks, you can never really tell what your foe is going to do next. 
And at first, that may not seem like too big of an issue. After all, these games are supposed to incentivize avoiding combat over engaging in it, except this game makes running from monsters just as much of a pain as fighting them. Turning your back on one of these guys inside of a building is essentially a death sentence because they will catch up to you at some point. Outside, it's a little more doable, but the most common enemy in the game has a long-range scream that'll stagger you, and they are not afraid of doing it so far away that you often don't even know where it came from. And things get far worse when you encounter these guys in groups. Each enemy has a move designed to incapacitate you, and most of the time you have to mash buttons to get out of it, and man do they take advantage of that. Group fights should be avoided whenever possible, or maybe you'll get lucky like me where a glitch had every enemy in the game scared shitless of my manly presence, preventing them from doing anything but backing up when I got near. But when that glitch wore off, Downpour went right back to its bullshit. Bullshit like having this monster fly halfway across the map in order to grab me. Honestly, who QA tested this game? Of course, all of this pales in comparison to my most hated enemy in the game, these white things. For some reason, physical attacks just refuse to land on these assholes sometimes. I mean, sure, the animation takes place, but the monster receives no damage, no block, or hits done. So maybe after seeing I can barely hit this thing, I might want to run away, right? But he's much faster than Murphy, and if he drops on me, that's a hard knockdown that'll stop me dead in my tracks. No joke, these things were far more difficult to defeat than the game's main antagonist, the Boogeyman. I mean, look at this. Who thought this was a good idea? Okay, so combat is a bit of an ass, and the open world aspect of the game fell pretty hard on its face right from the start, so how did the Silent Hill staples play out? Well, exploring the interior environments can be interesting, and the puzzles are okay enough, I guess. None of them really got me excited, but they were creative enough and didn't wear out their welcome at any point. I still got lost in these areas, but in all fairness, getting lost in one of Silent Hill's many rundown buildings is kind of a long-running tradition in the series, so nothing new there. If you get too lost, there's a black light you can use that will illuminate footprints or blood trails to point you in the right direction, which is actually a really nice touch. There are a lot of mechanics that feel really out of place in a Silent Hill game, though. First are the balance segments, which just don't work in this kind of game, and second are the quick time events. Now, I realize the series isn't going to stay the same forever, and modern gaming tropes would have worked their way into SH at some point regardless, but this just feels really shallow. Shit! I don't know, it just kind of feels like the head of the project asked his employees to make a list of any and all gaming trends in the 2010s, and then proceeded to put everything on the list in the game. And following in that spirit, the game only allows you to carry one melee weapon and one gun at a time, a trend that was popular back then and for some reason still exists in gaming today. But somehow even this simple concept is broken in downpour. Switching from your melee weapon to a gun will throw the melee weapon on the ground, but with a firearm suddenly Murphy remembers he has an inventory and just puts it away. And if you happen to come across a gun, well get ready for the fun, innovative system Vatra came up with. First you'll need to throw your melee weapon on the ground because fuck inventories, and then you'll have to pick the gun up, then put the gun away, then pick the melee weapon back up. I just don't get it. I mean, there's an in-game inventory, and it would have been pretty damn easy to justify keeping just one melee weapon in there at a time. I'm really not sure if these guys were just committed to the idea of these degradable weapons and no storage space playing into the gameplay in some way, or if they just didn't know how to implement a proper inventory system. And judging by the way they worked with the Unreal Engine, I'm kind of leaning towards the latter. On the plus side, during the game you'll come across some areas that use fixed camera angles, and this seemed to piss off other reviewers, but I kind of liked them honestly. Well, I guess I didn't much like the implementation, more like I just enjoyed someone throwing me a bone in a modern game. With them being so few and far between, it's always jarring as hell walking into one of these rooms that have these angles, but it's not terrible by any means. If anything, it can be a little depressing, kind of like walking through a small portion of what could have been. So, you may have noticed most of this section was negative, and if you ask me, that's fitting, because in my opinion, most of this game's gameplay was very, very bad. It was filled with tropes seen in other games, but it seems like the team didn't have the know-how to successfully transplant those mechanics into their own work. In the brief moments when the game does start to play well, you'll get slapped in the face by performance so bad it jumps right out of small gripe territory and right into heavily dragging down the experience. I mean, sure, a bit of slowdown can be overlooked, hell, I've done it before, but take massive 10 to 20 frame dips, combine them with near constant screen tearing and muddy graphics, and you have one hell of a hard game to enjoy. There were also little issues I had, like the awkward controls that just don't line up with common video game control schemes, on top of the open world feeling lifeless and empty. 
Now, I know that's kind of the Silent Hill thing to do, have an empty ghost town for the player to explore, but this kind of game world just does not inspire me to go out of my way to explore it. Honestly, I skipped most of the side quest content in this game. At first, I would try my best to complete the ones I had come across, but after doing that a few times and getting nothing but a useless weapon and a few health items from these things, I just had no drive to finish anymore. I've heard from a lot of people that this game is the one that saves modern SH in their eyes, but I'm just not seeing the value here. As far as my interpretation goes, Silent Hill Downpour plays like a cheap recreation of very common video game trends from its day, except none of them have been skillfully implemented, so it ends up feeling hollow and flawed, even when it's doing stuff the industry perfected years ago. That's what makes this section a little different from my other videos in the series. These are things that made the game an absolute chore to play through and totally unfun in my opinion, but given the amount of praise I see this game getting, I just gotta assume I'm the odd one out here. It's definitely possible that the technical issues that made the game hard as hell to play for me simply weren't problems for other people. I imagine console gamers might have somehow evolved faster reflexes from playing at sub 30 frames per second for two console generations. Okay, I'm sorry, last joke at your expense, I promise. In all seriousness though, this was a very disappointing playthrough for me. I was expecting something that would play better than Homecoming, but instead I got a game that plays just as poorly, if not more so, but in new and more annoying ways. In my opinion, this project was far too ambitious for Vatra games. It seems like they lacked the skill to use the engine they licensed, and little rookie mistakes in the controls and game design shows they weren't too experienced in more basic foundational areas either. So I can't recommend anyone actually play this game. I found it far too frustrating to enjoy, but as someone who's been known to forego game design in favor of an interesting world, I could see why some make it into downpour, but I just can't stand it. So instead of ending on something concrete and negative, maybe I'll do a little positive community service for once. I recently got in touch with Tom Hewlett, former face of Modern SH, and asked him about his role in this game, and one of the more important things he said to me was that he absolutely was not the guy who decided a corn song needed to play over the intro, and I for one believe him. I don't know, I just felt like that needed to be put out there. Just cause folks wanna be heard, don't mean they're willing to listen. See for yourself. Okay, so as we dive deeper into the downward spiral that is this video, you'll start to notice an increasing negative tone. Starting with the story, I was pretty easygoing. I mean, sure it wasn't the story I would have liked, but it wasn't necessarily bad either. Just not anything that grabbed my interest. Moving on to the gameplay, I had to make a lot of concessions to account for the subjectivity of what constitutes game-breaking flaws, but now you've all dropped into my world. So we're going to be a little more harsh and a lot more subjective in criticizing the game's presentation. And here it comes. Silent Hill Downpour has the absolute worst graphics I have ever seen in a game from the last console generation, period. It very well may be the worst executed video game I've ever come across from a graphical perspective, and I know that may sound insane, so why don't we start in on the complaints. The very first thing I noticed when I started this game up was its insanely blurry, low-res video output. Now, it's common for PS3 and 360 games to render internally at sub-1080p resolutions, and then for that video to be internally upscaled to 1080p afterwards, but this looks sub-720p to my eye. I even thought that maybe the internal upscaling was causing the blurry visuals, so I set my PS3 to output 720p natively and had the exact same issue. And it's not just the 3D rendered graphics, if that's what you're thinking. Across the board, text and menu elements are also very low-res looking and incredibly blurry. Thanks to this game making it look like I smeared my monitor in Vaseline, I got very visually fatigued playing Downpour. I just couldn't handle looking at it for more than an hour at a time. Moving up or down on the list depending on your perspective, this game is incredibly dark, which added to the whole visual fatigue thing. I would go long amounts of time playing and start to notice that I'm squinting the whole time because the picture is just visible enough to make out small details. but only if you're really looking hard. Increasing the in-game brightness doesn't necessarily brighten the image, but instead makes all of the black areas gray, so you're still squinting into your TV, but this time you're trying to peer through an endless ocean of hazy fog instead of inky black. The flashlight can help sometimes, but it's just not powerful enough. But for all I know, maybe this was intentional. Maybe the idea was to have the game be very dark to keep the player on edge. I mean, in my opinion, it didn't work and ended up working against the game, but hey, I'm trying my hardest not to attribute every negative to bad game design or programming. 
despite what seems like overwhelming evidence to the contrary. I mean, it's not like you couldn't do amazing things with the hardware. Hell, here's a random PS3 game I grabbed off my shelf. It has a vast open world in it with a lot more on-screen 3D models than Downpour, and it looks great for its time. Plus, there's no screen tearing or slowdown. Look, my point is, Vatra had all of the tools at their disposal to make a great game, or at least one that looked passable, and it seems like they just didn't know how to use them. Everywhere you look, there's some kind of graphical issue, or bad looking effect, or reused asset, or glitch. Honestly, look at how they mangled God Rays, for an example. That's stuff the industry has been getting right for 20 years now. Another issue that really bothered me was that assets would load in low res versions of their textures first, and then a second later you get the high res stuff that would load in. Something that isn't exactly uncommon, but definitely not to this bad of a degree in that era. So if the gameplay and story do honestly fit your interests, just be aware that there are almost no redeeming qualities as far as the presentation is concerned. In all seriousness, I don't know how long I can keep this up. I really like talking about graphical elements that I find cool or interesting, but I genuinely can't think of one part of this game's presentation that isn't marred by some kind of severe and noticeable flaw. And hell, even if they hadn't dropped the ball so hard with the graphics, it would still run like garbage. There were a few times when the game would just lock up on me for seconds at a time, and if you think you can make frame-perfect reactions in combat when the frame rate can vary by more than 10 FPS during a fight, well, be my guest. I genuinely just don't get it. Team Silent was able to make a game that people still consider visually impressive on the PS2. How is it that no one has been able to follow up their success so far? Each of the OGSH games made incredible strides in lighting and real-time animations, but the only noteworthy accomplishment I can list after playing through nearly all of the modern games in the series is how Shattered Memories managed to include very high-res 2D assets in their engine. It's amazing to me that a series can have this many hands on it since its creators were disbanded, but none of those hands have made any lasting impressions on me. And I don't think it's just me. Objectively speaking, if we take a look at this dialogue scene from Silent Hill 3, I think we can all agree that the animations, the sharpness, and the clarity is far beyond what we're looking at in Downpour right next to it. Which is absolutely insane, because we're dealing with resources that far outclass what Team Silent had to work with, but for some reason we're getting a game that looks and performs worse than a title that doesn't even take up a full 4.7 GB DVD. Am I judging this game a little too harshly? Yeah, maybe, but when I play a game in a prolific series that came out after Homecoming, I expect it to at the very least look better than Homecoming, and Downpour, even at its very best, doesn't get anywhere near that. Now I know I typically have some cool comparisons to make and fun processes to outline in these segments, but I have nothing to work with here. Silent Hill Downpour is a bad looking game that performs terribly and is more unstable than a YouTube vlogger with a million subscribers. But I don't want to end on a sour note, so let's talk about the music, which isn't all that bad actually. Coming hot off the heels of Homecoming, whose only saving grace was its Akira Yamaoka OST, I was kind of disappointed by him not headlining the soundtrack again, but the new guy certainly didn't do bad. It's definitely very different than your typical SH fare, but it's very ambient, and I like that. A lot of the music is only made up of low atmospheric hums and moans, leading to these tracks falling even further outside of traditional music than the previous ones. They're also less song and more mood enhancers, and while I would definitely prefer Yamaoka to have been on board, I actually like this guy's style a lot. His music seems to sit in the background and stealthily enforce the mood of a scene, as opposed to your normal SH track, which builds a mood all of its own right up front in the foreground with weeping violins and harsh percussion. For longtime fans, it's going to take a while for it to grow on you, but I'd say it's worth giving a chance, unlike the game's graphics, which may need to die in a fire. Okay, so my first time playing Downpour was not a wholly positive experience to say the least. In fact, I'd say I enjoyed it far less than Homecoming, which is a very insane statement for me to make. Now, it's important to mention that the ideas that make up the foundation of this game aren't bad on their own. 
Unlike the rest of the Western SH games, this one isn't trying to tie into the established lore of Silent Hill in any significant way and as such doesn't shit on it in the same way those titles do. The story, while not my favorite in the world, was relatively interesting, but of course there are some inconsistencies that other reviewers have noted, but since I didn't uncover them myself in my specific playthrough, they didn't have much of an effect on my enjoyment. But the nail in the coffin, the one element that makes every other aspect of the game feel weak and far more unbearable, is the terrible performance and awful graphics. Like I said before, I was genuinely fatigued from playing it for more than an hour or so because of the constant frame rate stutters, the incredible blurry graphics, and lighting that would cause objects in motion to give off a shimmer, kind of like usable items. At least 50 times I found myself rounding a corner, turning the camera and seeing a glimmer out of the corner of my eye, only to find a piece of scenery had caught my flashlight in just the right way to make it look like a key item. Anytime I wasn't doing that, I was squinting at the screen trying to figure out why I was getting a prompt to pick something up without seeing anything around me. The blurry presentation was actually making it harder to play the game effectively. Now, I know I've been harping on about this stuff for a while, but I don't think I've ever seen issues this bad on a mainstream release. This kind of shoddy work is typically reserved for single-person developers putting out early access survival games on Steam. If you want my genuine, honest opinion, even if the story concept seems like a win for you or the gameplay seems interesting, I would stay far away from Silent Hill Downpour. This was one of the most frustrating experiences I've ever had with the game. Every part of it that wasn't incorrectly made or implemented was just bad or didn't work as intended. In short, this game is a fucking train wreck, and like a train wreck, I hope to never see anything on this level of insanity again. But don't worry, we have at least one more entry in the series to cover, and I refuse to let a bad game keep me down. Onwards and upwards, people. And until I see you again, thank you so much for watching The Silent Hill Retrospective. You know, we've explored nearly every single nook and cranny this tired old resort town has to offer, and even though we're damn close to ending our little journey, I can't help but feel like there's still some fresh pavement to kick. Kind of like our time here isn't up just yet. Besides, maybe what's really needed is a new perspective, a fresh platform that might allow us to get a different angle on this issue. So if you guys will join me, I think we might get a little reading done today. Ladies, gentlemen, welcome to Silent Hill. Silent Hill Book of Memories was yet another event brought about by Konami wanting a new SH game on the market, but not so much that they're willing to do it themselves. The guidelines were relatively simple, if not a little blasphemous. They wanted an SH game designed from the ground up for PlayStation's Vita handheld, and was different every time it's played with an emphasis on multiplayer. Not exactly bad goals to have for any normal game, but Silent Hill is no normal series. WayForward Games would be the developer that rose to meet this challenge, but the community was split on this news as it meant Tom Hewlett would once again be at the helm for a Silent Hill game's development. Now, it's important to mention that he was getting a crazy amount of hate at this point, and regardless of what side of that debate you're on, I think we can all agree a mass amount of spam, insults, and actual threats are not the best way to express those grievances. Hell, even I'm guilty of getting pissed and popping off at the mouth during my HD collection video, but that being said, I can understand the fans being, at the very least, a little apprehensive about Tom's return to the series. After all, regardless of whether or not you think it was his fault, he had been involved in some of the worst moments in the series' timeline. People assumed that this would be a similar situation, and maybe it was, but this time I don't think a lot of the blame can rightly land at Tom's feet. Konami had a very specific set of goals they wanted this game to meet, and at no point could any studio have created a traditional SH game under those conditions. I mean, you can't exactly have an atmospheric, slow-building panic attack while mashing the attack button from a top-down perspective while another player is running around in your field of view. Say what you want about how appealing that might be as a gameplay strategy, but there's just no way those ingredients could add up to the type of Silent Hill experience we all wanted at the time. So as we go on, you'll likely have a much easier time if you keep in mind that this will not, in any way, shape, or form, even resemble an honest-to-goodness SH game. I think the best way to approach this is like you're playing a spin-off in the series universe. And that being the case, we may need to alter our expectations just a little bit. Which I guess is a good way of moving on to this game's story, what little of it there is to move on to. I'm playing tennis. Is there anything else you're into? Well, I'm a dancer, but I keep that on the down low. 
at the start of BM. <laughs> that means bowel movement. Let's try that again. At the start of BOM, you're going to get your longest and most straightforward piece of story in the entire experience. You take on the role of your custom created character as they hang out in their kind of dingy, rundown apartment. After a knock at the door, we find that the mailman from SH Downpour has arrived with a package addressed to us, and hailing from the town of Silent Hill no less. Now, I hate to be a dick this early in the process, but does it feel a little odd to any of you that the game's trying to get us to believe the town of Silent Hill has now become sentient and understands how to use the US postal system? I mean, people have often been drawn to the town in the past, but that was always left vague and unaddressed as to not subtract from the mystery and relative believability of the games. To put it a little more concisely, Silent Hill works best when it's an abstract concept for people to manipulate of their own volition. In part one, the town's ancient spiritual power was being corrupted by Cheryl's inner torment helped along by her strong psychic powers. In two, James shows up to find his dead wife and ends up populating the town with his own mental hangups. And of course, the third game had Heather going through a similar situation as her hatred and negative emotions caused her to manifest these things into the real world using that same spiritual power and a little bit of good old fashioned help from a developing elder god inside of her. And if you didn't catch the single thread tying all these situations together, essentially the town of Silent Hill just provides you with a can of gas, but you're the one who has to light it, often with a match made up of your worst traits. In Book of Memories, the town acts with purpose and manipulates situations far outside the reaches of its power. I don't know, there's just something about the starting point that rubbed me the wrong way, but then again, we are supposed to judge this as a spin-off, so I guess it's fair, kind of. Once our character opens their package, they find a book inside that has listed in it every memory they have ever had, and for some reason the first thing that comes to their mind is altering the events laid out in the book. What happens if I rewrite it? So after some actual life hacking, they pass out, and upon waking up, find themselves in a kind of nightmare trying to pass itself off as the other world. After a little exploration, we come across good old mailman Howard, who also runs a store inside the other world. Setting aside how lame of a concept that is for now, Howard goes on to explain that what we're attempting to do is change our past by altering the events in our book of memories, and to do it we need a substance called memory residue. And no, you are not the only one who finds that to be very, very dumb. So after finishing the dungeon, we wake up to find that the alterations we make in the book seem to come true after finishing these nightmares. So the rest of the story in the game follows this alter the book, finish the dungeon flow, and I guess it's not the worst thing in the world. After all, this is a dungeon crawler. There weren't a whole lot of other options that would give us an in-game explanation for why we have to keep endlessly completing dungeons. So we'll give it a little pass there, but for me, the real issue is the way the rest of the story is told to the player. From here on out, kiss cutscenes and direct storytelling goodbye for good, because literally everything we'll learn from here on out will be delivered through seemingly mundane notes left around chronicling insignificant events in the lives of characters we've never met before like not getting along with a co-worker or having a sibling that's having an affair. And I know what you're thinking, how does this tie into Silent Hill or any of the themes present in other games? Well see, that's the thing. Um, how should I, how should I put this? It does not do that. There we go. That's right and things getting easier every day. Right up until the very end of the game, this isn't a story about changing past events in your character's life. It is strictly about those events. You'll find notes talking about things that are happening in your character's life, like upcoming promotions or personal drama, but none of these things lead to an overarching plot that deals with the town or the power that allows you to do these things. About 90% of the story that you'll have told to you throughout the entirety of this playthrough will be characters you've never met in the game gossiping about other characters you've never met in the game. And it's not even good gossip, it's, hey, did you hear that guy got fired? There are notes that go into the creation of the book and mention the town's cult maybe once or twice, but the vast majority of the game's story will have you reading and listening to events and conversations that have no real significance or meaning to the overall plot of the game. You can go into your menu and read all these unrelated notes in order to get a more full idea of the story, but that didn't make this any more palatable for me. Now to be clear, there is an overarching story that has to do with your character and their struggle to justify using their book like this, but that story starts and ends with the final few dungeons in the game. The book is too dangerous. You have to be destroyed. So from the start to the finish, it's side stories for you, but 
They're just not interesting or meaningful enough to keep me interested. There are multiple endings to consider, and that is always a nice inclusion, but thanks to the gameplay required to qualify for these endings, they're a little less of a reward for decisions made in the game, and more like events triggered by things only someone looking to purposefully manipulate the game would be able to trigger. Kind of like having a normal ending and then one that only a world record speedrun would be able to unlock. I assume it's clear by now that I just didn't like this story, but not for the reasons I normally do. It's not like it's a bad story, it's that there isn't much of a story here at all. Sure, there are things going on in the game and those things are delivered to you as if they were story, but the vast majority of these things are little personal dramas and events that don't mean much of anything. And this is going to sound like a joke, so I want to make it very clear up front that I am not exaggerating. You could get a similar narrative experience to this game by just asking your significant other how their day at work was today. No joke, this is one of the most simple narratives I have ever experienced in a video game. Character gets booked, then changes past, then figures out changing past has repercussions, and depending on what arbitrary things took place inside the game's randomly generated dungeons, you'll get one of six endings to that scenario. Boom. Whole story over, right there. Like I said before, I did not expect this to be a traditional SH story, so I didn't hold it up to that metric, and I know the limitations of Konami's instructions made telling any story at all a little challenging, but what we're left with here is almost non-existent. And most important of all is the vehicle by which all of this narrative is delivered, which is primarily text logs and audio of conversations you're not involved in coming through TVs. Yeah, you're super pretty. I thought so. Of course, it's not uncommon to have SH games tell the player key elements with notes that can be found, but the major difference is in those games, there's also a story that is told via other means, most importantly by your character interacting verbally with other people. With BOM, we have an intro cutscene and an ending. These will be the only two times in the game where story will be delivered outside of a letter, and if you ask me, that's just not satisfying. So I guess if you come into this with the expectation that there will be no story, you might be pleased with the very little that's on offer, but I sure as hell was not. Here's hoping the gameplay fares a little better. I don't know anybody in Silent Hill. You'd be surprised. Life moving so fast these days. People end up all kinds of places. Gameplay in Book of Memories is relatively easy to describe. This is a dungeon crawler and the emphasis was for players to be able to continue playing the game even after they've beaten it. And on the surface, that sounds okay. Hell, one of my favorite things in the world to do is boot up a Japanese dungeon crawler like Shirin the Wanderer or Chocobo Dungeon and spend an hour or two making progress in some randomly generated grid-based dungeon. So I'm definitely not adverse to the idea of this kind of approach. Sadly, I just don't think the guys at WayForward were able to craft a gameplay loop that kept the game interesting after a few dungeons. But before I crucify it, let's go over the more objective stuff. All of your actual playtime will either be spent in dungeons or choosing which dungeon to enter. This means there will be no prep work that goes into taking on the next challenge. Once inside of a dungeon, there will be one and only one series of events for you to accomplish every single time. First, you talk to Valtiel to receive some sort of side goal, like killing a specific enemy or finding a certain item. Then you explore the dungeon, filling in the map as you go while fighting a roster of monsters that reads like a greatest hits of the series up till now. While doing that, you'll come across puzzle pieces, and then you'll have to solve the puzzle at the end of the dungeon. Boom. Every single dungeon you go through will be this every single time. On the plus side, combat can be relatively satisfying, with the only real depth coming from you choosing to use either one slow weapon in both hands, or two faster ones in each hand. Killing enemies will often net you a resource that is only necessary for getting a specific ending and a few other choice things, while items, weapons, and the game's currency can be found in dressers, pots, and other hiding spots. And since you're probably going to want to know where these things are at a glance, turning on your flashlight will highlight these containers with a nice shade of red. Some rooms will have blue orbs that once shattered will trigger a few monsters to spawn in, and the game tries to trick you by including conditions with these fights, but in reality, the only condition you will ever see is the standard defeat the enemy. Sometimes they may put a time or health limit on you, but this happens so rarely I'm not even sure I have recorded footage of it. After clearing these challenge orbs, you'll get a key item that needs to be used in the puzzle at the end of the dungeon. The number of these puzzle items you'll need will be displayed on the lower left hand side of the screen, and once you get them all you'll need to solve what can be generously called a puzzle. The approach to these puzzles was outlined by WayForward as a kind of distillation of every SH puzzle. They essentially broke down all of the head scratchers in the series and distilled them down to their base elements, also known as simplifying them to hell and back. This approach was outlined by WayForward as a kind of distillation of every SH puzzle. They essentially broke down all of the head scratchers in the series and simplified them down to their most base elements. 
So at the end of every single area in the game, you'll need to arrange items in some kind of order. Whether it's by color, shape, or size, always expect to put a collection of items in some kind of plane. After three zones, you'll have to fight that area's boss, and even though these guys had relatively recognizable patterns, I actually really enjoyed these fights. Beating the area's boss means continuing on to the next zone, this time with a different theme. Through dungeons, you'll randomly come across notes that'll give you a little exposition or sometimes a clue letting you know how to solve or arrange the puzzle items at the end of the dungeon. On top of that, there are these rooms that you'll rarely come across and I honestly have no idea what function they serve. Most of the time, they will have you just sitting there and experiencing some kind of unrelated story having to do with random people, but sometimes there will be some kind of action to take, like playing hide and go seek with this ghost girl. How you interact with these events will align you to a good, bad, or in the middle kind of spectrum, and I really and truly have no idea what this does. I have to imagine it affects your ending, but I kind of thought your karma alignment and the notes you collect fill that role, so your guess is as good as mine. <laughs> Being an RPG, there is an experience system and stats to dump points into, and some of these stats will affect how well you handle certain weapons, but not to any noticeable degree, I assure you. Instead of armor, you have artifacts that up some stats, and while it's very, very shallow compared to what a fan of these kinds of games might be into, I still appreciated its inclusion. Because modern Silent Hill games seem to be under some kind of government mandate, we have the return of breakable weapons, but at least this time around, an item can be found or purchased that can restore a weapon to full stamina. The only issue with this being later sections of the game have enemies with HP so high, you'll have to nearly break a weapon just to get through a single room and this means heading back to the shop to stock up on tools. Of course, you could just pick up the random weapons lying around a dungeon or the ones dropped by enemies, but these are almost always going to be weaker than the endgame stuff you already have, so you'll get locked into this constant cycle of grinding for EXP and returning to the shop. But you're rarely awarded money after defeating enemies, so you'll eventually come to a point where you just can't progress without returning to lower level areas just to get quick cash. And while I can admit I do enjoy the odd bout of grinding in my RPGs, this game takes it to a whole new, really, really nasty level. This is because enemies give you next to no experience. After more than 20 hours of gameplay, I might have been at level 18. If you ask me, there is a lot of balance and quality of life updates needed here before Book of Memories earns itself a spot next to the other more quality driven titles in the genre. Book of Memories occupies this really odd spot as a game, since it's supposed to be an SH game, so there are things included to indulge fans of that series. It's also supposed to be a dungeon crawling RPG, but the stated goal was to make a dungeon crawler that non-fans of the genre could get into, and to me this meant simplifying everything down to their most shallow elements and believe me when I say that they accomplished this goal very successfully. So this means not only fans of dungeon crawlers won't be into it, but SH fans will likely not be interested in stepping so far outside survival horror. This leads to a game that wanted to please everyone, but instead kind of made itself unappealing to everyone. It kind of goes like this. If you're looking for the psychological horror that got you into the series, I doubt very much this kind of an RPG will be very high up on your list of potential SH experiences. And if you enjoy these kind of RPGs, there will be a nearly infinite list of games that do this gameplay style much better. For example, in other dungeon crawlers, there's always a home base of sorts where you can sell your items and better equip yourself. This makes for a cool pattern of getting as far as you can in a dungeon and then heading back into town so you can sell what you found so far, which will allow you to buy more healing items and weapons so you can get further into a dungeon. In Book of Memories, functions like saving and buying items are limited to rooms found in each randomly generated dungeon, and in some ways this is a much better setup. This means heading into a shop and trading in some equipment doesn't require you to leave the dungeon and reset all your progress, which is a pretty convenient way to tackle that specific problem. The only issue is that dungeons are randomly generated, so these rooms may be conveniently placed at the beginning of an area, or sometimes right at the very end. And trust me, there will be times when having one healing item on you will mean the difference between finishing a zone or looking at a game over screen. If you want my opinion, this game could have been a lot more fair if the story beats, shop, and save functions were available outside of the dungeon, or maybe placed in a constant location inside one. Also, an RPG fan will probably want to jump headfirst into customizing stats and leveling up, but even something as simple as a numerical EXP gauge is missing, and I gotta assume this was done for simplicity's sake. Sure, there is a meter you can look at, but there's no way to know how much EXP you actually have or how much killing a specific enemy will net you. On top of that, the game is essentially built on a system of managing the stats of your character, artifacts, and weapons, but in a really, really stupid move, didn't include any accessible way to view weapon stats. 
The only place that I found that would tell me how strong a weapon is comes from the short dialogue window that pops up when you complete one of Valtale's submissions. Other than this, there is no way I've found to view vital stats like how strong an item is or how much durability it has. This seems like a really hard idea to mess up, I mean it's RPG Gaming 101. You included a system that relies on these stats, why in the hell would they not be something the player can be aware of at any point? But really and truly, it doesn't matter what systems work or don't work, because at the end of the day, Book of Memories is just... Well, it's kind of boring. At first, I did enjoy the combat and the cycle of finding new weapons and artifacts, but after the second or third dungeon, there just wasn't enough variation to keep me engaged. Honestly, playing through one of this game's dungeons and maybe fighting one of its bosses will give you the entire experience wrapped up in a nice little box. You'll see literally everything the game has to offer and you'll only spend, I don't know, but 20 minutes maybe? Just understand what you experience in that 20 minutes will be stretched out across 20 hours and repeated ad nauseum. However, this isn't the worst issue you're going to come across. In keeping with Konami's decree that the game should showcase all of the Vita's features, an uncomfortable amount of gameplay functions are mapped to the portable's touchscreen. And on the actual console, this isn't a giant deal. Sure, assigning actual in-game button presses to these functions would have made them far more satisfying and easy to use, but it's not exactly the worst example of this on the Vita. However, I needed to capture footage of myself playing this game, which meant I needed to use the PS TV, a kind of consoleized PS Vita. With this, the touch functions are mapped to either clicking the analog sticks or using the PS4's touch bar, and neither of these solutions work particularly well in my opinion. Clicking the analog stick will make it so that stick controls an on-screen cursor and not your character, so if you need to use a healing item in the heat of a fight, you're essentially a sitting duck until you click on it. The touch bar is a little better in some ways since I can still move my character around avoiding attacks while I go to use a health pack or tool. The only issue with this method is it can be hella awkward to stretch your right hand over to the touch bar and when you do, actually clicking it in can shift your cursor away from what you were trying to click on in the first place. On top of that, this game has some liberal ideas of what constitutes whether or not an icon is being clicked on. I mean, look at this, you can see I'm clearly clicking well inside what you would assume the activation area would be, but nothing's happening. I feel like it wouldn't have been too hard to increase the area around these icons that indicate a successful press. Thanks to this, instead of using a tool about half of the time, I accidentally closed the on-screen backpack. Something that wasn't too much of an issue early on, but as the difficulty climbs, this can be more and more of a death sentence. And surprise, surprise, the difficulty is another issue of mine. For about the first three or four hours, the game has a pretty fair challenge, but heading towards the last and second to last story dungeon, the difficulty curve turns into a 90 degree angle, which required me to grind more, which meant engaging in the boring act of demolishing hundreds of low level monsters just to move my EXP meter about a quarter of a millimeter. And in the end, even though it's sad to say, this game just wasn't fun for me. I won't say it started strong, but it had promise in the beginning. The thought of running through these dungeons, collecting loot, and ripping into enemies I knew so well was legitimately motivating, but without any real reason to do that and no real changes in the core gameplay after tens of hours, well, I just got burnt out. Early on, I just stopped having fun. I got to the point where the only drive I had to pick it up from day to day was to get footage for this video. And just when I would make a crazy amount of progress in a zone and I would feel kind of satisfied, I would die just because I stepped on a trap tile that took away all of my HP but one. And call me crazy, but that feels a little outside of my control as a player. <sighs> but despite me complaining a pretty heavy amount so far, I wouldn't necessarily call this a bad game. More than anything, it's just kind of bland, which really sucks because unlike a lot of other SH fans, I think the idea of a dungeon crawler set in the Silent Hill universe sounds like an amazingly cool idea. I honestly feel like there's nothing wrong with spin-offs that play with the genre established in the mainline series, but Book of Memory falls short of that potential with a few really, really bad game design choices and the limitations that were forced on the devs by Konami, of course. I wouldn't say this is one you should avoid per se. After all, there were moments of fun in my playthrough. The rush of leveling up or finding a new weapon that allowed me to steamroll an area that was giving me problems really tapped into my brain's pleasure center, but the total package just doesn't keep that up very long. I would say it might be at least worth a look for those of you that are curious, but after seeing the insane prices copies of this game go for on the used market, I can confidently say it is not worth it. If you want my opinion, just go download the demo from the Vita's PSN store and you'll get a majority of the experience you would have had with the full game, but 
with the added bonus of not spending the 20 hours it took me to come to this conclusion. So don't ever say I don't do anything for you guys. It may not be common knowledge, but the Vita was actually a powerful little handheld, one that probably needed a few more years of R&D. The console itself was actually capable of great performance, but the mobile form factor limited elements like cooling, causing the console to essentially nerf itself. That being said, Book of Memories has a relatively interesting look to it, with features like reflective surfaces and some simple normal map textures, but I'm more excited to talk about how I got the footage you're looking at right now. For those of you that didn't keep up during the Vita's time in the spotlight, the console itself, unlike the PSP that came before it, wasn't actually capable of video output. Sony would soon fix this issue with a PlayStation TV, which was essentially a Vita but lacking the screen and speakers. This turned the portable into an honest-to-goodness home console, and I'm always interested in playing portable titles on the big screen. Sadly, my hopes of a full Vita home console would be dashed somewhat when I found out the PSTV only allows certain titles to be played thanks to a lack of touchscreen features on a traditional controller. And even more egregious than that is the blurry bilinear filtered picture that the Vita outputs. Topping out at a max of 720p, if you want progressive scan output, this isn't exactly what I would call pretty. Now, it's definitely not the worst looking picture, and for the longest time, it's the only method we had, but luckily that has all changed recently. What you're seeing here is the result of two very, very interesting hacks, mainly the PSTV anti-blacklist to enable Book of Memories to even play on the console, and a cool little piece of homebrew called Sharp Scale, which allows for much better looking video output than a stock PSTV is capable of. Before we get too far into that though, you're gonna need some form of the Henkaku custom firmware installed before you're able to take advantage of these apps, but thanks to a wealth of guides here on YouTube and Sony dropping support and updates for the PS Vita, this is a problem easily remedied. Opening up Sharp Scale, we have some really interesting options to mess around with. Under scaling mode, original will just use the PSTV's regular scaled video output, Integer will perform a sharper integer scale, making sure all pixels display at an even height and width, aka my favorite way to go. And then there's real mode, which lets you see a Vita game's base resolution windowed within the output resolution of the PSTV. Honestly, it's really cool getting a look at the individual resolutions certain Vita games render at internally. And Fitted will essentially perform the same job as the regular scaling mode, but a little more accurately. For the scaling algorithm, I would recommend the point option, which is much sharper, but some people might also like the softer look of the bilinear scale. This only applies if you're not using an integer scale, so you may not even have to worry about this. And it is important to note that this app is going to perform differently depending on your system's output resolution. Normally, I'd recommend using its 720p output along with SharpScale's integer scaling option for a smaller but progressive scan image. Sure, the extra pixels of 1080i would be nice, but if you're capturing footage like me, the combing artifacts that'll show up thanks to the interlaced picture might ruin the look of your captured footage. But if you've come to love my absolute video snobbery, don't you worry, that is still going on. I have my PSTV's HDMI output going into my Frame Meister, and I'm letting it apply its adaptive deinterlacing. It's certainly not a perfect option, since you will have likely noticed that scenes with a lot of quick movement will still show some of those combing artifacts, but I just like the added sharpness of the picture, and I have it, so why not be as ridiculous as possible? To get that 1080i integer scale, a few lines of resolution have to be sacrificed on the top and bottom of the screen, but I didn't find that to be an issue with any of the games I tested. Using Sharp Scale, we can really get a good look at what Book of Memories has to offer, and for a portable title, it's pretty damn impressive. There are issues where the shininess of the normal map floor and background textures combine with your flashlight to create a glaring amount of light, but this only happens in a few areas. Enemies are actually a little more detailed than I would have expected given the zoomed out nature of the game's camera, and while slowdown does show up from time to time, I never felt like it negatively impacted the gameplay. The game's intro cutscene does this really great job of showing off a world outside the nightmare that the dungeons take place in, and I wish this was something we saw more. Throughout the game, you'll only ever get to see your character in the nightmare world. This intro is the only time we get to see the real world, and this is a real missed opportunity. Just being able to navigate our apartment would have given the nightmare a lot more context and it would have felt a little more foreign and interesting for it. There are a few sparse times when you'll see the camera zoom in, mostly in these weird ghost story rooms, and I wish we would have seen this a little more too. Watching the developers show off early builds of the game lets us see what could have been with a closer camera and a more traditional Silent Hill look. 
and damn do I wish this was the game we got. I mean, what we're looking at right now isn't what I would call ugly or anything, but god would I kill to see what the Vita could have done with the established look of the series. Each weapon in the game is pretty good looking, and they're all visually distinct, which is good for a game with a camera this far away from the action. At the end of each zone, you'll fight a boss monster, and while they all look relatively cool, there's only one that seems to fit in with the style we've come to expect from SH monsters. The heads-up display is probably my only real complaint as far as presentation goes. It's just way too cluttered, and in zones with really huge dungeons, the minimap can take up a majority of your screen. Of course, having this map on screen is very important with the complex and randomized nature of the dungeons, but it's also sharing real estate with your on-screen items, health bar, keys, key items, and alignment meter. Without a doubt, the touchscreen features that WayForward were forced to incorporate definitely explain the cluttered, busy feeling of the OSD, but since we're already shitting things up, I feel like it would have been really easy to add an EXP meter just under your health bar. I mean, you did make a game where grinding was the goal. I would think making it easier to grind would be a top priority. If only this game used the Vita's select button to bring up an item selector or something, a solid chunk of this clutter could have been done away with, but like I've said a million times by now, that's not exactly something we can pin on way forward. Heading back into some negatives, every character in this game besides the mailman and your avatar exist in the world as either a series of text prompts or an illustration on a loading screen, and this just did not work for me. To be honest, it just felt lazy, especially in a series world-renowned for its amazing storytelling. I mean, it would have been really easy to have characters visibly represented in the game world through scripted cutscenes like in the intro. That would have totally solved this issue. I totally understand that there is a chance this could have been done to save on space, but more than anything, I feel like this was a move done out of laziness or maybe time constraints. Either way, I do not like it. Taking all of this into consideration, I just don't know how to feel about Book of Memory's presentation. There's a lot of impressive effects going on, like the simulated look of rain falling on the ground and an okay looking lighting system, but there were a lot of cut corners and bad design ideas at play as well. Without a doubt, there are things in this game that impress me, but I just don't know if I'm cutting the game slack due to its portable nature. It seems like areas where a lot of attention was paid, like the intro cutscene, kind of cast a shadow on all the spots that they slacked on, but I'm not sure it's realistic to expect SH3 levels of care for a top-down dungeon crawler. I guess with all this flip-flopping, what I'm trying to say is come in with realistic expectations and you'll likely find some stuff you like. You just may need to dig through a lot of stuff you don't like to find it. Well, I suppose I'm a lot of things. Let me guess. You're also the fire marshal, the mayor, the chief of police. Not exactly. Well, I don't really know what to say here. I honestly think this project had potential. I'm not sure why, but something about this genre feels like it would have made a great combination with Silent Hill, but that just is not the case we're dealing with. Both thanks to stipulations made by Konami and what I have to assume is either console limitations or developer laziness, elements that would have made Book of Memories much more tolerable just aren't present. While it does feel great using a PS4 controller to play this game on a much larger display, the touchscreen controls leave a lot to be desired to say the least. Sure, some of that's on me since I'm technically playing a game that shouldn't work on the console, but even on the actual Vita, there are a lot of issues with these touchscreen controls. I don't know, Book of Memories had this amazing potential, but at the end of the day, I just didn't want to play it. The loop of leveling up, doing better, running into a brick wall, and leveling up again typically works with me, but this game just didn't offer enough variety to make this feel fun. And when your dungeon crawler makes grinding annoying, well, I think you've missed the point of a dungeon crawler. Maybe check this one out for the sheer spectacle of it, but other than that, I can say that this was easily one of the most frustrating experiences I've had covering a Silent Hill game, second only to Downpour, of course. Well guys, thanks for walking with me down this oddly interesting detour. We only have two more titles left to go over until this little retrospective is through, and both are going to require, well, let's say a different approach. But until then, I hope I'll see all of you guys again right here on the Silent Hill Retrospective. Good god, the things that I go through for you guys. You know, the initial idea of getting the Silent Hill arcade shooter up and running seemed easy enough at first. I mean, other people have been able to do it, so it can't be too hard, right? Even now, reading these words, I am just shaking my head in pure disgust with myself. I know I usually come into these videos with some kind of narrative about visiting the foggy town of Silent Hill to uncover some new truth, but I am far too frustrated for theatrics. So instead, here's a video covering a Silent Hill themed light gun shooter that nearly broke me as a content creator. Ladies, gentlemen, welcome to Silent Hill.
Silent Hill the Arcade was made to fill a pretty obvious niche. After all, even at its most popular, the SH series was a bit of a cult hit, more famous for its refusal to use common AAA gaming tropes to tell its story than for being a mainstream success. So a pure action-based light gun shooter is about as far from the initial concept of Silent Hill as you can possibly get. But in its defense, every series needs a dumb action spin-off, and if there were one franchise that could provide an amazing roster of enemies to mindlessly shoot at, well, it's this one. So despite me being very much aligned to the camp that sticks very hard to the original look and feel Silent Hills 1 through 3 were able to pull off, I can still appreciate a little meaningless fun. Is this a series almost diametrically opposed to such an approach? Sure, but like I said, a spin-off's a spin-off, and I think once you approach it from that angle, it's very much fair game. But the mere fact that this game was developed is nowhere near the most important thing to talk about right now. Instead, why don't we discuss the absolute hell I had to go through to get this video to the watchable state that it's in. First off, Silent Hill the Arcade was built on a similar framework that modern Japanese arcade titles adhere to. Essentially, each cabinet is a pre-built Windows machine, and in the Windows environment, the arcade game plays out as your typical PC title. And you'd figure this would lead to a much higher level of compatibility, but it's actually the opposite. These games can often be incredibly picky with what hardware you run it on. For example, 64-bit Windows installs may break compatibility with games made to run on 32-bit versions of XP, and that makes a lot of sense. I mean, these guys aren't going to write custom drivers for every piece of hardware and software that exists out there. This is a very specific setup made to work in a very specific set of circumstances. And hell, that doesn't even count the surprising amount of Japanese arcade machines that run their own custom-made Linux builds. And then there's cabinets that stream the game's content from the internet, so dumping those files is damn near impossible. So my whole point with this tangent that I've gotten off on is this stuff can be very complicated and there just aren't enough eyes on the problem for us to hope for a standardized method for playing these games to come anytime soon and SH is no exception. I nearly lost my mind getting this game up and running. First I tried it on my Windows 10 editing machine and I could run it, but I ran into this issue where the game would crash at certain points. But then I found a media codec pack that helped this issue. And just when I thought I had things figured out, I ran into an issue where I would continually take damage from an enemy that wasn't there. And my first thought was that this could be a particularly aggressive type of internal DRM kind of like PC game devs who implement measures in their code that will make the game unwinnable if it detects that it's pirated, but this actually wasn't the case. After a little forum snooping, I found out that SH the Arcade was incredibly picky with what hardware it would run on. Turns out my 2080 Super was causing the problem the whole time, so I switched over to a Windows 7 PC that I use as a home theater build, and I got some pretty promising results, but ran into the exact same issue. So I figured discrete graphics solutions were out. So I grabbed my laptop and I was actually able to progress past this point. The only problem was I was getting really messed up video coming out of the thing when I tried to capture my gameplay. The screen would rapidly flash on and off in my capture software and I figured it had something to do with the fact that the game only runs in a low 640x480 resolution. And maybe OBS just didn't like getting that low of a resolution over HDMI. To be honest, after a few hours of troubleshooting, I still hadn't figured out what the issue was, so I switched to my wife's laptop, which was a much newer machine, and thanks to the integrated graphics, I was able to progress past the point where I would normally be attacked by an invisible enemy. And then, hallelujah, I was finally able to play through this thing and complete it. And I know that doesn't sound like too bad of a situation, but the process of researching issues, swapping capture cards, changing HDMI cables, switching computers a total of four times, and introducing all kinds of HDMI splitters into the mix took me nearly three days to figure out. So after all of that effort, let's enjoy the fruits of my labor and dive into the game's story, which for an arcade title, there seems to be a decent amount of. What is happening? I can't stand it anymore. But Jesse, but Jesse. Oh. Silent Hill the Arcade, despite borrowing its enemies, locations, and bosses from other SH games, actually has its own unique story. Not a very good one in my opinion, but hey, what are you gonna do? I mean, can you name a complicated and well thought out narrative in an arcade title? Yeah, neither can I. Anyways, the story kind of starts in the early 1900s where a little girl and her mother are riding the Little Baroness over to Luca Lake. And then for some reason, the little girl goes over the rails and it seems like this girl falling into the lake doomed the whole boat as no one came back from that little trip. Flash forward to the early 90s and a group of high school kids decide to visit Toluca Lake since they're all heavy into occult stuff and 
Everyone knows Silent Hill is like the occult happenings capital of the planet. After entering the town and sleeping in Jack's Inn, Eric and Tina wake up with some really messed up dreams and find that their group has been scattered. Oh, and also there's strange creatures attacking them. But very much unlike your typical SH protagonist, these two pick up a pair of nine mils and proceed to unload a metric ton of lead on the local nightmare manifestation population. Throughout the game, there are moments when you can save members of your group, and as you might expect, saving everyone leads to the good ending. The events of the game are essentially the nightmare that the little girl from the intro has been living in, living being used in the loosest possible way there. Thanks to this, transitions to the other world are triggered by a boat horn instead of the air raid sirens we're used to. Emily! After working their way through just about every monster that has ever graced a Silent Hill game, the group actually boards the little Baroness and has to fight Hannah, or more accurately, this creepy nightmare representation of her. After beating her, there are a few different endings to get, which I'm sad to say I got the bad ending because I didn't know I had to shoot these little hands holding her down in a specific amount of time. But in my defense, I did rescue everyone, so I got the ending where Hannah asked why we didn't save her, which actually was kind of a gut punch. There is a good ending where you save Hannah and she sails away with the rest of the little Baroness's crew, but to be honest, if you're playing an arcade game to get a specific ending, I think you may have misunderstood the point of an arcade game. And on that note, I think this is a perfectly serviceable little story. I mean, yeah, sure, it's a little lame and kind of feels forced, but really what were you expecting for an arcade game? To be totally honest, this could have been a whole lot worse. So no, it definitely doesn't deserve a place next to the other Silent Hill titles in a which game told the best tale competition, but this one serves its purpose pretty well. And extra kudos to the team for staying inside their lane and not affecting the overall Silent Hill plotline with this one. This story is its own self-contained little tale that borrows elements from other games, but doesn't have an outcome that future titles would have to abide by, which is totally okay by me. Alright, so we have a perfectly okay story to go with this arcade game. That's all that needs to be said, right? Well, it would have been if this game didn't have voice acting so bad it gives House of the Dead a run for its money. Mommy! I was looking for you. I'll drive you to the captain. Wait! Every single aspect of how this story is told is absolutely hilarious. It's clear that the writers didn't speak English as a first language, and while it seems like the voice actors did, they were just reading the script that was given to them verbatim, so the execution comes out sounding like this. Have you seen Jesse? Tina! Bill isn't here either. What's up with this? Now, this mind you, this is not anywhere near a complaint. I really enjoy the terrible voice acting here, and truth be told, it kind of spiced up the experience for me. So if you're in the mood for a dumb story being told by people who sound like their scripts were fed through Google Translate several times over, well boy do I have a game for you. Oh, thank you. But, it's alright. Okay. What Silent Hill the Arcade has to offer in terms of gameplay likely won't surprise anyone, especially fans of light gun shooters. The game essentially copies all the greats. You move on a set course, and the game throws varying enemies at you while you do your best to shoot them. A pretty simple concept when everything's said and done. There are a few interesting additions like branching paths and the inclusion of special limited use weapons, but again, anyone who's even played a single game in this genre has likely seen this all before. And as far as these time-honored traditions go, SH plays pretty well. It was fun mowing through Silent Hill's most creepy creations, and the act of shooting has a satisfying amount of weight and power to it. Successfully taking an enemy down will result in them being blown back into the background, and the sound effect that plays when a shot connects is really, really damn pleasing. The enemy placement and overall difficulty is closer to the easy side of the spectrum, but then again I am playing with a mouse instead of a light gun, so that's kind of expected. In fact, I got the chance to play an actual cabinet of SHA maybe four years ago on a small arcade just outside of Higashi Nakano Station in Tokyo and it was much more of a challenge actually having to aim a piece of plastic in the general vicinity of an on-screen enemy. I also noticed that sometimes hitboxes just weren't where they should be. There were a few occasions where I could have sworn I nailed a nurse in the head, but she didn't take any damage. However, I did have to play this game unscaled, which is a subject we will cover in the presentation side of things. But to keep from explaining it twice, just trust me that this move was indeed necessary. So instead of what you're looking at, I had to play the game like this. 
so it's expected that I would run into some issues with keeping track of a few pixels moving in the small ass window. Add this on top of the fact that I played this on a 15 inch laptop screen and any of the issues that I mentioned here may very well be a result of that. The game's bosses were perfectly straddling that line between challenging me but not so much that I felt overwhelmed. They did however seem to end just when the fight was getting fun though. If you're looking for a little more fun and challenge, I'd say switching to a higher difficulty is most definitely the right move. Since after the game was dumped, it was essentially jerry-rigged to work on Windows 10, there are some features that had to drop by the wayside, and one of the most disappointing was the two-player mode. This game would most definitely be a lot more fun with a second gun at your side, but something about Windows not allowing two mouse cursors at once makes this an impossibility. Or at least that's how it was explained to me. Another issue is, you can't necessarily shoot outside the bounds of your screen to reload like you're used to with other arcade shooter since your mouse is locked to your screen, so instead reloading takes place automatically when you run out of ammo, which explains why you probably noticed me shooting at nothing quite a few times in the captured footage. If I made it out of an encounter with only three rounds left in a magazine, I would just spend those three rounds so I didn't have to go into the next fight having to immediately reload. Like I mentioned before, there's a pretty big possibility that you'll run into some game breaking incompatibility like my issue with invisible enemies. The main issue there being that I couldn't proceed without killing it, but I shot every square inch of that game screen, hoping the enemy was just invisible and not incorporeal. But from what I can gather, this happens when the game tries to load in a specific amount of enemies, and there's some kind of miscommunication between the game and your graphics hardware. This means that it failed to spawn one of those enemies in, but still loaded the code responsible for their behavior and attacks. Now, taking damage really isn't an issue as the game boots up in a free play mode, so I wasn't in any danger of getting a game over. But on the flip side, the game wouldn't let me move forward till I killed that enemy, and that enemy technically didn't exist. So if you're watching this and planning on trying Silent Hill the Arcade out, I'd say your best bet would be integrated graphics like you'll find in non-gaming laptops and newer Ryzen APUs. But really interesting game breaking bugs aside, I have to say this is a really fun arcade game. I'm not exactly a light gun shooter kind of guy normally, but a fun time's a fun time, and I really enjoyed the 1-2 to two hours I spent with this game, and I think you might as well. Just understand that you may not get to prove that theory if the stars don't align just right and you don't have access to the very specific combination of hardware and software this game is going to need to run properly. But if you do manage to get this thing working, it is a really, really fun time. You can't beat the feeling of standing in a narrow hallway facing down a group of five twitching bubblehead nurses and blasting them away with a shotgun. So if you enjoy the locations, monsters, and the overall feel of a Silent Hill title but wish you could play through it with infinite ammo and way more enemy spawns, well, here you go. An animal costume? Don't let your guard down. It has an I think the presentation here deserves the most amount of attention in this video, and I know that's my go-to frame of mind, but I swear, this time it's very well warranted. Which is actually a weird thing to say, because the more real-world aspect of SHA's graphics, like the 3D models for your player characters or the rest of the cast, look really bad for their time, actually. Really oddly drawn features, spastic animations, and a lack of any real detail keeps them from looking great even when held against other titles from 2007. But when it comes to the enemies and locations lifted from other SH titles, well, we're dealing with an amazing looking game here. The intro stage can be a bit of a false positive as it's relatively simple looking and the fog covers up a lot of background detail, but once you get inside Brookhaven, things look way better. It starts with this really cool reveal where the characters have been transported to Silent Hill's other world, but don't realize it until they get their lighter lit and see a group of twitching nurses hobbling towards them. The lighting, post-processing effects, and 3D models in this area are flat out stunning. Plus, the creepy, jerky movements of the nurses are incredibly well done and have the same off-putting effect that they did in the other games. Maybe even better, honestly. There seems to be a bit of bloom-like blur lighting applied to the edge of character models in this area, and it makes the low resolution of the game appear much higher at a glance. The same kind of effect is used in plenty of other areas after this, and it's definitely the star of the show in my eyes. The rest of the game might be a little pixelated with the hard aliasing visible on edges, but this blur effect masked this to such a degree that I was genuinely impressed. And since I did mention it, we should probably talk about the game's operating resolution. This game was made to display at a very low 640x480, which just to give you a bit of reference, was the resolution that the Dreamcast displayed its games at. So even when considering this game's release era, it was a pretty small picture. From what I was able to experience on the only cabinet I ever saw out in the wild, they used a DLP solution to actually display the game, and anyone who's ever owned one of those big direct light projection TVs 
knows how well they can blur an image, so in person, it looked relatively good. Sadly, playing it on a modern display can have some issues, though. At first, the baked-in graphics solution in my laptop wanted to scale the image itself, but the resulting picture was really soft and lacking in details, so I decided to set it up so that it wouldn't scale low-res images to full screen. Then I took that low-res image and output it via HDMI to my capture card and applied a much nicer point scaling method in OBS, and it looks much sharper for it. In fact, after looking at a good chunk of the videos on YouTube showing this game off, I think I'm the only person who's actually done this to get my footage, which very well might be another world's first for Avalanche reviews and the category of shit no one cares about, which may not be an accomplishment, but I don't know, it's something. You guys that are familiar with this game may have noticed that the subtitles are much larger than they should be, but I think this has something to do with me setting up windows on this laptop to scale text a little bigger than usual since it's on a smaller screen. One cool part of this essentially being a PC game is having access to the game's pre-rendered cutscenes. It's not exactly interesting for you guys, but when you're editing a video and don't want the hold your fire and player 2 press start text flashing on screen the whole time, something like this is a lifesaver. Resolution and weird PC architecture aside, I think this game looks amazing all things considered. Sure, that may not be the case in the starting area or in the cutscenes, but once you get to Brookhaven, everything from this game's monsters to the environment you're in are impressive as hell, especially given the very small resolution it displays at. It may only be an arcade title, but it looks far better than it has any right looking, and I appreciate that. I can't really think of any downsides to its picture despite some scenes being a little too dark, but honestly that just kind of fits in with the rest of the game's established look. I mean, most of SH2 was staring at a small circle of light and a sea of darkness, so I'm not taking any points off there. And neither should you. That's right, I'm giving orders now. Do you hate your mommy, huh? It's the same with your mommy. She would never dislike you. You know, I kind of figured I would come into this with all kinds of complaints, but the nature of selling a game as an obvious spin-off makes all the little things just not matter anymore, which is why I think every SH game after 3 should have had a similar approach. Not only would this have freed the dev team up to include any kind of gameplay they could think of, but little things like including Pyramid Head or botching the visual style would no longer be an issue for me. Instead of these guys using Silent Hill 2 as a blueprint for all SH titles to come after it, this kind of spin-off approach would have me more interested in whether or not the games played well and were fun. I mean, yeah, some of the post-team Silent games still wouldn't get a passing grade with that kind of scale, but some definitely would. So here's my warning to you, the Silent Hill fanatic, which I count myself as by the way. Don't hold this game to any series doctrine or get mad when we shift from SH3's mall to Silent Hill's amusement park. This is a spin-off made with the sole intention of getting Silent Hill fans to enjoy blowing off a little steam in a familiar world with familiar monsters trying to kill them. And I don't know about you, but that sounds like a badass time. And I think that's probably my signal to get out of here, but make sure to stick around. The next video will cover the very last entry in the series, one that I have once again never played before, so that should be fun. But until then, thanks for watching, and I hope to see all of you again right here on the Silent Hill Retrospective. You know, normally when I sit down to make one of these videos, it's a relatively mundane affair. All that's ever required of me is to get kind of analytical about what aspects of the game I liked and which ones I didn't. And when you think about it, that's kind of all this job entails. But what happens when the game I'm critiquing turns out to be less of a game and more of an interactive advertisement with a puzzle box attached to it? Man, I hope you guys are strapped in because this is most definitely going to be our strangest trip to that town just off Toluca Lake, so... I hope you've all prepared yourselves and welcome to Silent Hills. You really can't talk about PT without at least discussing some of the events surrounding its release. It was a kind of perfect storm of situations that led to the creation of this playable teaser and each little event plays a key role in the mere fact that this thing exists. First, and most obviously, you have the disillusion of Team Silent and the stagnation of the Silent Hill series as a whole. At this point, people were willing to do almost anything to get back into that familiar town, and at the same time, Hideo Kojima, a walking, talking Pandora's box of game development, was hard at work on a project that seemed very near and dear to his heart. And then we have what some might call the inciting catalyst. A little horror title by the name of PT shows up on the PSN, and without a recognizable series attached to it and a no-name company responsible for it, no one really batted an eye at first. To be honest, I'm not really sure who's responsible for first bringing this little title to the attention of the public at large, but it didn't take very long for streamers to get a hold of this thing, and 
Once they did, the buzz was absolutely unavoidable. An indie horror game with more mystery than on-screen graphics was bound to turn at least a few heads, but people were genuinely taken back after trying PT out. First-time players noticed a very clear level of polish and what felt like real intent behind its creation. It was an enigma wrapped in a mystery, and the internet was eating it up. According to Kojima, the mystery that was PT was supposed to keep us scratching our heads for about a week, but never underestimate the combined power of bored people with an internet connection. Almost immediately, the gaming public at large started sharing notes and comparing experiences, leading to a relatively reliable way to get through this little puzzle box. And then one day, we all got to see it for what it really was. Oh my gosh! Oh my god! It is! It's Silent Hill! Now, I'm sure there were others who got there first, but a clip from this live stream was the first video I remember circulating, and it showed that PT was not a demo from a no-name studio, but a sort of art house experiment in advertising a game without the use of traditional screenshots and trailers. Now, you might have noticed there's been a lot of non-PT game footage on screen so far, and the reason for that is there really isn't much of PT to show. It essentially is just an infinite loop of the same hallway, and instead of combat or really any kind of interactivity in progressing through the demo, we had to perform actions that just do not come as second nature to anyone who's been gaming since childhood. We had to wait, look, and listen to what was going on, some parts of the game requiring you to do actually nothing at all. Every little corner held some kind of clue or what was believed to be a clue, which made for a really interesting time, but we just had no idea what the mystery was. This wasn't like putting a puzzle together without ever looking at the printed side. We were essentially comparing pieces to find out whether or not there was even a puzzle in the first place. And I say we, but I think it's time to make a little confession. I had absolutely nothing to do with PT right up until I sat down to make this video. Yeah, yeah, I know. There goes the poser who claims to be a Silent Hill fan but still hasn't played what is essentially the most recent entry in the series. But trust me, I have an excuse. As a sort of rule, I typically stay away from non-combat first-person horror games, mostly because a legion of simpletons here on YouTube rode that genre like a race car right into massive amounts of undeserved success. <laughs> what was that? Am I bitter? Of course not. I mean, sure, some of us content creators spent countless hours researching, writing, recording, and editing together entertaining and insightful analysis on the medium we love while a handful of 19-year-olds made millions by screaming into a $50 Yeti snowball for maybe five hours a week. Nope, nothing to be salty about there. Now, what was I talking about before I started bitching about the talentless hacks who single-handedly created the worst era of YouTube to date? Oh yeah, that's right, PT. So, the main point I was getting at is an ocean of streamers and Let's Players made this game about as appealing as a Hammer Smash face. So, I didn't bother downloading PT while it was popular since I had already seen the teaser it was made to reveal which may have brought up a few poignant questions in some of your heads. How the hell am I even playing this right now? After all, PT was taken off the PlayStation Network years ago, and essentially anyone who didn't have it then can't get their hands on it now. Although that's not quite as true as it used to be. Well, like I said before, a viewer let me borrow their very own PS4, and it was a really cool situation for two very distinct reasons. First, the fact that she trusted me with her PS4 put a smile on my face, but this was also my very first experience with PT. I had seen analysis videos, lore discussions, and had listened to all the industry rumors floating around at the time, and having taken in all that media, I just kind of figured there was no need to actually play the damn game for myself. After all, it's a short little affair, and I had seen a large chunk of it through other people's content. Well, let me be the first to tell you I was dead wrong. There really is something special going on here, something you might need to experience for yourself to really understand, and without a doubt the main reason for that is the thick and oppressive atmosphere to be found in this quaint little house. It's honestly so rich and pervasive you could cut it with a knife. Everything from your own footsteps to the creaking of the old floorboards are masterfully represented in the creepiest and most unnerving way possible. Sometimes while you're walking around you can swear you kind of sort of hear someone breathing over your shoulder. No joke, put a pair of headphones on and play through this. It's a damn religious experience as far as atmospheric horror is concerned. 
The gameplay, if you can even call it that in a more traditional sense, is centered around taking several laps around this infinitely repeating hallway, and each trip doing a very specific and seemingly arbitrary series of actions to trigger a slight change in the next hallway loop. And under normal circumstances, there would be more than a few complaints here since most of these actions that need to be taken are so cryptic and convoluted that it took an army of people brute forcing PT to figure them out. Like I said earlier though, this isn't strictly speaking a video game, or at least it's not in any traditional sense that we're used to. And while I would normally be ranting and raving about how puzzle solutions should at least be hinted at in the actual games they're included in, we kind of have to approach this thing from a different angle. Going by what Kojima said, it was made to be nearly impossible to figure out, and if that was the goal, I'm gonna go ahead and declare PT a massive success in that department. I mean, there still isn't a consensus on how to trigger some of the ending events that lead to the teaser video, if that tells you anything. Although, while we're on the subject, I will say for those of you planning on tackling this thing, I'd recommend going with the method developed by The Great Debate, where you'll need to whisper the word Jareth into a mic connected to your PS4 controller at certain points during a haunting. In my experience, this method worked like 90% of the time, so definitely look it up if you're planning on playing this. Which actually brings me to a very interesting point. Without a doubt, I would not have been able to work my way through this thing on my own. Don't get me wrong, I like a good puzzle, but I'm not used to having to take 10 steps and then waiting to hear a baby's laugh and then whispering into my headset while a poltergeist appears behind me. Yeah, Cryptic doesn't even begin to describe this experience. In any other scenario, this would have been a deal breaker for me without a doubt, but given the unique nature of PT, it kind of ends up as a positive. Really, when you break this all down, PT's quote-unquote core gameplay is less actual game and more of a challenge that we had to overcome before earning a chance to watch a teaser trailer, and that may sound a little reductive, but honestly it's not. I actually really appreciate how Kojima was taking a stab at shaking up how we consume games media, and if anyone was going to approach releasing a teaser in this kind of avant-garde way, it would definitely be him. Which puts me in an odd place. I can't really knock the game for its obvious flaws because given the context of the situation, those universal rules of game design sort of don't apply. You have to look at PT through a different lens than any other game. First and foremost, this is an experience. The atmosphere, the ghostly apparitions, and who could forget everyone's favorite good old sync fetus, they're all here as a sort of barrier to entry. Sure the gameplay loop had promise, but I doubt very much this is what Kojima had planned for Silent Hill. This was just a test you had to take to prove you were worthy of watching this reveal, so I can't exactly recommend you go out and play PT, but I really want to anyways. This constantly looping, cryptic first person puzzle solving may not be to your taste, god knows it's not to mine, but there's this visceral experience waiting to be had here. The lighting, environment, implied lore and sound effects all build this really cool foundation, a kind of immersive, creepy, self-contained world. One that I'd really like all of you to get a taste of, but sadly after Konami and Kojima's well-publicized public falling out, PT was snatched from the digital marketplace never to return. Finding an actual PS4 with PT installed on it can cost upwards of $600, and even then, who knows how long that hard drive will last. It seems like those of you who didn't get it before, never will. Of course, that is unless some game dev wizard spent 9 months of their life painstakingly recreating PT inside the Unreal Engine, but who the hell's gonna do that? This guy, that's who. Unreal PT is exactly what it sounds like. It's a near exact copy of the PS4 game running inside the Unreal Engine and might be one of the most impressive things I've ever seen. This guy recreated all of the assets you see and compared them against the originals until he got them damn near perfect. Similar video filters are used, even though you can tell a little bit of a difference. It has the same frame rate, and he even mimicked the annoying little motion blur implementation that has objects coming into focus long after I fix my eyes on them. It plays nearly exactly like the PS4 original, and it's clear the goal here was a near psychotic level of accuracy, with the only real noticeable differences being slightly different movement, the font used in the game, and some alterations to make the final series of events much more reliable to trigger without the use of a mic. If you ask me, this is a great way to check PT out if you've never played it before, and since it's free, you really have nothing to lose. However, there is another option as far as PT on the PC goes. Indie game dev Artur Leksowski? Hopefully I didn't just butcher that. Anyways, he has his own take on PT with what he calls PT emulation. Sadly, it's not technically available to the public anymore since he's recently shifted it behind his Patreon's $15 tier, a move that could have easily been a cash grab, but on one end, I think 15 bucks for something like this isn't exactly a hard ask, and on the other, this may have been a way to ensure he isn't slammed with a cease and desist order from Konami, 
Although now that I think about it, taking money for this would make it even worse, but that's besides the point. His crack at recreating PT in Windows is even more accurate than the Unreal version. On top of that, as far as visuals go, this is by far the most sharp and defined looking version of the game you can get your hands on, but all of that does come at a price. For some reason, no matter what graphics settings I used, I would get very choppy looking horizontal camera movement. At first I thought it was the mouse acceleration, but it showed up even when I was strafing, so maybe it just has to do with my monitor's refresh rate being higher than the 60fps this was made to run at. And since we're on the subject, this game looks amazing scaled up to my ultra wide display, but all of the cutscenes and some of the transitions were clearly made for a 16 by 9 aspect ratio, which means the sides of my screen look like this during these scenes. Now, to be fair, this isn't really a complaint. I mean, this was a one-man affair, and I don't think support for 21 by 9 is a key feature that's needed to enjoy this emulation. I just thought I would mention it. And while I was writing this up, I kind of got to thinking, while this is called emulation, I don't really think he's running some kind of PS4 emulator underneath all this. More than anything, I'm pretty sure naming it that was supposed to show that this was a one-to-one -one recreation, but I could be wrong. Just like the Unreal version, the ending sequence has been altered in order to make it more consistent, but unlike the Unreal version, this build actually plays the ending teaser video when you beat it. The video may be compressed to hell and back, but it's there, making this the only real way to experience all of these events for yourself outside of a hacked PS4. If I had to recommend one of these options to go with, I'd say the latest build of PT emulation would be the most complete and accurate way to go, along with the best looking and functioning, but the fact that it's behind a paywall does take away from that recommendation slightly. The good news is neither version is a bad choice, so depending on what you're looking for, the Unreal build might take care of your PT fix with no issues. Sure, it might control worse than the original and have a slightly different look to it, but you wouldn't really know that unless you played the two back to back, so it really doesn't matter how you do it. All three options are going to yield nearly the same results. But more than my recommendation, what I was caught up in while writing this is the fact that the community did such an amazing job of stepping in and making PT playable for those of us who missed it the first time around. This playable teaser could have easily been lost to time, leaving only the OGs and the wealthy with access to it. But a few different people jumped into the fray and made it possible for us to enjoy this thing for years to come. It might be the negative coverage that the video game industry has had lately, but it's just oddly refreshing seeing people come together like this and bring what could have easily ended up as lost media to the masses. I don't know, that's just really cool to me. And as a really awesome bonus, if you visit our tour site, you can grab a little program he whipped together that allows you to walk around in the map from PT's ending teaser. Really though, the most interesting thing about this little demo is how it was made. Apparently, the ending teaser in PT was made in-engine and rendered in real time, which means Artur was able to essentially just dump all the assets from the official PT release and hand-stitch all those assets together, which is really damn interesting. It does a really great job at bringing across that Silent Hill feeling, which is interesting because I feel like it does a better job than the video itself. The apartments have lights on in them, which gives this eerie feeling as if there are signs that this place is both empty and filled with people at the same time. If you get close to some assets, it's clear that they haven't been textured, but the ones that have look really damn good. The implementation of the fog could use some tweaking, but not much honestly. It looks amazing the way it just kind of rolls in and actually obscures your vision in a really realistic way. Artur also has his own game coming out called Death of Rose, which he says is heavily inspired by PT, and the guy did work on an upcoming horror title called The Medium, so it seems clear this guy's putting his skills to good use, and I usually don't like the idea of putting stuff like the PT emulation behind a paywall, but I can appreciate the guy's gotta eat. So if you're interested in stuff like this and have 15 bucks to burn, it's definitely worth looking into. Alright, so we've covered all of the ways you could possibly get your hands on PT, but we haven't really broached the most important issue surrounding all this PT nonsense, or at least the most important one to me, and that's the fact that Hideo Kojima was looking to make a Silent Hill game. And to be brutally honest with you guys, I'm not as ecstatic about that notion as most other people seem to be. And before this gets off on the wrong foot, I want to say I am a massive Metal Gear fan and hold his earlier works like Snatcher and Police Knots in the highest regard. That being said, as a writer, Kojima could be described as a lot of things, but subtle is most certainly not one of them. Ugh, will this even flush? Most of Kojima's stories, as wildly entertaining as they are, often break down into a series of NPCs relaying information to the main character out loud as he repeats that same information back to them in the form of a question. And like I keep saying, I am a fan of his, but I think it's unrealistic to say that he's without flaws or limitations. 
Silent Hill requires a very light touch. You may want to fully explain the situation to the player at every turn, but the goal is for them to piece the story together themselves. Out of the three original SH titles, you'd be hard pressed to find more than a handful of scenes where story elements are told to the player outright, and even less where the story being conveyed is actually true. You also have to consider that Silent Hill games show a certain level of restraint in their game design, and I don't think the guy who dreamed up a fight sequence where you fight multiple amphibious robots inside an even larger amphibious robot considers restraint to be much of a virtue. Based on the Silent Hills concept video that started floating around the internet, which I'll be honest and say I didn't even know existed until working on this video, I'd say that they were trekking pretty far off the traditional SH path, with more of an emphasis on the supernatural and a very Lovecraftian vibe, which actually kind of makes sense as Guillermo del Toro was signed on to the project and that guy put some kind of Cthulhu-esque tentacles and everything he works on. But having said all that, I am at a bit of a crossroads. After all, it's not like we're getting any other SH games, and for all I know, Kojima might have been able to deliver a kind of horror experience that would do the series justice. Sadly, we won't ever find that out, as Konami has proven time and time again that they're not willing to sell their properties to other studios outright. And as previous experience has taught us all, counting on Konami to create an SH title without farming it out to some unknown western dev who doesn't really understand the series, that's a long wait for a train don't come. So we may never really find out if the guy had what it takes to write for such a prolific series, but as time goes on I find myself growing more and more accepting of the idea. So here's hoping one day we get a chance for him to prove me dead wrong. And with that, we have sadly come to the very end of this amazing franchise. Silent Hill means a lot of things to a lot of people, but for me, it represents one of the most incredibly dark and meaningful stories ever told. Silent Hills 1, 2, and 3 are some of the absolute best horror experiences ever created, but more than that, they're examples of what happens when a group of outrageously creative people get together and create a game for no other reason than a love for that game. I'm not exaggerating when I say this series is passion and determination incarnate. And sadly, this world has proven that a spark this bright will always fade just a little quicker than you'd like. After the three original entries in the series, Konami began the slow process of tearing down everything that made it special, only to replace it with mass market appeal, on-screen button indicators, and dodge rolls. Looking at the newer Silent Hill games in order seems to show exactly what happens when a series loses its focus and starts to try to please everyone. And honestly, I don't think that's any one developer's fault. The fact of the matter is, Silent Hill was created to fuel subjective takes and wild fan theories. Because of this, it's no wonder there's next to no consensus on what it means to make a Silent Hill game. In my personal opinion, the only people who are capable of producing a true successor to the originals would be a team largely made up of the people responsible for creating those original games in the first place. And no, this isn't some kind of if it ain't Japanese, it ain't Silent Hill type of argument. Although you could argue that a foreign, outside looking in perspective is what makes these games so interesting. No, the fact of the matter is, through a combination of subtlety, restraint, and ambiguity, Team Silent created a work of art that's nearly impossible to add to. And you know what? That's okay. Sure, the series may have taken a steep nosedive past the PS2 generation, but we did get some interesting ideas and a few really fun horror games out of the deal. And as I've talked about many times in the past, sometimes it's okay for a story to end. We had an awesome run, and maybe in a perfect world, Silent Hill would still be alive and thriving today, but it's finality that gives life meaning. To tell a fully realized story, you need a beginning, middle, and as much as it sucks to admit, an end. So maybe this isn't a lament for what could have been, but instead, an appreciation for what we have. I mean, really think about it. For a very brief moment there, those of us who enjoy this medium got a taste of real art. Not mass-produced design motifs masquerading as a video game, but an honest-to-goodness experience crafted with real love and care. Looking at the franchise like this, you kind of have to feel blessed that we had it in the first place. Besides, no one can really say what the future holds. Maybe one day we'll see a true successor to the SH name, or even a new entry in the series that not only lives up to its forefathers, but surpasses them. When or if that day ever comes, you can bet I'll be right here ready to cover it, but until then, I want to thank all of you from the bottom of my heart for coming along with me on this journey, and here's hoping I get just one more chance to see you all again, right here on the Silent Hill Retrospective.